updated the estimated cost to do this Bowery Haven Marina. Hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so this is their new estimated budget. And this is based on the work that we've already done up there, what was bid for the other work. And um, comes out, you know, in that neighborhood, 2.2 million is the estimated cost. So if you scroll down a little bit more, Daniel, this is um, this is the funding that we have proposed or what we have coming already. So we have motorboat access funds that come through um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 1.3 million. Utah State Parks has matching funds of 200. 33,000 they're putting in. We have applied for a Utah Outdoor Recreation Grant for 500,000. Um, in talking with them, because this project went over $2 million, they wanted us to put in for the Regional Asset Grant, which is a maximum 500,000. Um, I think we have an excellent chance of receiving that grant. We won't know until uh, May if we get that grant, but it'll be important. The, for us to get that to have enough money to do it, but if we don't get the 500,000, we may get 150. Um, that grant has to be applied for through a nonprofit organization. So Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife is sponsoring that grant, and they have agreed to put $5,000 into the project. And then we're requesting Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council to put 80,000 in, and then that gets us up to that neighborhood of. 2.2 million that we need to do to complete this Bowery Haven Marina renovation. Um, it would be a great asset. It really needs to be done. And I know the public will get a lot of benefit out of it. Uh, these marinas are operated privately, but they are open to public access. Launching boats, there'll be public docks and courtesy docks for the public to use. The public can access the dikes and other areas of, of all of these marinas. And I think that's all I really have to present. And I guess if there's questions. Yeah, any questions? Yeah, any questions? questions? I, I will update that. Uh, budget spreadsheet after this meeting. I just, it was just too close to change it. Okay, thank you, Stan. Appreciate you presenting this project. Okay, we're gonna move on to the project. Number 5678, Fish Lake Ingler Pier, engineering amendment. Yeah, so this is another one that's been going on for a couple of years. Um, we did receive funding to do the engineering work to design the angling pier at Fish Lake. Um, Jones and DeMille again was hired to do this. Um, I, I think uh, Daniel, if you can just go to the pictures and pull up that one picture. So this is just south of Bowery Haven Marina, the location. So Jones and DeMille, they completed all of the engineering and they were they were almost done with it. And then we just got looking at the design and the setting and some other things. And, and we requested them to do a little bit of extra work that we realized the pier needed to be extended out about 20 feet further. Um, we needed to do some work on getting electrical supply to the pier so we can run an aeration system. And we um, made the parking lot a little bigger than originally. And then we also needed to assess a little different location a little bit, moving the pier a little bit. And so with those extra requests we made, there, they went a little bit over with um, funding we had for the engineering. So it's about $9,800 extra we need for this to pay Jones and DeMille to do the extra engineering. Um, as far as building and construction of the pier, uh, the marinas project is just taking so much more time and effort. And, and so we've just kind of put the pier on hold 
to raise the funding and build the pier until we're done with this marina marinas project. So we're looking at constructing this pier in 2022 or 2023. And again, this is this is just um, paying Jones and DeMille the extra funding that they spent to fulfill our request. Any questions on that? Yes, yes. Stan, Stan, this is Ken Strong. Uh, question, is this a, a permanent pier or is this something that can be removed in the winter? I, I worry about ice shear and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, Ken, that, that's been a concern ever since we came up with this idea. And yes, it is a permanent pier that will have pilings, will stay in year round. And, um, you know, the research that the engineering firm has done, uh, it really needs the aeration system around the pilings so that during the winter, the ice doesn't push the pilings around or anything. Um, it, you know, up in the northern Midwest, they build these piers and they have aeration systems around them that work real well up there. So that's that's the plan is to have this aeration system that keeps it ice free right around the pier. Stan, this is Bert Lay. I have a question, and this is actually something I'm going to mention a couple of times today. I see an important component that's missing. I do not see a pit toilet in the plans. I get I, I realize this is not part of the pier, not part of the engineering but it absolutely must be provided. If you're gonna direct to the public to this pier, there needs to be a pit toilet. Yeah, Bert, at that parking lot location, there's already a single toilet there. Um, according to the Forest Service guidelines for the number of people that will be using this pier, we actually have to have two toilets there. So in the plans, the engineering plans, the actual plans, there is a second one that will be purchased and installed when we build it. Excellent, thank you. Stan, this is Rex Infanger. Um, is the end of the pier right there, there's a, a pretty good shelf that goes out to about 30 feet and then it just really starts dropping off at that point. Is that about where the end of the pier will be? Yes, the pier is planned to be right at that 30 foot depth level. Okay. So yeah, it does drop off. And, and in fact, when some sur underwater surveys were being done, there was a huge lake trout sitting just right off the end of the pier. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it, it, and that's why we had to move it out a little bit to get it past the weeds, because otherwise it was right on the edge of the weeds and we wanted to move it out so that people could fish on both sides of the pier. That was my second question, Stan, was if we put aeration in, which we need to, to keep the pier because I have the same concern Ken does about the ice there. Um, I, will we actually encourage the milfoil to grow by having open water there and light access year round? Uh, no, the, the depth of the water is what determines the weed growth. None of the weeds grow deeper than 15 feet around Fish Lake or are very, very little after 15 feet foot depth. And uh, just having it ice free isn't gonna change the depth of the weeds, how far out they go. It'll, it'll still be the same for the weed growth. Okay. Even around the pilings and stuff, that was, uh, it just seems like, cause there's gonna have to be aeration all the way out on all the pilings and-, and... Yeah, yes, there will be. Okay. And, that, and that's why we got to run the electricity to it because we don't want to run solar because, you know, that could fail a lot easier than electrical aerators. So we need to run electricity from the other side of the highway out to the pier. All right, thanks. So are there any other questions for Stan on this project? Okay, thank you again, Stan. Uh, we'll move on to the to the next one. Um, Black Canyon Conservation Easement Fence, uh, number 
5775. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, Daniel, if you can just go to images and I think it would probably better just to pull up the images. Pull up that, yeah, this this is just a, I'll, I'll get into some more details here in a second, but just to describe this picture, on the left side is BLM land, on the right side is the Division of Wildlife Conservation Easement. And as you can see, there's really no difference between the amount of grazing on each side of this fence and that's what we're going to talk about is grazing on our conservation easement. Um, if you go to the other picture, Daniel, yeah, this is the, so this, this is located in, um, it's part of our Black Canyon um, properties south of Anemone. Um, we own some property north of this easement, and this is our very southern or northern, northern parcel. The other parcels are to the south of this. So this is the east fork of the Severe River runs through here. Um, this, this is, um, the outline in black is our conservation easement. And outline in red is a riparian fence that has been built in that area. Now we bought this, we purchased this conservation easement back in the late 1990s. And at that time, there was just a gentleman handshake verbal agreement between the Division of Wildlife, BLM, and the permittee that owns the grazing, that, that leases the grazing rights in here. And it was agreed to put this, build this riparian fence where, where the red is shown in there. Um, but over time, people quit, move, we're not aware of what that agreement was, nothing was put in writing. And, um, and essentially, ever since this was purchased, we've had problems with livestock in here that it's been a nightmare to keep cattle off from this conservation easement. Um, it did improve when we improved the riparian pasture fence on the BLM, that did help a lot. But the permittee feels like he is kind of getting ripped off because he can't graze that BLM land in there. And that's part of his allotment. And in the, the yellow outline there is actually just a pasture inside the allotment. So the whole allotment goes out to the west of this up onto Mount Dutton. And this is just a small pasture. Um, so we've been negotiating with us, BLM, um, the landowner and the permittee, trying to come up with some kind of an agreement of how to graze this and protect the riparian and the stream area as well. And it just hasn't worked out. We haven't been able to come up with an agreement. Um, the permittee essentially puts his livestock in here year all winter long. In the summer, they go up on the mountain, but when they come off the mountain in October, they're in here until they go back in May, is usually what happens. It hasn't been enforced very well, the grazing seasons. Um, it's, a, it's a remote area, nobody's out there checking on it, so the permittee pretty much does what he wants out here. So we're trying to figure out what to do to protect our investment on this conservation easement. Um, like I said, we can, we are we just had a meeting with BLM the other day. Um, it was decided that we would continue negotiations with the allotment holder um, and the landowner because the landowner that lives right up on top of the hill there has first right to graze this uh, easement if we decide to graze it, we can determine the grazing on it. But he has first right to graze it. So we, so he's involved with this as well as allotment permitting. Um, we hope that we can come to an agreement and it'll be enforceable written agreement that will be followed. Um, we'll see if we can come to that point. But if we can't come to an agreement, which we haven't so far, um, we would like to fence the actual property line 
to keep the livestock off from the conservation easement. And so that's what this project is asking for some funding. Uh, we'd have to survey the boundary line and then build the fence. And, and we don't really want to build the fence because the fence, part of the fence runs right down the middle of the river. It crosses the river about three times. It creates problems for fishermen, uh, waterfowl hunters. And so we're trying to avoid building the fence. But at this point, if we can't come to an agreement, um, we would like to fence this property line. And I just might add that this allotment comes up for renewal in 2024. We're hoping to work with BLM to get some changes made in the allotment rules or whatever they call them, the guidelines. And so, but we'll see how that goes. Um, are, is there any other questions? Or I don't know if Gary Besant is on here, if he wants to add anything. Yeah, I, I'm here. The only thing I would add is, um, Stan mentioned that with them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, back in December, we, we also met with them. And in December, the BLM gave us the indication that nothing was going to work out. We should just go ahead and build the fence on the line, which is why we put this proposal in. They've since backtracked. Um, but these discussions have been going on for almost five years now. And so we're, we're losing some patience with believing anything's gonna really happen. So what, where we're at is, you know, we have put together this proposal based on building the fence on the, on the property line, but we've also looked at it. And if we do are able to work out an agreement and get an MOU in place, the, the existing fence that's there will also need some repairs to allow us to enforce that. So we feel comfortable saying we, we want this proposal to go forward either way. We're gonna need some funding in hand if we get an MOU in place to improve the fencing, to, to make sure that we can protect that. And if we can't reach that agreement, we, we've decided this is, a, this is the year. We've been pushing for five years and no one's willing to sign on the dotted line. And if they, they continue to not sign, it's time to solve this problem because our, our landowner that we're supposed to protect is an easement holder is, is starting to feel frustrated. He's been walked on for years and years and years, and he feels like it's his turn to get some benefit for property that, that he owns and has an easement on. So that, that's all I would add. Is our easement, this is Rex in fair. Um, I was wondering, does is this the only access the cows have to water? That, that would be a concern for me. No. Water, access to water isn't an issue in this area at all. I have Thank about, uh, this is Bert Lay. I have about three questions. First of all, I presume the conservation easement is in perpetuity. Secondly, I presume there is a stream bank uh, erosion that has been um, exacerbated by livestock. And then third question is what about public access? I am familiar with the Kingston Canyon uh, area downstream uh, of the confluence with Otter Creek. Just curious if it's reasonable if the public can get in here, if there's a place to park and if the public is indeed visiting it. So again, uh, perpetuity regarding the conservation easement, streamside erosion, and then public access uh, to this parcel. Um, yeah, I'll address those, Bert. Um, Daniel, can you go back to the map that we had up there a minute ago? Uh, the easement is for perpetuity. Um, there is public access. If you look at the black area, there's a narrow strip going kind of up to the upper right there. That's a public access road from the highway down to there. The little triangle kind of box in there is a public parking area. That road also goes on to the BLM, crosses the river and goes up on Mount Dutton, public access. Um, so there is public access in here. That's not a problem at all. Um, as far as the condition of the stream, the fishery is, is actually pretty good in here. Um, and we have done a stream restoration project on this property well, 10 years ago, maybe we did it and put a, some logs and rocks and structures and stuff in here. Um, there has been some erosion since then. Some of the stream banks are in great condition, but there are some 
eroding banks in here as well. Um, but you know, it, it could be better, but it could be a lot worse, and it will get worse if it keeps being grazed like it is. So we, we do have the right to manage it, the grazing in here. So, you know, that's what we're trying to address is trying to address that livestock grazing in here. I, I, would, say that, I would say that the trajectory for the grazing and the, the potential for erosion is getting worse and worse. It, the permittee is growing more emboldened year in and year out. Three years ago, we agreed that we would let them graze it once in three years. And that was the MOU that was drafted and then nobody ever would sign it. And he's been in there every year since and it's been worse each year. So we're on a trajectory that if we can't solve this problem, we are gonna deal with that erosion. Thanks, Stan and Gary, appreciate that. Uh, looks like Jordan, you've got a question. Yeah, um, maybe I missed this Stan when you were talking about it, but there's an existing riparian fence. Um, Will that stay in place if you build the fence around the, the conservation easement? Yeah, well, that would, we'd have to see how it goes. I mean, if the existing riparian fence is all on BLM, well, a little bit on ours, but we probably wouldn't remove it ourselves, but I guess that would be an option for BLM to remove it. I mean, the hope is that in 2024, we can get this riparian fence to be a permanent feature that's just part of the grazing allotment agreement <laughs> and then that fence would be maintained um, right now there isn't any plans to remove it but if some agreement isn't made maybe it does get removed and, and that riparian fence was upgraded about 10 years ago as well and I think Habitat Council paid for that fence yeah, I mean, I like the alignment on the on the left side of that picture of that riparian fence, obviously. But um, you know, if 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 we're putting in a fence that enhances that, I think that's great. Um, but I guess what we should be looking at this is a holdover for 2024 when we can make comments on a on the permit, right? Well, that that's my hope. I don't know if it's going to go there. I don't know if BLM's on board with that or not because. They would have to do an EA to change it. I don't know right. if they're how willing they are to do it. And we should also say that three years ago it was on schedule to be updated in 2021, and now they're telling us 2024. So it's it's been a moving target. But I, we, we're trying to walk a very careful political line here, but it's been a frustrating process. And uh, I, I'm like you when you look at that that red line. That's where that fence should be. That's where common sense says it should be. It, you're talking about a seven acre piece of BLM in a multi, multi thousand acre allotment. And we're, the question about removing that fence, um, I told Stan back in December, absolutely not. We're not going to remove that. We're going to leave that there for the BLM to have to, it, it, as a political maneuver, I guess, but to say, that's your problem. You know, now you've got a seven acre riparian pasture that's on your, your side of the fence that you've got to figure out how you're going to manage because you didn't want to manage with us. So, you're hearing five years of frustration, but but <laughs> yeah, I, I I get it. I mean, I work I work with with those folks too on uh, on these types of issues. So, um, all right, yeah, thanks for answering that question. Thank, yes. Thanks, Jordan. Looks like we have an, an additional question from Dave Behunen. Is that correct, Dave? Okay. Sorry, my mic, my mic wasn't on. Uh, looking at these questions, Stan asks if it's going to uh, successfully uh, meet the goals you guys intend for. And I, I guess my question would be, who's going to maintain the fence? The fence is only as good as, as it's maintained, and I'm sure cowboys can easily tromp down a fence. I just wonder who's going to maintain that. That's a, that's a really good question, Dave. I, I think the division has mostly maintained this fence as part of our WMA fencing program. And I would think that if we want to keep that riparian fence in good condition, that it's gonna be up to us. I'm sure the permittee isn't gonna do it. And, and I don't think BLM will, unless Gary has some other input, I would imagine that we would be maintaining it. Yeah, the only input I would have is that we are committed to maintaining it, that 
and we've talked about improving the existing fence. Um, some of that is due to the fact that we had some flood issues, which is why we have some some compromised sections there. And so, uh, one way or another, we either need to improve the red line fence and, and get it in an MOU, or we need to install the black line fence to protect the easement interest. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any final questions on this project before we move we move forward? Um, I will say before we move on that you know these kind of trespass issues uh, from other folks, permittees, landowners, livestock, you know, is a statewide issue that we deal with all the time, and and uh, I really appreciate the proactive approach here um, from folks. Um, Thank okay, you. one more question, then we'll move on. Russ. Yeah, I'm assuming this is a. Uh, Fence out county, is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Thanks, Stan and, and Gary. Appreciate that presentation. Um, all right, we're going to move on to our next project. Um, we're looking at 944. And so we're moving along good. Um, I guess I would ask, you know, as we move through this, we, we kind of have a We'll, we'll be taking a break sometime between 10 30 and 11 so we'll have a hard stop more towards noon and we've got to finish up another 12 projects uh, before then so um, our next project comes from our central region uh, number 5589 west uh, west jordan big bend urban fishery go ahead all right hi my name is eric mccully i'm with a group called river restoration and we're working with the city of west jordan to implement an urban fishery. It's about 90 south uh, along the Jordan River. Uh, it's a 68 acre area and we're working across the whole area right now. Um, and uh, this phase is to, to basically uh, finish up the urban fishery uh, we're looking at in the next year. Um, you can see some work has been done um, on the underlying um, air photo here, the pond's been roughed in, and we've currently got a contractor that is finishing up the full depth of the pond and roughing in the inlets and outlets under some existing funding that we're working on. Um, but to take a take a quick step back, I, I know a lot of folks have heard about this project over time, and. Um, Daniel, can you go to the documents and um, go ahead and open that PDF? Thank you. So, so this project has been ongoing for over a decade. Um, there have been about 40 different entities working together on, on trying to get this overall project done. Uh, including, you know, Division of Wildlife Resources and Habitat Council has been really supportive over the years. There's a lot of different moving parts and we're, we're incrementally um, implementing this uh, year after year based upon the funding. Um, this year, uh, a very significant um, exchange of land has happened uh, where you can see there's 45 acres in the south end of this project area. Just last week, that 45 acres was um, deeded to the city of West Jordan from the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission. So that was uh, under the Central Utah Water Project. That land was purchased, and now, now West Jordan has uh, received the land and the water that goes along with it. And that is basically a culmination of about 17 years of negotiation. <laughs> um, and I've personally been working on it for about eight years. So we're, we're making progress. We've also got a natural resource damage assessment that is gonna bring another 800,000 to the project to complete uh, some work along the Jordan River and in the habitat area. But in general, the, uh, the yellow or the orange area is gonna be a nature park open to the public with an urban fishery. And then the area that doesn't have any color on it to the right is gonna be preserved for uh, riparian habitat and the river. So the focus of this current phase is, is finishing up the pond. Um, and if you can, Daniel, can you go to the P 
pictures. Um, yeah, go to the images and go to the um, that one. So this is kind of the current state. Um, there's been some additional work, but um, the, you know this is groundwater and the pond has been dug down, and the contractor is out there right now getting ready to really finish this up. And and so the funding request that West Jordan is is asking for this year is the edges of the pond, really the human interface, and the goal is to get this open. Uh, by next June, we've been working with DWR to line up the fish to put in the pond in the next year. So that's that's what we're shooting for this coming year. Um, we have two AmeriCorps interns that are taking care of the property right now under West Jordan Parks. Um, the USGS has come on with a, a study, a multi-year study. We have six real-time groundwater wells across the property, and we're working with the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to develop an adaptive management strategy for this, and um, lots of citizen scientists working on this. Tracy Aviary has been monitoring birds. Wild Utah Project and Hogel Zoo have wildlife cameras there, and um, I can put some more pictures on. We actually, there's deer that, that frequent the, the property as well, and, and we actually caught some having they're basically sparring and one of them threw the other one through the air onto its back um, from some of our wildlife cameras. So, uh, but the main focus this year is to, to really, you know, try to finish up the pond. Um, Daniel, if you could go to the next uh, image. Um, so this is actually some steps we just completed on the Jordan River. This is a part of the project, but it wasn't funded by Habitat Council. This was funded under some 319 water quality funds and outdoor recreation funds and some county funds. And this is kind of the idea around the pond is to create some places that people can go, um, you know, with either steps or rocks or um, there'll be some gravelly beaches and, and there's also revegetation around the pond. But this is, we just finished this we're getting ready to do the revegetation here. So go to the next picture. Um, and you can see past my, my kids here, that, that vertical bank is what we just finished. We basically laid that bank back and created areas for kids to be able to go down by the river. So the next phase that we're talking about now is, is creating, uh, creating areas around the pond that people can go. So, um, the, if you want to go, if you can close those out so you, we can go to the finance. Um, so the city has been working on this just incrementally over the years, and they've got several funding sources um, that we're, we're looking to, you know, get online in this next year in order to basically complete the pond and, and get it open. And so, um, you know, basically just step by step, the, the city's just working on implementing this. Uh, part of the natural resource damage assessment funding is gonna go towards irrigation. We hope to get that online in the next year so we can have some trees and plants around. We're looking to put trails around the pond as well. Um, and so the, the main focus is, you know, sport fish that will be in the urban fishery, and but there's also a benefit to waterfowl we didn't really talk much about the game because it is in an urban area, but that is, that's all I have today on this presentation. So does anyone have any questions? Eric, this is Bert Lay. I am concerned about access when I was looking at the aerial photos. It uh, looks like the easiest access is directly from the west, but there's a neighborhood there and there is insufficient parking. In right. that first overview, you showed a yellow, the, the yellow or orange land acquisition. It looked like there was a parking lot to the south, at the very south perimeter. You mm -hmm. want to mention how the public's going to get to the pond? Yes. So the West Jordan is, is currently working with Rocky Mountain Power to um, have the easement access come from 90th south to a parking lot that's at the south end of the property. And you can see the parking lot there. And that 
negotiation is ongoing. The, the details of the size of the parking lot and the exact access road are still being worked out, but that's the plan is to look at access from that south end. And then further to the north there, there's a yellow line, and I think there's a bridge and a path uh, coming from uh, whatever that east-west highway is. But that's, I, I would expect people would uh, try to park on that corner there uh, in the top left and walk across the canal and get directly to the pond. Will that be prevented? That won't, there won't be you know, people can walk that way, and that is a concern of some of the landowners there that, that people are going to park because it's going to be the closest place. Um, and, you know, people from the neighborhood, you know, can walk down, um, and, and it's open to the public to come across that bridge and onto the Jordan River Parkway. Um, there's not a lot of parking in there. Um, there, you know, there's roadside parking, and, and West Jordan's also seeing if they can maybe get some parking up there, but um, it's a tight, it's a tight access location um, to, and, and, you know, there's some land ownership in the area that is, is really not um, conducive. I guess the, the landowners are not, not that psyched to have a parking lot up there. So that's why we went towards the, um, the access from the South. There's, um, the Jordan River Parkway does come through here and, um, you know, so you can access uh, along the Jordan River Parkway and, um, but the focus is to try to, you know, work on this parking to the south and those details, we, we still have to work out the details of the parking and that's the next phase. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thanks. So we have two more questions. We'll go with John first and then Dave, you'll, you'll be up after John. Um, yeah, just a couple of questions. I, I may have missed it in the presentation, but what is the um, what is the amount you're requesting from the Habitat Council? The amount was uh, 165 from the Habitat Council, um, and we also um, recently put in a, a fast track request from WRI. We we have a contractor out there and and could reduce that amount from Habitat Council if if there's some fast track funding made available uh, now. And we're basically, we're just trying to, what is it? It's, um, yeah, if you, if you scroll down, I think it's 165 was the request from Habitat Council. Um, this is Tyler. We, we actually just made the change because it came through WRI and ranked in the medium category for next year. We just put the whole thing into Habitat Council for now, but we will definitely consider that fast track request. Okay. Yeah, so the, so the request for, for next year is 340 and we're, um, you know, we incrementally, we've been able to just use whatever amount of funding is available. So there are, you know, we can adjust the implementation based upon the funding that's available. In terms of the waterfowl component of this, um, I mean, what, uh, in terms of wild waterfowl, I'm not sure how much wild waterfowl use you're going to get on the pond itself. Is this just like park ducks you're talking about, or what's what's well, the component of the pond? Right now, there's um, there's a ton of waterfowl that are using it, and I see that continuing. There's scop out there. We've seen bufflehead. Um, there's a bunch of teal. Um, there's cinnamon teal. Um, there are going to be areas around the pond that are specifically set aside as just vegetation and not people, at least 25% of the edges. And it's possible we could get, um, you know, cinnamon teal nesting in there. Um, we've had a bunch of other, um, you know, lots of different birds coming through. So it's, you know, it's a big body of water along the Jordan River. And, and we've seen a wide variety of different species. Um, Tracy Aviary has, we have a bird list if you want to, um, I can send you the bird list, but it's almost a hundred different species out there. So, um, and it's a big enough pond and we'll have areas that are really not a lot of people can get to with the vegetation and the way that we have um, areas off limits. And so we expect kind of a balance there, but there's a lot of waterfowl using it right now. Thanks. All right, Dave, you're up. If you had a question still. 
Uh, it was answered. Thanks. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions on this project? Well, thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. Um, okay. So we're going to move on to the next project, uh, 5705 Strawberry Reservoir Co-op Snowplow FY22. Go ahead. Yes, this is Alan Ward uh, with Utah Division of Wildlife up here at Strawberry Reservoir. I, uh, we've, uh, uh, most of you that have been on either of these committees in the past have, have seen this project uh, reoccurring. It's a, a yearly one that we apply for money to plow winter access into Strawberry Reservoir. Um, it's been very successful over the years. Uh, as far as the need goes for this, uh, most of you are aware that Strawberry is one of our most heavily uh, fish bodies of water in the state of Utah. Uh, we get over 200,000 hours just in the wintertime alone up at Strawberry. Uh, and there's, there's definitely a need for access during the winter. Um, in the past, we've obviously had people parking along the highways when there wasn't uh, snow plowed parking lots, which causes a, a huge problem and for snow removal and public safety. So over the years, we've gone through various ways of trying to maintain some, some lots uh, for winter access and keep those plowed. And, and obviously, on certain years, we can get a lot of snow. Other years, we don't get much. Uh, but it, uh, it, it's worked out very well over the years to to get this funding, we have uh, the state parks is our partner on this. Uh, they have some snowmobile access lots up there as well, where they um, plow those for snowmobile trails and snowmobile access. And then we just coordinate with them and they plow uh, the fishing access lots as well. And then we reimburse them for, for that uh, plowing. Um, as far as the, uh, the money goes on this, uh, we, we typically ask for about $20,000 on this. Um, it varies, uh, I'd like to say, quite a bit from year to year, um, but we average around, I don't know, I guess the rough guess, probably around eight to, eight to $10,000 a year um, that we actually spend, but it can be high as high as, I think we spend as high as 15 or, or more thousand, 15, 17,000. Um, a couple of changes that have occurred over the last couple of years on this, uh, just to, I think I mentioned this last year as well, is that uh, uh, the Strawberry Marina parking lot uh, next to the lodge and the store uh, is being plowed by Paul Phillips and uh, the Phillips Marina. And they, they have been plowing that in the past and we used to reimburse them uh, for their plowing efforts, at least to some degree. And what they've changed or what they've started doing in the last few years is to ch charge the public to park there. And the Forest Service just allowed this last year. And so they have started charging the public uh, a fee to park in that parking lot. And uh, this is offsetting some of their costs for plowing that parking lot as well as the access road into there. And, and it's really the access road that costs them the most money to get into the facility. Um, and so they, they, we haven't been reimbursing uh, uh, Strawberry Marina for that. Um, and but we may expand in the future. Uh, it's uncertain yet exactly where and how this is going to happen, but we're trying to get some more access areas over on the Soldier Creek side. Some of you who've been up there are aware that uh, the, the uh, east side road this year has been plowed uh, for some construction activities over by Aspen Grove Marina. So that has provided some additional access, which is nice this year, but that's not from what I understand, that's not going to be an every year thing. It's just kind of a one-time thing as, they, as they're doing some of the construction. So uh, but it has been nice. We've had a little bit extra access. Um, that's all I had on this, this project. If anybody's got any questions. Okay, Jack, you got a question? Oh, I already asked uh, my questions. I'm oh, sorry. sorry, your hand is still up. Uh, oh. Bert, go ahead. Take, take it down. Thanks. Hi, uh, Alan, this is Bert Lay. I mentioned this in regards to Fish Lake a little while ago. I'm gonna keep harping on this. I've fished, uh, ice fished at Strawberry on March 5th and indeed was able to drive over to Aspen Grove and Marina area and also fish there by the dam. 
there were no facilities available, no toilet facilities for the public to use, um, either by the boat ramp, by the dam, and then the facilities at ladders, I would have to say were um, absolutely disgusting. I don't know who's responsible for um, maintaining the toilet facilities, but increasing access without providing a proper facilities for people to use is going to create more problems. Moreover, um, you know, my girlfriend was not interested in using that restroom. And I would like to uh, make the point that Strawberry currently with respect to those uh, access points along Route 40 has a real need for more. Um, I just mentioned this in regards to the snowplow proposal because we're opening this up in the winter, but the facilities are either locked or not maintained through the winter. And there is a problem and there is a need. And I know you're going to probably address some of this in the Chicken Creek, but I wanted to make that point and make everyone aware of that fact. Um, and it is a problem with strawberry with the visitation we're seeing. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. Uh, I, I understand fully. Um, I'll try to address a couple of those. Uh, over on the uh, the east side road that goes into the dam and into Aspen Grove, that was never planned uh, on our end or on the Forest Service end to be plowed. So that access in our minds never should have happened. You should not have been able to drive into Aspen Grove. That should have been closed off. So there was never any plan to have any restroom facilities maintained or opened in that area. So that was kind of an unplanned thing. If it happens in the future, uh, you are correct that we need to be trying to think of ways to accommodate that, uh, to have either pit toilets maintained, open something to, to try to, to provide that service. It's, it's definitely an issue. Um, so we'll have to watch that. Uh, is that road now is owned and uh, maintained by the county. So uh, we'll have to get with the county. Uh, there's been a, it's been a little bit up in the air as to exactly what's going to happen with that access on that road in the future. Um, but we're, we're going to have to figure that out because that is going to be an issue if that road is going to be open. As far as the condition of the other restrooms, uh, the, the restrooms in all of the parking areas are uh, maintained by the, the Forest Service. And I will pass that information along to the Forest Service as far as the condition of those restrooms. But we have tried to provide at least some type of restroom access or facility at, at these lots. Um, but if, if there's an issue there, and I know that the ladders can probably get a lot of, you know, off highway use and different things too, rather than just the anglers, where it probably puts a heavier burden on some of those toilets and, and probably need to be maintained a little better. Um, We'll pass that along. And yes, I will address this as well when we talk about the Chicken Creek East boat ramp and, and the restroom facilities there too. Thank you. I'm aware of the fact that the principal partner is Forest Service and maybe the problem lies in they, them not uh, taking the initiative and in maintaining the facilities since they are charging the public to park and use, use the reservoir as well. All right, thanks, Alan. Any other questions on, on this project? Okay. We're, oh, Dave, you have a question? Yeah, Alan, just curious, who, who's gonna run this snowplow? And obviously most of your fishermen come up there on weekends. Uh, do you have weekend people that are gonna go up there and plow snow if there's a snowstorm uh, over, that, over the weekend? Uh, yeah. Uh, Good question. I, the way this has been managed over the last, oh, geez, I'm trying to think how many years now, eight, 10 years, is that the state parks hires an individual uh, for the winter to do the snow plowing. And that's their full time job. Uh, and so that person, we've been lucky that, that both of the people that we've had do that over the last 10 years have been housed up there at Strawberry Reservoir. So they can respond to snowstorms. And, and it is seven days a week and 24 hours a day. Uh, these guys are pretty dedicated to it, and they'll, they actually like to plow at night. So if you do get those overnight storms, they, they like to go out at nighttime before people show up. Uh, it makes it easier for them to remove the snow. So they've been pretty responsive. We've had a couple of problems over the years, but, but in general, it's worked out pretty well. All 
All right, thank you. Uh, any last call for questions on this one? Okay, seeing none, um, before we move on, I wanna welcome Drew Cushing in with us um, on the Habitat Council side. So thanks for be being on. Um, our next project is 5797 Chicken Creek East Boat Ramp, Strawberry Reservoir. Go ahead. Okay, this is Alan Ward again. I'll, I'll jump into this one. Um, the boat ramp project is, is not, again, is not a new one. This is one that uh, we presented last year as well. Uh, we actually did receive funding from both Habitat and Blue Ribbon on the amount of 25,400 each. Um, and by the time permitting and everything had gotten through last fall, it was mid-September uh, by the time we, we had to go ahead. We actually had contractors um, submit bids uh, by that point. We just couldn't get the contractors on the ground in time. Um, they, they came in at a fairly high price as well because of the time frame. Most guys are so busy right now with their <laughs> with other work that they can't just drop, drop uh, everything else and, and jump into this project for us in the time frame that we had uh, by the end of October before snow usually flies up there and everything freezes up. So uh, it became an issue that we, we just couldn't get it uh, finished uh, in time. And uh, so we, we need to carry this over. I had requested with Habitat Council that we, we carry the funds over into the next fiscal year into FY22. Uh, when I talked with Randy, he, he mentioned that the Blue Ribbon, I would probably have to reapply for these funds. And so that's why I, I put this back into the database again. So however this is handled, whether we want to, uh, you to, to view this as a carryover or, or reapplying for the, the same uh, money, uh, however you guys uh, handle that's fine. Um, the overview or, or kind of the need of this project is, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the strawberry reservoir already, as far as the pressure we get uh, in a year, we get about 1.5 million angler hours of strawberry. It's one of our host, most heavily uh, fish bodies of water in the state. And uh, there, there is a, a need there for improved access in a few areas. If you can go to the overview map on the images, uh, there I just had a picture of kind of an overview of the locations, lot locations. The, the location there in red is the uh, uh, where the new boat ramp would be located. There are two small dots on there as well in yellow. Those are a couple of locations where we have parking lots, but they're very underutilized most of the year. Uh, the Chicken Creek East parking lot, which is the yellow dot to the to the right, is is plowed in the winter time, but typically the access is is pretty rough. It's a couple hundred yards across to three feet of snow just to get to the water's edge. Um, it, it's a small parking lot. It gets uh, blown in with snow fairly easily and it, it just doesn't accommodate very many people. So the intent of this new project was to provide better access for anglers in this area up on the north end of Strawberry. And uh, we have a fairly protected bay there in Chicken Creek East with the, you know, the Jake's Bay, a lot of people call it. Um, it's fairly protected bay. It would offer a good place to launch small watercraft. We had a lot of need from anglers or desire from anglers to provide more small watercraft launching, things like uh, pon small personal pontoon boats or, or float tubes and other small watercraft. Uh, a lot of these people currently launch off of that roadway that you can see uh, that runs across kind of the water there. Uh, they, they pull down to the edge of the water and then just try to launch off of the old roadbed. That's actually the old Highway 40 roadbed. And uh, it's, it's a primitive area. It's not improved at all. Um, and people will try to, to launch from there as it is. But what we build a bigger parking lot, uh, a nice parking lot that can be plowed easily, again, for winter access. Um, and yes, Bert, we will try to provide some restroom facilities and hopefully they will be maintained. Uh, and uh, we'd also like to put in a small boat launch there. Um, and it provides some good access on that north end of the reservoir. Um, so that, that kind of covers uh, some of the needs. Now, uh, as far as the timeline on the remainder of this, uh, we're hoping to have this installed by the end of this uh, uh, summer. So by, by the end of October is what we typically get as a timeline or a timeline on that. Uh, things start to freeze up and become a problem for construction after that. Um, 
one of the changes that has happened in 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 recent months is that uh, uh, the Forest Service has agreed to to take on this project uh, for us and kind of run the the uh, overseeing the construction of it. The reason for this is is they have some contractors that are, are kind of on I can't remember what they call them they're on retainer or whatever where they can. Uh, just utilize those contracts without going through a long, lengthy uh, public bid process. And uh, we, they feel like these contractors are going to be able to do it in the time frame and at the price uh, tag that we had on this project, which which would definitely be a huge benefit to us. Um, and as far as, you know, the, the current status of that, I don't know, Anthony. I've got Anthony Gray here from the... Uh, uh, the Forest Service, I don't know if he wants to jump in and kind of give us a status of where the Forest Service is with that, or I can give a quick rundown if, if he's not on. Hey, I'm, I'm on. Um, I'll talk about okay. um, I'll talk a little bit about it, then I'll pass it to Ryan. Um, he's our engineer. Um, with, we're Right now, we're currently um, working on the agreement. Hopefully, we'll have the first round to our finance folks next week and then after she approves it we'll be passing that to pwr to get the, the agreement the funds uh you know have that all approved um ryan would you like to talk about uh engineering uh, engineering side yeah tell me if you can hear me because i'm not real confident with this uh okay it looks like yeah. you can't yeah, hear we, me we got gotcha. you <laughs> i got a new computer and i'm still trying to learn how to use it what we've got to, with the design drawings, we've been through a couple iterations on it. We're set to finalize those drawings and submit them to our contracting group next week. Um, we'll be putting it into a, what we've got is a, an indefinite quantity contract with uh, three specific contractors that we have some experience with. And I know one of them has done boat ramp construction before, so they could be a really good option for us. Uh, the scope of the contract we'll be doing, we'll build the road, we'll build the parking lot, and we'll put the boat ramp in as far down as we can into the reservoir. Um, and then, I, as I understand it, the county will be doing the aggregate surfacing on the, uh, in the parking lot and on the road. We expect to be able to award the contract. It could be as early as 30 days after we submit it to our contracting group. Um, we certainly expect it to be before 60 days. The period of performance for the contract is anticipated to be brought late in September and through the first part of October uh, to capture the low water elevation, <clears throat> um, but preferably before we get into cold weather concre concreting. Um, any questions on that? This is Rick Sidfager. Sorry, Alan. Um, Go ahead. No, I just, go ahead. Thank you, Alan. Um, I was just wondering how large a parking lot are we talking about here? This is an area that I am fairly familiar with. Uh, the 200-yard hike out to the water right now, Alan, that you mentioned can be not fun at times. Um, I just wondered how big a parking lot, because there's a lot of folks that use this area, and I just wondered what kind of how many vehicles are we looking at being able to park there? Plus, is it going to be big enough because there's folks that bring in their ramp or their trailers there for snowmobiles? And I wish I could tell you right off the top of my head how many cars are in the, or, or how many stalls we've got in the parking lot. It's uh, at least three rows plus storage area. Um, might be able to try and I can find the drawings real quick. Yeah, will you will you bring up that overview drawing that's in the images? Uh, if you go down to the bottom, there's a PDF. The bottom of the image files. Yes, the design overview. Okay, no, never mind. It doesn't show it on there. Um, I know that we had it designed for double, you know, for trailer parking. Uh, the original design, I think, had 73 parking areas for double, you know, for a uh, vehicle with trailer. I don't know what the current one has. Yeah, I don't actually. I don't. I haven't made any changes to the actual size of the parking lot um, in this last iteration, and so yeah, we just don't have the sheet that shows the the parking stalls. 
Um, at some point, the anticipation is that we would asphalt this parking lot and then we'd be able to manage that parking better. Um, and that's, that's what we've got is an, a sheet that shows the asphalt striping. And that would yeah. show those 73 stalls. <clears throat> I apologize, I didn't have that on there. Could you also go to the uh, finance page? I didn't go through the finance portion of this. Uh, and just discuss the partners. If you scroll down to the, the funding, um, we do have partners and partners on this. Obviously, we're, we're asking again for the 25,400 uh, from Habitat and Blue Ribbon. However, we want to split that. If you go down further, we've got about $100,000 coming in from the uh, Outdoor Recreation Grant. Uh, Trout Unlimited, Strawberry Anglers Association, and a couple of other groups have, have pitched in some money uh, to this project. And then, of course, uh, Brian had mentioned Wasatch County was going to do some in-kind work for us as far as the surfacing uh, and, and final grading of this, of this project. And then the bulk of the money will be coming from the uh, motorboat access fund. Uh, but we do need this money to provide that match so that we can get enough of the federal uh, aid to do that. So anyway, just wanted to make sure we ran through the finance part of that. All right. Thanks, Alan. Any uh, additional questions on this project? Rex? I, I, I guess my concern is after, you know, fishing there in the winter, Alan, that 73 lot, uh, parking places you know, or we haven't built a lot yet that we could probably go double that size and not even still have and still have room or not have room. So I just while we're looking at it, I would I we might want to consider a little larger is my concern because I've been there when folks were parked out in the snow and everything. And I, I know there were well past 70 trucks and cars there. Yeah, no, well taken and and it is a it is an issue for us anthony did you have something to add to that uh yeah i did um being uh within sage grouse habitat um with the forest service we had to uh we couldn't have really have no net increase in habitat loss for sage grouse so by taking away the two day use size uh sites and combining them here we uh there was no net loss or so there's actually a little net, uh, net gain for sage grouse habitat so that's why we kind of picked the size. Yeah, thanks, Anthony, for reminding me of that. The the two lots the previous mentioned previously mentioned that had determined the size of this lot. Uh, they had originally decided that if we decommissioned a couple of underutilized lots, so that we could combine that footprint into this larger one, um, and it will give us a, a net increase in the winter time. You know, the, the current lot down there at Chicken Creek East, I mean, if you had vehicles with trailers there, you'd probably fit about 10 of them in there. Uh, it's so small. So we are going to see a net increase to the parking size in that area. Uh, but it is a, a bigger concern reservoir wide. Um, you know, we, we were kind of lucky in a way that we had that road spot on that east side this year uh, to allow additional access in there. But we are working with the Forest Service on some other ideas to try to expand some permanent parking over there um you know to, over on the soldier creek side and trying to expand a little bit here and there where we can um to try to provide a little bit more access if, if possible okay yeah, great. That's, the, that's the parking layout that you see right there oh, okay all right uh, i'm looking for more hands i see one from drew yeah, Alan and someone from the Forest Service, I, I assume there's a formal agreement for future maintenance and management of this boat ramp and parking lot moving forward. So we're not uh, faced with another situation where we're paying for snow plowing, et cetera. Yeah, so as far as the snow plowing goes, we that will be part of our, our responsibility as far as the DWR in the future for the angler access portion of this and so that will tie into the previous project that I just addressed uh, for the snow plowing. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty confident that we can still cover that snow plowing under that uh, dollar figure that I had on the, the snow plowing which was the $20,000 and that's you know utilizing state parks to help us plow that. They've already agreed to help us plow that uh, that parking area. 
as far as the maintenance of, of the facilities, uh, Forest Service will take over maintenance of the, of the uh, you know, like the restrooms and things like that. Um, we did in, in ex our talks with them and in agreements with, with them is that when this is paved, which is the ultimate goal, is not part of this phase, but it'd be a future phase. If we did do pavement on that parking lot, uh, we would probably enter into an agreement where we would try to secure uh, the motor boat access funds in the future or some other way to help them with the cost of, of uh, maintaining the asphalt. All right, thanks, Alan. Um, any follow-ups? I'm looking for any other hands or uh, questions on this one. All right, I don't see any, so um, thank you, Alan. Appreciate that. We're gonna move on to our next project here. Um, we're moving to our southeast region now. Uh, project number 5568, Manti LaSalle, Healthy Forest Restoration. Go ahead. Hi, everybody. This is Nicole Nilsson, the restoration biologist down in Price for the southeastern region. Um, I'm going to present the upland components and then I'm going to kick it over to Calvin to talk about the stream components. So, um, yeah, Daniel, why don't you kind of let's let's look at the bull hog stuff first and I'll talk about that and then we'll move around to some of the other. So we have we have multiple ecotypes that we're looking at doing some restoration in on the on forest lands on the Manti. So this is Mahogany Point and out towards Horn. We will also be doing some South Horn. We'll be doing some work. So for those of you that are not familiar with this area, you're just you know, south of Joe's Valley Reservoir. Um, this is a pretty crucial winter range for, for deer and elk on the, for the Manti unit. Um, in our region, at, for regional rankings, we've ranked this our number one elk project and our number four deer project. So it's pretty important to us here in the region. Um, but we're, we're getting some pretty, pretty good encroaching pinion and juniper out in this area. Um, we also have sage grouse in this area as well as as deer and elk that winter in this area. We do have some some resident deer that, that hang in this area, but I would say it's probably more crucial for, for wintering deer and elk. Um, and then Daniel, go a little bit more and kind of show them the, the south horn units. So we have some more units just to the south. Yep, just, just barely below, below that mahogany, there was some units, Daniel. There you go, right there. So yeah, there's there's some more units right there. Um, I'm trying to remember. I think those are the little, those are more bull hog units. So yeah, there will be a lot of mastication work out out in that area. Pretty pretty good chunk of the area, but it'll definitely improve conditions for deer, elk, and sage grouse. And then why don't you why don't you head south to the pines where you were headed, Daniel? Then we have um, a ponderosa understoring, understory burning component, so some prescribed fire in the pines area. This has been done in years past. It runs in my mind that it's been 10 years or better since they've they've last done understory burning. But they the Forest Service has prepped this area to do to do some understory burning. So hopefully that will bring back some some good forbs grasses. Uh, that's also pretty. Pretty good winter range for elk, especially. Um, you will find some deer out in there, but that one's pretty heavily important for, for elk. And then why don't you head north towards Trail Mountain? So on Trail Mountain, there's an aspen um, prescribed burn. So uh, in the past, we've done some, some prescribed burning. It was just to the east of these units, and we got really good um, aspen regeneration. So the Forest Service is looking at doing some more prescribed fire in this area to promote aspen regeneration and then move clear north to Clear Creek. And there's there's a um, a logging component. So it's just thinning out some of the, the dead trees in that area. So there's there's some of the those units on the Forest Service. Um, that area was some of that area was burned in the Sealy fire. So why don't you go to the pitchers, Daniel, because there's some really good, good pitchers on this one.
so yeah this is mahogany point see that you know we're kind of losing understory and you know just some some regeneration work in here would be really good go to the to the next this is the this is clear creek um this is where some commercial thinning has already occurred that that i think is the private lands but you can kind of see just in the the forefront of the picture that would be some of the, the work in the the forest service so they'd be taking out a lot of that dead and then you can kind of see the slope behind and that would be some areas that they'd be working as well then you go to the next picture um this is the trail mountain burn area so you can see why we we would want to to do some burn work in this and why don't you go to the next one i think that shows yeah that's regeneration from other phases of the prescribed fire and you can see that our regeneration has been really great it's been really successful the deer and elk have loved it in the these areas so it's just been really really kind of a great project when you go to the next picture more of the the trail mountain you know why we would want to burn go to the next one and more more pretty great regeneration keep keep moving along and this is the pines so this is the ponderosa understory burning area you can see we have that duff layer so that will burn off and allow grasses and forbs to kind of come back in and keep going i think that might be the last one maybe there's some more oh there's there's more of the pines burn units you can see that duff layer that we're trying to burn off go to the next one i think that's the more of the trail mountain where they would want to to do some of the prescribed fire yeah i can't remember exactly where that picture is at so going and that's that's it so this this project, like I said, in our region with our regional rankings was our number one elk project, number four deer project. Um, just to kind of let you know what's going on on the Manti. Um, last year, the, the fawn to doe ratio was 49. This year, 49 fawns per hundred does. This year, it's 64. So you can see we're getting some fluctuating fawn to doe ratio. So this, this could really kind of help, you know, improve conditions for for does and kind of help improve our fawn recruitment. Um, and our elk, our elk populations are about 20% below objective and our deer are kind of not quite 20%, but getting into that below objective as well. So that's kind of what we're looking at in the, the upland component. And I'll kick it over to Calvin to talk about the stream. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I'm going to give a little background for our Blue Ribbon uh, Advisory Council members. Um, this year, the Division of Wildlife and the Manti National Forest um, decided to do one proposal for the entire forest with all of our projects together. And so that's why you're hearing stuff from, from Nicole and our upland um, and the fire um, work that they're talking about. Um, what we noticed in the past few years you know, were division crews would be in a canyon like in Huntington Canyon doing stream work and the Forest Service would be in there with the same equipment and large crews um, trying to do work um, right on top of us and so we decided to start working together and planning these large-scale projects where we can use the same equipment same crews and just bounce from uh, an aquatic project to an upland project to a big game project and uh, and just have it all under encompassed in one proposal so uh, as part of the um, stream restoration portion of this, uh, we will be uh, looking to install BDAs or beaver dam analog structures in Nook Woodward, which is a um, tributary to the right fork of um, Huntington Creek. Last year in phase one of our Huntington Creek stream restoration project, uh, we spent two weeks in there. We had a contractor come in and install close to 70 structures. Um, trying to um, get some better pool habitat after the um, fire, uh, Sealy fire and the mudslides uh, after the, the, the 2012 fire. Um, we're seeing some good, good response with those BDAs and we wanted to continue that effort. Um, we lost a entire Colorado River cutthroat trout population in Nook Woodward from this fire. And uh, we are, uh, this is our highest priority for cutthroat and um, um, 
trout work in in the Huntington drainage is getting Nuck Woodward back uh, into a, um, a fishery. And so uh, part of this proposal is to install another two weeks worth of BDA structures below where they uh, finished last year and above, and also to use some of the fire crew and some of the contractors to cut timber, uh, some of the deadfall into the canyon and install um, house structures across the stream to help build up um, the, the stream um, um, foundation. Um, it down cut about seven to eight feet into the into bedrock and we're trying to build pool habitat back up for, for cutthroat trout. So um, I think we're looking at requesting $38,000 um, with help from Trout Unlimited in the forest um, on the BDAs uh, for Nuckwoodward and also for vegetation um, planting on last year's project on the main stem and the left fork of Huntington Creek. We'd like to go in and do some willow plantings on our site from last year. Um, so that's uh, all I have on the stream restoration portion of this. Okay, that's a big project. Um, looking for hands for questions or clarifications here. Okay, I don't see any. Um, all right. Um, Nicole, you guys did a great job. Okay. Very cool. All right. Uh, we'll move on then to the next project. Thanks, you guys. That was a great presentation. Um, our next project is 5745 Recapture Reservoir Recreation Improvements. Go ahead. All right. So uh, just to introduce myself, um, I'm uh, Calvin Black. I'm the Assistant Aquatics Manager out of the Southeast region. Um, this, this project, Recapture Reservoir, um, is the project is intended to begin implementing recreation improvements, uh, primarily boat access improvements and recapture. Uh, phase one of the project will cover installing a boat dock at the reservoir and drafting a plan to improve recreation at the reservoir, including a new boat ramp, hand launch watercraft area, a parking lot, and aquatic habitat structures. And so this year we are seeking funding. Uh, we're seeking $16,000 to install a, and purchase a new boat dock for uh, recapture. So um, a little background, Recapture Reservoir is located a mile and a half northwest of Blanding City. Um, it's a very popular uh, water with the locals. It's uh, several hundred uh, surface acres. Um, it's the only reservoir that is large enough in San Juan County for uh, motorboats um, to recreate on and to have anglers. Um, it's a very popular northern pike fishery and largemouth bass fishery, and um, we see a lot of use uh, on the reservoir. Um, the dam was built across uh, Recapture Canyon, um, and when it, they did that, it flooded the old Highway 191 from Monticello to Blinding City. Uh, Daniel, if you can go to some of the images, I think I've got some pictures. Yep, right there. So when they uh, flooded the canyon and created the, the reservoir, um, they left the old road base um, as a boat launch for anglers. And this is a picture about a few years ago uh, while we were gill netting. As you can see, it's just a narrow path um, down to the reservoir. It's pretty tight, but it's, it's, it's at least access right now. Uh, the issue that a lot of anglers have and a lot of boaters is once you launch your boat, there is not a secure site to uh, beach your boat or to tie off to so you can go park your vehicle. Um, right at the very end uh, of those, uh, go ahead and thumb through the pictures, Daniel. See, yeah, you can see some of the pike there. You can see where the boats are in the background. Um, there are multiple boulders right underneath your motor right there. I will, I will tell on myself, I was down here on uh, Monday, I 
boated this lake I don't know how many times and I still backed into a, a rock and dinged the, the boat prop pretty good. So I'm going to be sending a bill to, to Drew this week uh, for a new boat prop. So, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's highly used, uh, a lot of recreation. Um, for the past five years, we've had a lot of local anglers ask the, for improvements at recapture. And the number one thing that always is brought up is a boat dock. Um, just because of the difficulty of being able to launch and then secure your boat while you're parking your vehicle and then get back into your, um, into your, your boat. Um, for selfish reasons also, um, recapture has become a um, high priority for um, northern pike um, spawning for our tiger muskie propagation. And, and it would be really great for us, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to have some infrastructure there while we're trying to spawn fish back and forth, bring in barrel loads of, uh, of pike to shore to our hatchery folks to have something um, safe that we can be working off of. Um, and so you can see on the picture here, this is a photo of the Joe's Valley boat dock that was installed last year at, up at Joe's Valley. This is the style that we were looking for to, uh, to put into um, recapture. It can be moved by a four-wheeler or even a side-by-side, -side, but it's very secure and it very easily uh, can be moved. So um, that's what the, uh, the locals were looking for and, and would like to see. This is a collaborative project with uh, Blanding City and with support from the Bureau of Land Management. And um, the city is very enthused and active on wanting to do recreation improvements on Recapture Reservoir. Uh, they have um, an in-kind match of $50,000 um, to this project. Um, I've, I, I guess I, I may have mislabeled it as a recreation grant, but uh, the city has allocated $50,000 from their annual budget for recreation improvements at Recapture Reservoir. So it's not actually a grant. They've, they've made it a priority to take funding out of their, their annual budget to go to, uh, um, to Recapture Reservoir. Their match will, uh, will go to hiring a um, consultant and an engineering firm to develop a recreation plan and design drawings for a boat ramp, parking lot, uh, potentially new restrooms, um, habitat structures um, and ATV trails and even maybe camping areas around the reservoir. So uh, they are very interested in, in working um, and, and with us in the BLM. They are, the Blinding City and the BLM are working on an agreement to allow the city to take control and ownership, maybe not ownership, but maintenance of all infrastructure on Blanding. And so they would incur, uh, take in all the costs of maintaining the restrooms, the trash, uh, moving the boat dock and everything like that. And they're just asking the division to help out with funding and to improve the facilities down there. So um, that's, that's our plan this year is phase one is the boat dock. Um, later this year, we'll all be meeting with the city council members to discuss um, future phases of aquatic habitat structures for bluegill, black crappie, bass, and also um, boat ramp and parking areas. Any, any questions? Rex, go ahead. Hey, Cal, this is Rex. Um, I was just wondering, yeah, it, everything, it looks like it's the west side. It's a fairly long road down to get down into the west side, whereas on the east side, you could come right off the highway and it's not very far to get into it right there. I just wondered why the preference for the west side versus the east side there. I, 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 a marvelous project. I just wondered why on that particular one. Um, it's, it's preference for Blanding City. Um, for one, it's closer, but there's also more opportunity to expand parking, restrooms, camping and stuff on the, um, they call it the Blanding sign of the Monticello side. So um, the, the, <laughs> the side. Um, no, you just explained everything down there. Uh, but uh, but also it's, um, poli it's political. Not so much. It's um, that it's just a better staging area, and it's closer for the Blanding city workers. Um, they're even talking about a trail system from town to. 
um, the reservoir for local anglers or kids so they can drive side by side or bikes and stuff so they're not on the highway. Um, so they're, they're looking at opportunities to expand access from the city uh, without having to go onto the highway. Thank you, Cal. Yep. Thanks. Bert, you're up. All right, Cal. I have the benefit of having camped there three nights in October. Um, as someone camping out of a tent, I found the Monticello side to be more peaceful, tranquil. I would like to encourage uh, the managers to consider developing the west side for motor use and developing the east side for hand launch and non-motorized use. Uh, that bay where the cursor is right there is wonderful for kayak fishing. Um, it is uh, really a great place to paddle into. You can get out of the winds. And I camped basically on that point just left of where the uh, cursor is across the bay. Um, I can attest to the fact that Monticello, or sorry, that Blanding is doing a good job with respect to restrooms. Uh, there were porta potties put out and they were maintained while I was there in October. But I think there is absolutely a need for better uh, camping facilities if possible. But for certain, I would love to see more development. Um, and on that east side, that roadbed, that old roadbed, is much more deteriorated on the east side than it is on the west side. So there's more work to be done. And so that's another reason that they would wanna develop this west side for motorboat launch. But I would encourage managers to keep thinking about this as a, a project, um, as I mentioned in Blue Ribbon meetings before, this is one of the few places where you can go and absolutely uh, catch pike on the fly. Uh, and I had a great time in October. And so I, I strongly support this. And I, I think the city's looking to do that as well. So I'm excited for this project. Thanks. I will mention um, in our discussions with Blanding City and the future plans, um, our hand launch craft area has been discussed on the that east side um, and making that the beach area for sunbathers and stuff to go on that side in the hand launch and have all the motorboats launching on the Blanding side or the west side there. So there's not that inter interaction and have the, any safety issues in the future. Great, Drew, you're up. Uh, uh, one, uh, Bert, I think you've gotten soft in your old age. So there's that, you know, if you need a place to get out of the wind, maybe you're, you shouldn't stay in a tent anymore. But uh, this this project is is really uh, really timely, Calvin, and I appreciate you putting it together. And uh, you know that that reservoir is is getting more use every year, and and we're using it more and more every year. So we really need these amenities there to to just take care of the people. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. Any other questions or hands ra hand hands raised on this one? All right, I just appreciate learning that I can send send my bent boat prop bill to Drew. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs> Calvin, well, take it easy on him, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Um, we're at 1046. I know we've still got one more in the southeast region, but let's take, take a break for 10 minutes um, and come back. Well, nine minutes. Let's come back at 1055. Short break.
Um, I think we're going to go back on. I'm getting thumbs up from Michael. Okay, we are on. So thanks everybody for coming back. Um, I guess I'm going to check first. Is our next presenter online? Is that you, Calvin, again? Or yes, that would be me. Okay, perfect. All right, we're gonna we're gonna move move ahead then with project number uh, 5765, uh, Manti Lasalle Angler Access Improvements. And Drew, did you have a, a question first before we jump in? Your hand is your hand is still up. There we go. Nope. Okay, you're still accepting prop bills though, right? Okay. <laughs> I hope so. Yep. All right, Calvin, you're up. Thank you. Uh, Daniel, if you'd like, uh, you can go just to the images and documents. And that might be the easiest way to, to see everything here. So uh, so this project is um, constructed similar to the Manti Healthy Forest uh, project. And in the fact that uh, the forest and the division combine multiple projects uh, in multiple locations on the forest all into this proposal. Uh, so last year, the recreation specialist with the Manti LaSalle National Forest and uh, myself sat down and prioritized um, the angler access projects on the North Manti that were the, in the highest need of repair and reconstruction. And, and this is the list that we came up with. Um, the Forest Service has came up with uh, multiple funding sources and has an in-kind match or a contribution of $43,000. And with that funding, they will be reconstructing two and a half miles of fishing trails, walkways, bridges, and retention walls around Willow Lake, Farron Reservoir, Pete's Hole, and Yearns Reservoir. Um, this is a high priority for them. And it allows anglers better access around these reservoirs and better shoreline access for fishing and also to hand launch uh, watercraft you know, on several of these areas. Um, Daniel, if there's, are there any uh, documents uh, with maps, I think? Yeah, if you can uh, thumb through those, um, people can get an idea of what the trail system will look like. Um, there you go, thank you. So the Forest Service will be up there with crews doing all this work um, as part of uh, their, their contribution to this um, project. Um, the division has felt like we need to increase access for our mobile impaired anglers at Willow Lake. And so while the Forest Service crews will be at Willow um, uh, working on the trail system around uh, the reservoir, um, we decided to uh, install and ask for funding to install an ADA fishing pier at Willow Lake where the access would come from the campground and the uh, trails and walkways would match up and connect to the rest of the Willow Lake Trail. Um, uh, at Willow. Um, there's actually a, a trail all the way around the reservoir. This map, uh, the bottom of the screen just shows the, the new or the reconstruction of the new trail uh, there at Willow, but we are going to be maintaining the entire trail around the reservoir with this proposal. So uh, we're, we're requesting $95,000 for, um, for the first part of a, a fishing pier uh, at Willow. Um, that would include equipment rental costs and equipment for the walkway and a bridge system uh, to connect that trail system for our mobile impaired anglers. Uh, we felt like um, installing the, the pier um, at Willow um, from the campground provides a better access point, uh, more safe, um, uh, safe parking for uh, anglers, especially those who are mobile impaired and also allow them to get out to deeper water uh, to target fish better at this reservoir. The other uh, portion, let's see, um, go ahead and go through those images, uh, Daniel. Uh, so that's Farron um, Reservoir. Um, th there will be a trail system around there. Uh, next picture. Uh, this is Pete's Hole. Um, they will be reconstructing the trail on the back side. Uh, Pete's Hole that will connect the parking area for Academy Mills and the campground. Uh, next picture. 
this is the campground or the corner of the campground at Willow Lake. Um, and this will be part of the parking area for access for the uh, fishing pier. Uh, next picture. Uh, again, this is Willow Lake, um, part of the old trail system right there. You can see it's kind of uh, grown in and um, not that great for anybody in a, in a wheelchair. Um, next picture. And this is the access point from the campground into Willow Lake. So straight in, you see that very first patch of Willow or uh, Quakies. The um, fishing pier is proposed to go right off that point straight out into the reservoir um, and be um, installed there to um, um, then be hooked into the walkway uh, around the, the, the reservoir. Um, we've had a lot, of, a lot of anglers ask for uh, improvements on the forest um, for mobile impaired anglers. And like I said, this is an option I think will benefit many people um, in the, on the Farron Mountain. The other uh, portion of this project is we're asking, requesting funds to um, reconstruct the foundation for a fishing walkway at Beaver Dam or Benches Pond near the turnoff to the Fair Lake, Fairview Lakes on the North Manti. Um, the Division of Wildlife, the Forest Service, and the Skyline Mine provided materials for dedicated hunters uh, a few years ago, and they rebuilt the entire walkway. Uh, but since then, the foundations have failed and have rotted away. And so while the reservoir is low this year, we intend to go in with concrete and gabion baskets to secure that up and, and make that uh, a better um, walkway, uh, fishing um, walkway, boardwalk for uh, all anglers. Um, right now, portions of it's underwater because of no foundation. It's almost on a 45 degree angle on sections because of how things have rotted away. So uh, we'd like to uh, fix that pro uh, uh, project. So um, I'm not sure if there's any more pictures or not, Daniel. Oh, this is a style of, uh, of a pier that we're looking at. This was installed at uh, Little Montez uh, WMA years ago when I was in Vernal. Uh, we're looking to hopefully install a similar style pier, um, but it, that all depends on funding. If we get less funding, we can go with a smaller pier. If, if we get the full amount, we can do a full 140 foot uh, with a 48 foot uh, platform, fishing platform uh, out of the end. Um, one more slide, I think. That's it. So anyways, that's, uh, that's all I have. Um, any questions? I'm looking for hands, Calvin. All right, I don't see any. Uh, looks like a good project. Nice, uh, nice spreading it around um, and, and, and making it, you know, kind of a bigger project, including all those areas. Very similar, so I appreciate that. Okay, if there's not any questions on that, we'll move on. All right, um, that kind of concludes our Southeast region uh, projects. Uh, thanks, Calvin and others for Cole for working on that. We're going to move to northern region projects now. Uh, we had one uh, pull out off the off the agenda uh, that was at the very bottom. Um, and so from northern region, we'll be reviewing four projects overall, and that we have six um, in total uh, before you break for lunch. So um, all right, uh, project 5520, uh, Bear Lake Tributaries and Uplands Restoration. Go ahead. Uh, hello, this is Jim Brito with Trout Unlimited. Uh, Daniel, looks like you got the map up there. So this is phase two of a project that's basically a continuation of work done in phase one that's underway right now. Uh, it's a partnership among Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Fire and State Lands, and Trout Unlimited. Uh, phase one was funded about equally uh, among Habitat Council, Blue Ribbon Council, and BLM. Uh, we made progress on phase one on two tributaries uh, that work was initially proposed and some of the uplands associated with that. And for phase two, we're going to add in a third tributary. So, Daniel, if you could zoom in on North Eden Creek, that's that dot on the map, yep, up by the Idaho line up there. 
a little bit farther in. So many of you know that uh, Bear Lake is a blue ribbon fishery. Uh, the goal of the North Eden Creek work is to basically reconnect about 10 miles of the creek uh, to migratory cutthroat trout that do not have access uh, to the creek right now. Uh, reconnecting this tributary will continue efforts that have been done on uh, the three west side tributaries of the lake that's been really successful. Uh, wild cutthroat trout production has gone from about 10% in the late 1990s, early 2000s to now between about 60 to 70% wild cutthroat trout uh, in the lake as compared to hatchery cutthroat trout. And that's attributed to a lot of this uh, tributary reconnection work. As far as North Eden Creek goes, the, the work proposed there is to address some dewatering on the lower about 1.6 miles of the creek uh, from a current surface diversion. If you could zoom out just a little bit, Daniel. Yeah, if right about where your cursor's at, maybe just upstream from that spot there, there's a gravel pit just a little to the right there. Yep, move upstream. So just upstream from there is the current surface diversion on the creek. Yeah, right in that area. Uh, basically, they pull water from the creek and put it in a pipe, and then that uh, gravity feeds down to the alluvial fan, and they irrigate about 160 acres uh, with that water. You can zoom out again, Daniel, back to the full length and see the tributary mouth there. So they take the water from the creek, but they also utilize uh, an ag well to supplement that water uh, for irrigation. As you can see in the photo, you know, most of it uh, is irrigated under center pivot with uh, uh, some wheel lines as well. So they're relatively efficient in their uh, application methods, but the current system really isn't working uh, to deliver the water that they need for irrigation. And it basically dewaters the creek for a good part of the, uh, the summer as well. So really the goal for the work on North Eden Creek is to improve their, uh, their irrigation system, but then also keep more water in the creek. So under phase one, we looked at three alternatives to do that. Uh, one of those was pumping directly from the lake. The other was creating off-channel storage reservoirs up in the canyon. And the third was to drill a new uh, agricultural well. And after looking at that uh, with the engineering firm and the water users, uh, we settled that option three, drilling a new ag well is the best way forward. So really the next step here being proposed for North Eden Creek is to determine where that well should be located, uh, assess capacity of the well and develop a standard set of criteria uh, for the construction bids. Uh, in order to do so, the engineering firm recommends that we hire a hydrogeology firm to kind of complete those tasks. And the cost of that will be about $30,000, including engineering oversight. Um, we think this will be money well spent, given that we think drilling a new well, uh, adding new pumps, electrical hookups, and all that, uh, construction cost is ultimately going to be $400,000 to $500,000 to do that work. Uh, spending this money up front, kind of this intermediate step, I think will help us make sure we get the, the biggest bang for the buck, basically. Uh, if you go to photos, Daniel. And scroll down to number seven there, that's North Eden Creek. That's uh, the image before, yep, right there. So this is a picture looking up North Eden Creek. That, that is the creek, uh, though it looks like a ditch because it is ditched basically from about the mouth all the way up to the road. Um, pretty much it's uh, confined between a fence on the left and, and an irrigated field and a road on the right as you're looking up the canyon. Uh, as you can see, the habitat's pretty lousy, but also there's no water in the creek. So again, that's the primary goal is to put more water in this section of the creek and improve the passage conditions uh, for these migratory cutthroat upstream. I'm also currently working on kind of a habitat restoration design for this stretch of the creek, as well as the culvert that's perched underneath the East uh, Lake Road there that's about four feet perched and do doesn't allow cutthroat passage. So addressing those as well uh, will be part of the long-term project here. But again, first step was kind of address the water situation. Go to the next picture, Daniel. So this is the uh, the current ag pump. It was installed in 1955. Um, initially, we think it, it was supposed to provide about three CFS of water at a max capacity for pumping. And that's actually what the engineer has calculated is kind of the current demand uh, for irrigation for all the acreage uh, based on some calculation he did of, of the acreage, the crops grown, uh, evapotranspiration and all that type that basically we need a, a full three CFS. So that's kind of what we're looking for again to come out of the new ag well. We did look into refurbishing this well, but we got a couple opinions from engineers and others that uh, given the age of the well, you know, it's over 65 years, uh, probably not going to be doable 
and trying to refurbish would do more damage than good. It's currently only producing, according to the water users, about half the water that's needed. So again, why we've settled on looking for a, uh, a new well is kind of the option uh, to improve not only their irrigation system, but also the, the creek flows. If you go back to the uh, map, Daniel, and we'll go to uh, the south end of the lake in Lake Town Canyon. We'll be just south of Lake Town there. I don't know if you can zoom in on the, there's a highlighted area up in the creek where we're looking at a creek crossing. Yep, let's see, it should be that one channel realignment. One more down there. Yep, right there. And you're gonna be a little farther to the south. Keep going. Keep going. Yep, you can see it there. So this is also continuation of work done um, under an existing grant in phase one. Uh, we worked on three road crossings. You can kind of see the road going up Lake Town Canyon there, or Mill Canyon it's called locally. Uh, all these crossings on, are on BLM ground. Uh, the three crossings that we addressed last autumn um, have been rebuilt and pretty much taken care of. A little touch up work on one crossing just above this. But this particular crossing right here is the most challenging. Uh, again, also on BLM ground, but it also provides a uh, pretty nearby. If you can see kind of the uh, where your cursor's at, Daniel, go a little to the east. There's a fenced in area there that's highlighted within that uh, um, polygon basically. But that fenced in area is uh, one of the spring water sources for the city of Lake Town. And so the city of Lake Town and the Lake Town irrigators came to the BLM to say, we'd like to address this crossing. And uh, you'll see why when we look at some of the photos. So maybe just go to the photos, Daniel, might get a better feel for this. And you can kind of start at the top there. So this is an image of that fenced in area. Uh, and again, you can see the, the cap kind of inside there and the concrete, that's where Lake Town spring water sources for culinary water. And so you can see the roadway uh, right alongside of the, uh, the fenced in area. And on the other side of the fenced in area is actually the old creek channel. You go to the next photo. Uh, here's stepping back a little bit from that area, but on the left of the photo, if you can make it out in those trees is actually where the creek is ditched and put into a basically a canal up on the hillside. Um, but then some of the water is actually trying to find its way to the lowest part of the valley bottom and actually running down the road, if you can see by those ATVs there. You go to the next photo. And this is that water running down beside the road and, and actually under that ATV is a culvert, which then drops the water back down to the old historic channel uh, of Lake Town Creek. Go to the next one. So this is where the water is actually running out of the ditch, ditch section where the, uh, the ATV crossing is. So the ATVs basically run across the canal, which is you know the creek basically, but then the water is running down the roadway and then going down the roadway past the spring water source and then uh, back into the creek where I was just showing those previous photos. Maybe the next photo. Another look at kind of that road crossing area right there where the problems are occurring. We go to the next one. And then lastly, this is kind of looking upstream from where that water drops back down in where I previously showed the ATBs were. On the right side of the photo, if you kind of make out the low depression there, that's actually the historic channel of the creek. Uh, it was ditched obviously decades ago and put up on the hillside. So our proposal basically is to put the water back into the old historic channel. So we'll have to come up with survey and design for that. And then ideally, I think, move the road from where it's currently along the other side of the fenced in area, actually, and put it where uh, the creek is running in the ditch up on the hillside to try to get as much separation as possible uh, from the roadway uh, to the creek. And then that'll also eliminate the creek crossings uh, completely uh, doing that. And that will also fully reconnect Lake Town Canyon uh, to Lake Town Reservoir as far as cutthroat trout, maybe establishing kind of a mini fluvial run, if you will, of cutthroat, because right now, uh, probably few to no fish can move from the reservoir up into the creek, uh, given all the uh, passage problems at this site right here. All right, maybe we can go back to the, uh, the map, Daniel, and go over to Cottonwood Creek. And that's going to be, yep, right in that area there. There's a couple dots there. That's probably sufficient there. So one dot is actually an irrigation diversion. Uh, that's the lower one, yep. And then the upper one is a culvert. 
So if we can go to the photos, Daniel, we'll take a look at both of those sites. And yep, that first one in Cottonwood there. So this is the irrigation diversion. If you kind of make it out in that photo, uh, those long skinny things are actually cutthroat trout that are dead on the irrigation diversion. So that screen is sitting in the creek. And during low water times, like you see there, cutthroat are basically caught and killed on the screen. And as well, it catch, captures a lot of debris. So it's not a real efficient and effective, obviously for fish, but also not for diverting water. So the irrigators would like a better system for uh, diverting their water, which goes into a pipe. And we'd like a better system that doesn't kill cutthroat uh, on the screen. We go to the next photo. So this is looking uh, at that diversion and you can kind of see the box that those folks are standing on there. That's where the water goes into. And there's actually another screen in there before it goes into a pipe structure, uh, then goes down to pressure feeds down to some irrigation. Go to the next photo, Daniel, please. This is looking a little bit closer up at that diversion, kind of see the in canal uh, or in, in creek canal part of the, uh, the screen there. Go to the next one. And then this is kind of looking upstream. So it's a small diversion, but fairly complex given the uh, proximity to the road. And then also look, working with that existing structure there. I guess what we're proposing here is a look at a couple of different alternatives to rebuild this structure. Uh, to prevent that fish entrainment, like you saw, but also improve irrigation diversion. You know, one of the options may be to completely uh, rebuild and take this structure out. Another option may be to retrofit, though some of that concrete and the setup's a little old. So basically what we're proposing is money to do the engineering to come up with the design uh, to improve this structure. So maybe we can go to the budget next, Daniel. So total project cost is about $172,000 for the work outlined. If you scroll down uh, to the funding, uh, we're looking at, we have secured about 25,000 already from BLM that's going into the project and that'll be uh, directed towards that Lake Town work out there. And then we're uh, requesting roughly $30,000 each between Blue Ribbon and Habitat Council uh, for the project. And that should be it in a nutshell. Thanks, Jim. Uh, any questions on this project for Jim? Looking for hands. Uh, Dave. Jim, I'm just curious who's responsible for the power bill for the pump. So currently the, uh, the water users on North Eden Creek, they pay that power. I mean, they're, they're pumping right now as well, kind of supplementing what they're taking from the, the creek. And so they will have an additional uh, power cost because they'll be pumping their full uh, supply basically pumped versus taking it from the creek. But I think they're willing to do that given they'll have a new setup basically that'll provide uh, more reliable water uh, to their ground. All right, Randy, you're up and then Drew, you'll be next. Yeah, I got a quick question, Jim. I, maybe I missed this, but I, on the North Eden Creek project, I was just wondering how much flow you project kind of being returned to the creek through the work that you're talking about and whether that's gonna be enough for fluvial cutthroat passage. Yeah, so we, we don't have any gauging data. There is none on the creek. And so we're, we've come up with estimates, if you will, of, of water use based on, again, their acreage and crops and all that type of thing. Um, you know, if they're gonna be taking three CFS pumped, we're probably looking at hopefully at least three CFS taking, you know, staying in the creek. And so again, that would be, you know, during the, the, the middle of the irrigation season, hopefully that would be as low as it gets. But basically we're looking at hopefully reestablishing kind of the, the natural hydrograph. You know, whatever flows out of the mountains comes down to the creek uh, mouth with the lake. And that should be sufficient. Um, runoff typically occurs a little earlier on that east side. You know, it's happening in April over there, giving a little lower elevation than some of the west side tribs. Um, it can peak pretty good uh, at times. I think we we looked at some USGS stream stats program and you know, they're upwards probably of 50 CFS coming down. So probably passive would be plenty to get fish up through there. Um, we want to make sure that we're not stranding fish on the way back down. That's really the concern of like Scott Tolentino, that we don't create a sink, you know, for spawning fish and some of their, their offspring uh, in the low or dewatered section. So that's why I really wanted to address the, the water issue first, uh, North Eden. Thanks, Jim. Drew, you're up. Yeah, uh, Jim, great project. Uh, 
I'm curious about your well work that you've identified there. It, it seems a uh, pretty pretty low cost if you're going to mess around with a well. And I was wondering, are you going to use the same casing and then just put a new pump on, or is that is that what I'm kind of that's what I anticipate? And I just wanted a clarification there. Right. So the the work we're proposing this year is to assess where the new well would go. So the the old well or current well would be completely abandoned. So we're kind of proposing this intermediate step, if you will, to bring in the hydrogeology firm to kind of assess where it should go and then assess capacity of that well and then come up with kind of a standard criteria list so that we can actually go out to bids, uh, you know, for drilling a new well. And again, the new well construction is probably going to be somewhere in the four to five hundred thousand dollar range. We're proposing this intermediary step of about thirty thousand to kind of figure everything out for that next phase. Thanks, Jim. That helps. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. We have one more. Let's see, Rex, you're up. Jim, yeah, this looks like a good project. I just was wondering how deep is that current well that they drilled back in the '60s? Do you know? And how big is the casing that they're pumping out of? I'd have to look back at the at the numbers there. I, I think they were down close to 200 feet, which is a little surprising given the proximity to the lake. But again, that's you know cost wise why we're thinking we're going to be in that four to five hundred thousand dollar range ultimately because it's all based on how how deep you drill. If I remember casing size, geez, for the existing, I I forget exactly. But I think that's in part what we want to look at with this intermediary step with a hydrogeology firm is what size casing would we need to provide the full three CFS capacity at max uh, for the new well. So trying to dial that all in as well as depth of water where the, the new well will go will be kind of determined with this kind of next step. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thanks, Rex. All right. Any other questions on this project? Paul? No question. Okay. Um, all right. Thanks, Jim. I'd like to just mention, uh, you know, it's great to see the collaboration with water users uh, and ag folks. That's that's pretty huge. And uh, I'd like to see that continue both with our staff and, and with our partners, uh, Tread Unlimited and such. I know that's, you guys do that a lot, but it's, it's great to see it happening some more. So thanks. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Appreciate it. Yep. We're going to move on to the next project, uh, 5566 Weaver River Watershed Restoration Phase 1. Go ahead. So I'm just going to, um, this is a project that I've uh, submitted, but I'm going to turn the time over to Eric McCulley. It's a kind of a, a comprehensive project with a bunch of partners. And since I sit on the Habitat Council, I I've, I wanted to um, make sure that I wasn't presenting. So, um, so Eric's going to take the presentation. Thanks, Paul. Again, this is Eric McCulley. I'm with River Restoration, and we're working with Paul and other partners in the Weber River watershed to improve the um, the water quality and the fish habitat. Also, working on rangeland resiliency um, and some fire work up there. And there's also mule deer habitat. Um, so this is a really large effort. If you look at the map, you can see on the screen there's a, a bunch of different sites it's hard to see them on the map and so daniel can you just go to the um go back to the project and we actually have a big map of everything so it, i think it's easier to see that way on the um, documents at the bottom of images there's a i'm sorry images yeah at the very bottom there's a map of the entire basin and um and so here's here's the map of the basin you can see the the scope is basically from the top of the watershed all the way down to um ogden and and the basically where ogden and weber river come together uh, and there's work throughout the basin there's um fish icons on here that show um most of the sites and and then there's um you know so you can see where the focus area is here and and also the water quality and fisheries improvement. So over the years, the group working in the Weber Basin called the Weber Partnership has um, you know, put in a bunch of different proposals for all different projects throughout the basin. And based upon feedback from a lot of folks, uh, the funders um, you know, here and also with water quality, 
uh, we got together this year to come up with one big watershed effort. Uh, the stakeholders include the Weber River Watershed Coordinator, Utah Division of Water Quality, Trails Foundation of Northern Utah, Wild Utah Project, DWR, NRCS, Ogden City, several private landowners and water companies, and Trout Unlimited. So it's a lot of different groups working together, and, and Paul is, is kind of helping keep the train going down the tracks here, So and I'm happy to assist. Um, so I talked about the, um, you know, the main focus is improving watershed conditions, uh, livestock management for rangeland, uh, resiliency and productivity, and important habitats for mule deer. And there's basically three different main areas that, that we're focusing on. The upper watershed conservation actions in Chalk Creek, native fish resiliency work in the lower Weber River, and habitat improvement in the lower Weber River. And I'll briefly go through each of these. So the upper watershed is Chalk Creek, and um, the four key values there are agricultural sustainability, water quantity and quality, Bonneville cutthroat trout, and big game populations. There's a large um, mule deer migration area in that area. And actually, um, Daniel, if you could go please to the uh, documents and, and pull up the, um, there's, yeah, there you go. The migration, yeah, that one. All right, so these are the you know migration corridors in the in the upper Weber River. So there's a lot of connectivity for mule deer. Um, we don't have a map, but there's also connectivity issues that are being addressed for for fish and Bonneville cutthroat trout. And there's also sedimentation in this area. So if we could go to the images and just go ahead and pull up the the upper image, yeah, that one. Open that up. Um, there's a lot of places the banks are failing, and um, you know there's there's efforts throughout the watershed to improve that. This is it um, contributes a lot of uh, phosphorus. These are high high phosphorus soils, so it's a water quality problem and also a habitat problem. So if you just want to click through those images, um, this is a diversion in the lower area, and I'll talk a little bit about this as well. But um, go ahead and click through. Uh, another diversion we're working on in the lower area. Um, and so th these are some images of the, you know, the severe erosion in, in the upper Chalk Creek area. You go ahead and click through these. Um, so the last several years, there's been a fish passage improvements that have been done, irrigation diversion improvements, and rotational grazing strategies, off-channel water systems conifer removal, aspen regen, and beaver dam analogs. And that's proposed to continue. There's a um, CRMP in the upper area of Chalk Creek that um, has identified a lot of these actions, and, and that's a main focus in that upper area. Um, there's also going to be large-scale changes in grazing management based upon the partnerships. Um, so we can stop, stop there um, on the photos. This will be I'll, I'll get to the discussion of some of these diversions in, in a moment. Um, so the Morby Creek, um, reducing the channel erosion is, is some of the images that you saw, and that's the upper Chalk Creek. Um, there's also some fire you know, improvements. There's some juniper um, encroachment, and some of the juniper ends up going into the beaver dam analogs that are being proposed for up there. So that's the upper watershed area. Um, the lower Weber River habitat area is basically from the mouth of Weber Canyon down to the um, Ogden and Weber confluence. So, um, which includes uh, Trails Foundation of Northern Utah, Blackener's Bend project. Phase one was completed this last year. It's a side channel to benefit bluehead sucker and other uh, aquatic species there, and also to, to improve the riparian areas. Um, it's a beautiful side channel and with a bunch of backwaters. Um, some of the previous work that was done on bluehead suckers identified that the juveniles don't have anywhere to go. They need some backwaters. And so that was phase one, which was completed but then uh, phase two is to add some additional floodplain connectivity 
and also to um, work with Trails Foundation of Northern Utah to connect that and add uh, wildlife watching and angling trails. And, and it's, a, it's a nice stretch of river down there. Um, the Weaver River through this reach has also downcut and you know, basically desertified. You know, there's cactus out there on the floodplains and sagebrush, and we're trying to get more water connected back on the floodplains. And in 2016, the Uinta fire burned through a bunch of the cottonwood forest. So trying to regenerate some of that um, riparian area. So it's improving the riparian resiliency by bringing the groundwater up. Um, and it also supports a long-term plan to um, have a pedestrian access down through there and important side channels for bluehead sucker. Um, there's also some trail protection in there. There's some areas of eroding trail um, in River, Riverdale area. And um, what we're trying to do is really figure out where are the areas that erosion is happening and where's deposition happening and, and create more of a balance. Um, some site specific bank restoration will be done in this area. Um, then there's the lower Weber River connectivity, focusing on critical habitats in the Weber and Ogden River, um, active diversions and obsolete diversions and, and making the river longitudinally connected. Um, in 2020, there was an RCPP grant from the NRCS, Regional Conservation Partners Program grant for in-stream habitat. And um, there's a few different diversions down on the lower Ogden and Weber rivers we're working on. So if we could go back to the images, please. And um, those, I think, yeah, we can click on that one, the Dinsdale. So this is one of them, Dinsdale diversion on the Ogden River. It's actually a, a rail line and spiked in rail, um, railroad rails uh, just under that bridge. And, and there's some need for uh, connectivity there. So we can close that and then um, scroll up. And the first two pictures in here are two of the other diversions. Or, um, so this, I'm sorry, go to the next picture. Yeah, just there. All right, so this is the Riverdale bench diversion. Uh, creates a fish passage barrier, a bunch of concrete piled up in the river, and uh, it's, a, it's a tight area. So, um, you know, Paul's working on that to try to get connectivity through here. Um, and then let's go to the next one. And then this is the Wilson Canal diversion, which is a, right under 24th Street in Ogden. Um, there's also the um, Ogden Whitewater Park below, which has fish passage, recreation access, and protection of a 36-inch sewer line uh, that's going to be underway this year. Um, and then, let me see, there's revegetation and floodplain habitat construction on the Marriott Ditch, which, which is over on the Ogden River. Um, that is actually, a lot of work is being done under an emergency watershed protection plan right now and uh, the work has to be done in the next five days. So um, this will be following up on that with revegetation and floodplain habitat. All the EWP money has to be spent by March 31st, but there are steps in the future. Um, and then those diversions, you know, the design on there. So why don't we go to the finance and the, and the budget section. Um, so there's a bunch of different partners involved in this. Um, the items are broken out um, for the different project elements, and, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, uh, but each of these individual projects has, you know, specific project budgets. Uh, the request is $50,000 from the Habitat Council to, um, to leverage against a lot of other different funding sources on this. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of different partners working throughout the area. Um, there's, you know, some of these diversions, um, and, uh, you know, con connections, um, you know, they end up being significant in the expense and, and that's what, um, the Riverdale bench canal and Blackener's Bend projects, um, but they have a really high level of impact as well. So, um, and then monitoring, there's a lot of different groups working on this. Uh, we've started a Utah Water Watch program in the area. Um, 
There's temperature and water quality loggers. We're working with Division of Water Quality uh, to improve, you know, the water quality conditions as well. And there's also um, bluehead sucker and Bonneville cutthroat trout monitoring done by the Division of Wildlife Resources. Um, future management of the projects. Each of these has a, a site steward, basically, whether it's a private landowner or Trails Foundation or Ogden City um, and, you know, Trout Unlimited is, is working with the different groups to ensure that future management is done on these. So um, that's uh, that, that goes through most of the presentation. Paul, did you have anything to add? Nope, nothing for me. Nice job, Eric. All right, thank you. And so does anyone have any questions? Drew, you're up first. Yeah, with the, all of the habitat, uh, issues in the weaver and all the fragmentation of of that river system how did these raise to the top how did you guys prioritize these above all of the others i i can i can answer that um with the with the lower weaver um we've basically prioritized that lower reach um basically from the slaterville diversion up into morgan uh, for habitat reconnection, and there's there's only a handful of of uh, irrigation diversions within that reach, and so um, our our overall goal is to make all of those in those pieces of infrastructure on the main stem passable. Um, it was mainly because of the fact that we bo have both bluehead sucker and um, Bonneville cutthroat trout in that reach. Um, so with both of those species occurring there, that that's a really high priority for us. Um, in terms of like specific uh act, you know specific diversions um some of this is opportunity um the riverdale bench is a good example of um uh, an opportunity although it's, it's a priority as well um this water company has been cited for doing some uh non-permitted uh, uh maintenance work on their diversion structure and so um through the uh, through the stream alterations program, we actually have been working with them on helping them with issues with their with, with their permitting, and that's just basically elevated that diversion structure as a priority because you know that it's a it's a maintenance issue for them. Uh, they need to do something, and 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 you know we want to be a partner with them and make make sure it's done right. Um, you know, with the Wilson Canal and uh, the Lower Ogden River uh, diversions, um, those those were highlighted in uh, the research that Sarah Knoll did uh, a couple years ago as um, priority main stem diversions. It was mostly for bluehead sucker, uh, I, although I think that I, that's maybe a little bit questionable whether or not bluehead sucker will repopulate the Ogden River. There, there are historical records, but that lower diversion uh, on the, the Marriott diversion is about a quarter mile up, up from the mouth of the river and it's a complete, it was a complete barrier to fish movement. So um, so reconnecting those two were, was a priority based on that model that Sarah Knoll had put together. Okay, thanks. Bert, you're up. I just had a quick observation. Uh, while I can appreciate a watershed-based approach, it makes it really difficult to consider these projects, because you're talking about so many different things that having so many different impacts on so many different aspects of recreational use and fisheries throughout the Weber Basin. But um, I just, I, I, I get the point that you're trying to do what you can. It's based on opportunity and that these are the things that you can do now that you feel make the best, uh, you know, biggest impact. Any thoughts on that? Um, I'll just say that, um, you know, the watershed restoration initiative is a, um, is, is a great program that, it, um, really focuses on this basin wide or large scale efforts. And so if we, from, from a coordination perspective, if we can tie together and coordinate these different, you know, arrays of projects, uh, into one coordinated effort. Then we start seeing those broader benefits and and we get i mean the big thing is, is we get the the stakeholders talking to each other and coordinating on projects instead of me doing some projects you know down in the one part of the lower weber and and um 
Trails Foundation doing something else and the Northern Region doing something else um, in a less coordinated effort. That's really been our goal is just to make sure that we're all working together on these proposals. One, to make them more competitive, but two, just to make sure that our, our on the ground benefit is, is more significant. Thanks. I appreciate, you know, for years we've been scoring connectivity projects kind of one by one. So this is interesting to consider it more broadly, but thank you. Thanks, Bert. Thanks. I, I guess maybe I'd ask um, any of the WRI folks where this might have ranked in the, in the WRI system for that portion. I don't know, Tyler, do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. Allison, have you got that spreadsheet? I've, I've got it. It ranked as a high uh, with a score of a 149. So it's it's up there. Uh, I think Paul, you're you're to your point. You know these these projects uh, that are, that are kind of more watershed focused, collaborative. You know they they are going to have they are going to pull in other partner money a lot a lot more readily, and so, um, you know, uh, uh, I appreciate that um, uh, that that we can do that, and and it kind of kind of hits a, you know number of issues that are going on there and then you maybe you'll come back again in, a, in you know a few years and do it again with another round but i don't know all right any, any other questions on this project i just wanted to comment um further it is their number three project for the region so all funding right. Thanks, everyone. is pretty good so okay thank you all right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. I um, appreciate the collaborative focus on that. So, okay, we're going to move on to the next project. We're at uh, 1142 and we've got one, two, three, four more to go. And I know that last one was pretty comprehensive, so it took a little bit longer. And that's okay. Um, project 5646 Northern Region Easement Technician FY22. Go ahead. This one's a little bit less glamorous, um, but important nonetheless. Uh, we've got in the neighborhood of 30 conservation easements in the northern region, and it's incumbent upon us to monitor them annually. Um, I guess from a historic background, I find these things fairly important because I started in the northern region in December of 1990, and at that time, just for example, the Weber River had about three quarters of a mile of public access from the mouth of the canyon to Wanship Reservoir. And now with acquisitions and easements and the walk-in access program, we've got in the neighborhood of 20 miles in that same reach. So it's been, public access has been growing like crazy um, and with that comes a legal responsibility to at least monitor the conservation easements to ensure that they maintain their conservation values. And that's just probably a third of these easements region wide. I use it as an example because uh, it's one of the more dramatic changes that we've seen. <clears throat> um, it's not a complicated thing. I'm just asking for a nine month seasonal employee and a little bit of current expense uh, for things like digital camera, uh, GPS, uh, just basic office supplies, and then probably some signage because we want to start uh, signing these things with, you know, signs that have uh, GIS maps on them to show people where they can be and where they're not supposed to be a little more readily. Uh, pretty easy ask. Uh, we used to do this annually, but a couple of years ago, I started splitting the fiscal years because the legal requirement for the easement monitoring is a calendar year. So I will split the year from July 1 until December 31st to do the calendar year 2021 easements. And then the uh, calendar year 2022 easements start January and go through June 30th. 
in that time, I've got nine months to get those done from a, a single seasonal employee. So I don't have to go through two hiring op, uh, operations. Most of okay, the sport so fish in our region, but we do have some easements up near our Middle Fork uh, wildlife management area that are big game winter range. Um, and then some in Cache Valley that are also big game. All right, any questions for Sarno on this one? Yeah, I'll go ahead. This is Bert Sarno. I just wanted to know how is this tech, I mean, with these easements and these landowners, I think long-term relationships are critical. And so this tech would be supporting the work of staffers that have these long-term relationships because you don't wanna have a new new person uh, working on these things um, directly with the landowners, I wouldn't think. Any thoughts? Well, it, it, thus far, it hasn't really mattered. It seems like our land ownership changes almost as fast as our seasonal personnel on the Weber anyway. We've had several landowners do turnovers. We're, in fact, there's one easement on section seven of the Weber that's on its third landowner since 2006. So it, we haven't been needing to develop these long-term relationships. The, the landowners that are, are there for the, the duration know what the easement's all about. Uh, they know this is more or less a formality if everybody's doing their job. It's more or less the new ones that gain a property with an easement already on it that we seem to have some potential for issue with with because they'll they'll decide that you know they want a new shed down by the down by the river but you know the easements don't allow for that sort of thing and we're just ensuring that that shed doesn't show up uh, for the most part the landowners have been really good uh, <clears throat> there's a couple of commercial entities down in the lower weber that tend to push the boundaries a little bit, but for the most part, we haven't had an issue with, with personnel turnover, more, more, more so with land over, landowner turnover. All right, thanks. Jordan, you're up, and then Ch Justin Shannon. Uh, are, do we have easements on Blue Ribbon Fisheries that you're monitoring? If so which ones? Yeah, the entire section of Weber, Weber Section 7 has Several. I, I seem to think there's nine in that in that reach. It, it might be a, a slightly different number. Uh, one of them got subdivided, so there it was a single landowner. Now there's three landowners in that, and I, even though it's one easement, it's it's three phone calls. So you know it it, it gets a little more complicated that way. Um, so there is a significant number of of blue ribbon reaches that we do have easements on. Or blue ribbon, a blue ribbon reach that we have significant numbers of easements on. Thanks, Sorna. All right, yep. thanks. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I just had a quick question. Do you see this as, as a one-year request or an ongoing request? Is this something we should anticipate year after year? Well, it's every other year uh, because I've split it's a fiscal year ask for two calendar year monitoring events. But yeah, you can probably expect to hear it every other year anyway. I was told to not bring it every year. So my brainstorm was to bring it every other year uh, since we've tried to secure a position for this, but it, it hasn't been deemed high enough priority to fund it permanently. Thanks, Justin. Paul? Yeah, if, if I recall, it's more of a comment, but if I recall correctly, these easements are, um, I mean, it's it's a legal requirement for us to monitor these easements uh, annually, isn't it? And then obviously the maintenance of all of the fence lines and everything on, on those small easements is, is really critical. It, it is a legal requirement or we could we could lose the easement. 
or the landowner could lose the tax advantage they garnered from it when they entered into the, the permanent easement aspect of it. Uh, and there is, there's, there's just more maintenance and the higher maintenance costs, it, it, you know, it, it used to be a couple hundred dollars to fix a fence and anymore it's, you pretty much have to go through purchasing. So there's, there's more time involved, there's more money involved. Um, there's more spotlights on these places too. We've got uh, fence crossings that are continually in need of repair. Fortunately, I've partnered with some angling groups that are wonderful at doing that. Uh, fencing is, is uh, weed control, for example, where, where it wasn't written into the easement. Some of the early easements have the division responsible for the weed control. Some of the later easements have the landowner responsible. So they're, they're all different and they all have to be uh, attended to with respect to how the baseline was originally drawn up. All right, any other questions on this one? Okay. All right, thanks Sorno. And I guess I would remind you that if you're, yeah, if you're asking for a, an FTE, that this this could approve funding, but you still need to ask for the FTE through the enhancement process. So as a reminder, so okay, all right, we're going to move on to the next project. Um, project fifty six seventy six Weber River Main Stem Reservoir Deep Water Habitat Augmentation Phase Two. That was a long sentence. Go ahead. Yeah, this is again uh, putting artificial structure in the uh, low dissolved oxygen content portion of the deep water parts of our main stem reservoirs, uh, primarily Rockport and Echo. We have, I believe, 122 structures currently in Rockport right now, um, and we would like to expand that to Echo. And the reason we just went with Weber main stem reservoirs is to give us the flexibility we need in case we can't do one or the other. Uh, it was a, a kind of a fear between uh, Cody Edwards, Chris Penny and the aquatic section and myself that, you know, we may be shut out of one or the other, or we may find a higher priority in one or the other based on the population structure of the perch. And it looks like this year with most of the big adult perch winking out of the echo system and being replaced with five and six inch fish, it might be a good idea to spend a, a higher proportion there than at Rockport. Uh, since we've already got some structures in Rockport, and we're at least theoretically seeing some uh, response to it with more multiple year classes instead of, of uh, just that one single year class. But in the interim, we found out that ECHO is gonna be basically closed to public access during their, their uh, reconstruction of the boat ramp area. We may have to put them mostly in, in Rockport again. Uh, we've, I've asked for a, a mix of Habitat Council and Blue Ribbon money because Rockport is still a considered a, a it was a Blue Ribbon potential. Uh, so just again, it, it, it might not end up being a big thing, but just to highlight that it was being thought about in the region, we, we put in for both, uh, both Habitat Council and Blue Ribbon money. Uh, most of this is just purchasing the artificial habitats and then again, just some, some ancillary consumables like anchors and ropes and wire ties and things like that. Uh, you got questions on addressing, I guess. All right, any questions? Uh, Bert and Justin and Paul still have your hands up. I don't know if you have actual questions, but okay. My apology. <laughs> Thanks. My favorite kind of questions. Yep. Okay. All right. 
I don't see any more questions on this one. So uh, thanks, Sorno. Appreciate that one. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, maybe you're on, on deck for this one too. Um, actually, we're gonna go to Salt Lake office request, um, 5582 FY22 stream restoration training. Who's got that one? You know, I don't see Don Wiley on here, but I'll, I'll take it real fast for him. This is a pretty straightforward project. Um, I think, you know, as we kind of listen to a lot of these projects today, you're hearing about a lot of stream restoration work that we were doing. And uh, unfortunately, or, you know, maybe how it is, you know, our biologists, when they come out of college, don't have the training to do this work, but it takes some, some specialized skills and, you know, doing this right really makes a big difference between project success and project failure. So. What we're doing is we're continuously training our biologists to uh, uh, be informed on, I guess, the, the latest skills and kind of what's going on in the trade so they can really effectively carry out a lot of this restoration work that they're doing. So really what this project is about is providing some funding so we can send our staff, so this is both aquatic section staff and habitat section staff, out to get trained in various stream restoration techniques. So. The main ones we send people to is Rosgate Stream Restoration kind of training classes. I think there's three or maybe four of those classes that people take before they're fully certified in that. We're increasingly using beavers in a lot of situations as a restoration tool. So we're basically putting beavers out and letting them do the work for us. Uh, but there's some training associated with that. Also, there's some wetland delineation training that our staff have been involved in. So I think this project requests $30,000, $15,000 from Blue Ribbon, $15,000 from Habitat Council. And again, this is just a send biologists out so they can continue getting training and doing this work. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Bert, you're up. Randy, I was curious. Um, I know part of the ask is for travel, but obviously things, times have changed. So how much of this training is going to be spent uh, uh, online nowadays? In other words, can the travel be dialed down and still train as many people? Unfortunately, I think there's a significant kind of in-person component to this work bird. A lot of it's going out in the field and seeing you know, actual restoration practices and kind of learning from degraded stream systems. Um, I think last year with COVID, I think we dialed back. I think some of the classes were, were, were canceled or postponed, but I, I think we're starting to see some of those come back online for this year. And there's really maybe even a backlog of people we need to get through these classes. But yeah, I think they unfortunately probably aren't well suited for a rural environment. No, that's good. Thank you. I appreciate seeing the project in the field, how it actually works. That's good. Randy, can you remind us what the cost per person is on this typically? You know, that I actually don't know, Eric, and it depends somewhat on the class. I think some of these classes are, you know, pretty quick, a couple day classes. Some of these are, you know, a week or two long kind of classes. Um, I don't know the cost, you know, I want to say between maybe 500 or $2,000 a person kind of depending on the class. I think it can be for the first two Osgan courses, generally 1500 to 2500 and then the third and fourth course are two week and those can be up around four or 5,000. Okay, thanks for that, that information. So, all right, any other questions on this? Okay, I don't see any hands, so, all right. Thanks, Randy. Um, okay, we have one left before we break for lunch. Um, we're at 11.58, so we're about right on time. Um, from Northeast Region, Project 5752, Strawberry River and Recurring Watershed Restoration Project Phase 1. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm Garn Virgil. I'm the Assistant Aquatic Manager in the Northeastern Region here in Bernal. And... Uh, <clears throat> Go with the Strawberry River project. So, what the primary purpose? There's a couple purposes to this project, I guess. The one of the primary purposes is to kind of address some of the issues we've seen with the uh, emergency watershed funding um, project that occurred last summer, and try to provide some funding so we can provide alternative uh, stream restoration methods than the traditional riprap um, stuff that we saw last summer where the river and the road uh, kind of conflict a little bit, I guess. And so um, 
we're going to try to provide have some more say, I guess, in in what what goes in. So, and then the other issue is with the fire and a lot of the disturbance over there. We were just anticipating. Well, we already know we have a bunch of thistle and uh, tamarisk over there. So there's another component of this project to, to do some uh, noxious weed control <clears throat> over there. And then uh, so. Um, Daniel, there's a, I uploaded a PDF that's kind of a, a, a JPEG map that kind of um, shows the whole project area, I guess, at one time. There's another, if it's a JPEG image, I guess, it, I'll, I'll need that PDF later. It is, a, it's just an image of a topo map, so it should be under images. Yeah. So, what I did was I, I highlight, so the red segment of the stream is basically the work that occurred last summer. And then the purple is, and the yellow is the, is the part that's gonna occur this year. And the purple is where there are going to still be some road river conflicts. Um, and then once you get to the yellow, the road kind of separates itself from the river and we don't anticipate any kind of issues there with the work that's going to occur. And even in this purple area, what the engineers are trying to do is to move the road up on the hill out of the river bottom where they can, but there are locations where that's just not going to be possible. And so there are going to be some river bends that still can have conflict with the road. <clears throat> and so uh, now I'll go ahead and click on that PDF. Or even maybe maybe do some of the photos first um, from last year's work. So this is kind of what we saw last year with the they built the road up and then basically removed the um, floodplain bench and filled it with a rock tow. And so there are you know anywhere where they they thought they needed to protect the road. This is kind of what we ended up with. And so we're trying to provide some alternatives to to this kind of work to that will not be you know be a little bit better for fish habitat and, and just even aesthetics as a whole what the river looks like. <clears throat> and in some of these places they've gone in and they've actually put dirt on top of this rock. It's questionable whether it's going to stay there with any kind of a high flow event since it's just loose dirt that they threw on there. So, all right, go ahead to that engineering design picture now, that PDF. So Jones in the Mill is also designing the Wasatch County portion of this project, which is, they're the, the entity that has the, the, the next phase of EWP money and they're, uh, so this is an example of a, of a design with two alternatives. So um, our preferred alternative would be to pull the river away from that bend and the road and use towwood structures to um, armor the bank. And, and the second alternative would be basically what we saw last summer if they don't move the, the river away from the road, then they'll have to heavily armor that bank and um, with rock and things like that. So well, basically what this money will be used for is to allow us to, to, to move the river because EWP money doesn't allow them to really do that. Um, they can do sediment cleaning and a few things like that, but this kind of work where we're to pull actually build a new channel and pull, pull the river away from the bank is, is not allowed on the EWP. So in a nutshell, I guess that's what we're trying to do, so. Thanks, Garn. Any questions for Garn on this? We're looking for hands. Okay, Rex. 
Sorry, I, we just hadn't got down to the ask yet, and I, I thank you for getting to that. I, I'm good. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Brian. Yeah, Brian Epstein's got a question. This is uh, labeled as a phase one. Uh, yeah. What, so what, what's, what's phase two or phase three? What are the future phases? So, um, so we're kind of, we really don't want to do work yet because, you know, in, in the, with these fires and what we've seen in other parts of the state, um, the, you know, it's better to wait and let things stabilize. And so, but with the EWP money, um, we're kind of forced to try to try to do something now with, with them. But uh, so down the road, um, there will be additional work that occurs to uh, fix what damage the fire caused, basically. And so it's possible the next round of work would occur somewhere around 2023. And, and part of that, uh, we anticipate that there could be some uh, mitigation money coming from the railroad project out here in the Una Basin. And this Strawberry River is an area that they are targeting for that. And so if that goes through and, and the mitigation comes from that, that's when we would start seeing additional proposals for the work on the Strawberry River would be down probably at the earliest would be 2023, we think. And that kind of fits in the time frame that we would like to see post fire, you know, five to six years of stabilization. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for Garn on this one? Okay, I think before we jump off this one, uh, you know, I just want to want to say, you know, it's the, these EWP projects are difficult on us at times. Sometimes we, we're not as aware of them as we as we could be or should be, I think. And but we, our staff are are very queued up to try to to not be surprised by them, as difficult as that can be. Um, but but it that sometimes is very challenging. And so um, it's good to see us working on, trying to work on these and, and make them come out better than they have in the past. So, okay, any other questions on this? Okay, seeing none, we're up against uh, our lunchtime break. Um, Michael looks like you're queued up. So um, I think what we'll do for Habitat Council, we'll plan to jump back on at 1 p.m. on this same stream. Uh, Randy, you have directions for uh, Blue Ribbon? Yeah, we'll jump back on at one o'clock as well, but we'll use that afternoon link that I sent earlier. I'll send a reminder email with that link, but that's the link we'll use. Perfect. Well, thank you, everybody. And again, Blue Ribbon Council members, we appreciate working with you on these projects um, and collaborating. And, and this is a great time that we can spend together. So uh, thank you again, and we'll look forward to more of these in the future. So. Um, Habitat Council, we'll see you uh, on this stream back at one and then Blue Ribbon on the other. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Habitat Council. <laughs> thank you. Michael, thank you. looks like we're up. Copy that. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, we're at one o'clock. We're gonna give folks about another 30 seconds to jump on and then we will start in. And there we go, we have Paul, okay. All right, um, Carmen or Michael, we're ready to, to start. You're good to go. Okay, all right, we're, we're gonna start up here again for Habitat Council. Um, our live stream and YouTube stream have started. And um, <clears throat> our first order of business um, for how we're gonna proceed today is we're going to uh, review and approve last time's agenda um, or our minutes from last time. And then we're gonna spend some time reviewing any projects uh, from the morning that uh, you all want to, want to review, council, that the council members wanna review uh, before we kind of do a group vote on those. Um, or if we need to do, to do a separate vote on any specific projects, we can do that. Um, and so that's that's how we'll proceed. Any questions? All right, very nice. Okay, we're, uh, Daniel, you want to throw on the minutes from last time? <clears throat> it's kind of flashing at me, so I don't know about you guys, but. Um, there you go. Oh, we went to the WRI database. Yeah, maybe scroll up to the projects. I guess it, um, Do you have any questions on the minutes for, from the last meeting? I don't see any questions. Um, would entertain a motion. Or Dwayne, did you put up your hand? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make the motion. Okay, we have a motion from Jack. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, thank Dwayne. you, Dwayne. Yep, we have a motion from Jack and a second from Dwayne. I'll approve, say aye. 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 If there are any opposed, you can say no and raise your hand. That way I can for sure capture that, so. All right, but the minutes are approved. Um, so moving forward, when we do voting uh, in this format, like we did last time, I'll just ask for a group, yes, um, and then ask for a no, and for you to raise your hand so that we can capture that if, if uh, we need to. So, um, <clears throat> so referring back to uh, the morning's projects, um, our, I guess I wanna kinda, you know, I'll, I'll group this by region of, of the discussion. And so looking at, my, at uh, the agenda, and I think Daniel, you pulled that up from this morning, right? Yeah, so in this first three, this first group of three projects, were there any questions about those we need to dis discuss? Okay. If there are no questions on that, then we'll just, we'll move down the list and um, ask for any questions or observations uh, on the central region group of projects. Um, one question that I that I had or, or thought about um, on the first one in that group, 5589 West Jordan, Big Bend Urban Fishery, you know, that, that waterfowl component, uh, I guess I'm just gonna ask 
look at I'm looking at Jack here, see if we're comfortable moving ahead. I think there was a 10% amount, and I think Allison was going to calculate up uh, what that actual dollar amount would be, 10% on that project. Um, Allison, do you have that? Yeah, it'd be $34,000. Yeah, I, I did. I was going to uh, actually raise that issue. It, it seems like, um, you know, this is a great project, but it's predominantly an urban fishery and the fact that, you know, some ducks may land on it. I'm, I'm not sure that it merits the 10% and that would be a, a very large portion of the waterfowl allocation. Any other additional yeah. discussion on that point? <clears throat> We want to have a separate motion for that one that might it be different than approving it in, in part of the group, I guess is what I'm asking. Oh, you'd like me to make a motion? Um, not, not at the moment, but when we make a motion on the whole group, if that one's going to be different than approving it, then we'll need to make a separate motion. Or could we just make a motion to change the allocation? We could do separately that. and then. And we could do that now. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jack. I think that, I mean, this is definitely a community fishery type project. I think there, you know, the waterfowl benefit may be, um, there may be a slight benefit. And I don't know if, if it would make sense to do like a, I mean, I don't want to split hairs, but like two, 2% 2 waterfowl um, and the rest go to sport fish. But I mean, I, I think it makes sense for it to go to sport fish a hundred percent, unless, unless you, unless there's a benefit to put a couple percent in there for waterfowl. Drew, what do you think? I don't. I don't have any issue with removing the waterfowl and and lumping it all into sport fish. Okay. So I'll make a motion to uh, move all the Habitat Council funding for this into uh, sport fish, hundred percent. Okay. Thank you, Paul. We have a motion to to change the funding allocation. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Okay, thanks, Jack. So we have a motion from Paul and a second from Jack on projects 5589 specifically, change the waterfowl allocation, allocation to zero and up the uh, aquatic fishery allocation. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, if there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed. So the motion carries on that one. So we have 5589 accounted for. Okay, in that central region block uh, from the morning, were there any other questions uh, on those projects? No, okay. Uh, the southern region block, um, there's three there, 5568. So, and 745 and 5765. Any questions on those that or discussion that we need to have? All right. Flipping my page over here, going to the Northern Region projects. There were four projects, uh, one of which there was the, the big Weaver River watershed restoration, which I think is a great way to. Move ahead on that. Any, any questions on those or discussion for Habitat Council on those projects? Uh, just a discussion point from me. I, I'll, I'm going to, maybe it's better to vote on 5566 and uh, 5520 separate since they're trial and limited projects. Um, I mean, they're the project managers are trial, trial and limited employees. And since I am a trial and limited employee, it would probably makes sense for me to abstain from those voting on those projects. Okay, I like that idea, Drew. You like that idea? Yes. Okay. Um, we could probably do that now, um, and probably do it collectively, if, unless there's specific questions about those two projects. Okay, there's not questions. So, do we have a motion? Yeah, I move to approve uh, the. 5566 and I believe 5676. Actually, it's 55, for for I think it's 5520 and 5566. Daniel, there you go. You Thank that? you. Okay. 5520 and 5566 for consideration for funding. Thank you, Drew. Do we have a second? 
I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Tyler. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, if there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none that, uh, that vote no, and we have one abstention. So thank you for doing that, Paul. So the motion carries for those two projects. So we will remove those from consideration on the rest of the voting because they're already passed. Okay. All right. So going to, there's two other projects that will be part of the larger group to vote on. Uh, Salt Lake Office for Stream Restoration Training, um, and then the Northeastern Region Strawberry River Repairing Watershed. Um, any questions on those projects before we do a, uh, a group vote on that? I, I just have a quick comment on uh, 5752, the Strawberry River. Um, I know how challenging that it is working with EWP. I, I just wonder if maybe we're, we're premature in putting money into um, on the ground work there. I, I know that, I mean, I know we're, we're, we've just filed or we've just uh, completed an RFP for, you know, broad landscape scale design up in that area. And um, I don't know, I guess maybe I'd go, I'd go either way, but I just wanted to open that discussion whether or not it's, it's a time to spend money on, on the groundwork or, or if we really should, if these specific areas are, you know, um, if the time is right now to do that. Okay, any other discussion on that point, Drew? That's a good question, Paul. Uh, I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. You know, we don't have a, a lot of snowpack up there this year. So I think the work can be done, whether it'll hold up or not is is debatable. So, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, I'm on the fence myself. Um, I think it's a good project and I think it's necessary. Timing, I'm, I'm unsure. Okay, any other discussion or thoughts? I mean, there's, we do have an option to table it. Um, I'm not sure what the, Allison, can you tell me what the, or maybe we can show on the database what the funding amount was that was on that again? Uh, so it's 40,000. I'm kind of curious to see the region's reaction to that. You know, the way that I understood this was it was an EWP project that was going to move forward regardless. And this was kind of our only chance to modify it. So I'd, I'd yeah, be interested they, to hear the region. The EWP project is complete in that area. And this would just be, you know, uh, altering some of the work they've done along along the really tight places through that through that area. But I I would be curious if we can get them on the get them online and just in their presentation I think they mentioned you know that that uh, the real work needs to be done in in I, I think another three to five years, and I wonder if if this is going to fall apart we shouldn't let it fall apart and then pick it up when it stabilizes. The EWP part of the, for Wasatch County is just getting started. The Duchesne County part is done. So our options, right. oh, go ahead, Paul. I was gonna say, and I think my understanding uh, is there's a, a component of this that goes, is, that is focused on um, invasive species management, which I think makes sense to continue funding um, I'm curious about the the WRI. Is that going to come through, or, or is it? Did it get ranked? Yeah, it was high region? ranked. It, I'm, okay. I'm I'm pretty interested in this discussion just because I think if this committee doesn't support it, then I don't know that we will either. Allison, I was just going to let you guys know it was a high rank number six in the region score of 142, but Tyler basically already mention that so that's all okay thank you Allison. appreciate that 
fee is on top of the budget stuff, and I love that. Um, any other discussion about that? Some good points from have been made. I, Eric, I don't want to nitpick on this one, but in this presentation, I struggled to see how 25% of this benefited big game, but that, that was just my take. I don't know if anyone else had that thought, but um, for what it's worth. Thanks, Justin. Um, if we don't move ahead and table it, like, like Tyler said, it, it, you know, how much of the rest of the project does it, does it kill? You know, it's a, it's a much bigger project than just Habitat Council. And so, Allison? Um, I was just going to say, I could contact Garn and have him jump back on, and we can talk about this a little bit more if you would like me to do that. That'd be helpful. Okay, I think give me a minute. Good. So let's do that. Let's let's kind of set this one aside for now and and let Allison get with Garn and let's move ahead maybe with the voting on the rest of the other projects. Um, we'll just kind of park this one in the parking lot until we can talk to Garn some more um, and maybe pick it up again when he can jump back on here in a few minutes or something. Does that sound all right? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think we need a motion just to change it on the schedule of when we approve it so um so what we'll, so what we'll do is we will uh now look to have a motion to uh, approve all of the rest of the morning's projects that were discussed and and presented that we haven't already voted on any discussion on that moving forward no? i'll make that motion that we tentatively approve all except for the strawberry river uh restoration work Okay, we have a motion from Drew. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Paul. All in favor say aye. 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 If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. I do have a, a comment and maybe a question. Okay. Not about the projects, just uh, you know, the Southeast region presented theirs, at least the ones on Forest Service, uh, you know, land in a really unique way this morning. I've, I've never seen that before. And I, I'm wondering why that isn't the case in all of the other regions, why we just saw it in the Southeast region. That's a good question, um, Daniel or Danny or Allison. Do you have any input on that? Kind of what the impetus was there? I mean, the only thing I would say on that is, you know, Nicole Nielsen has really pushed um, bringing a lot of people together um, and doing those kind of collaborative type projects. And this is just one on the Manti Lysau where there's definitely an upland component. And, you know, with the Swayze fire, they're starting to get into the stream restoration and it just made sense to, to collaborate a lot of those together. And they've been doing a lot of that in their region. And so, I think it's it's just personality driven is what really drives that. But we have encouraged them to do those larger watershed type projects. I thought it was really beneficial to see how it all ties together. You know, uh, in the past you see these things and they're fragmented, separate, and uh, you know you really don't get a get the you know complete picture where where this kind of you know really did a good job at describing a you know kind of a real geographic approach to to projects and and it, I don't know whether it's worth having a conversation with the Forest Service in the future, but you know that's that was really well done. I agree. Um, I think that, that uh, the Weaver River watershed one was well done, kind of as a as a watershed focus as well. Um, and so we need to continue to have this discussion as we move ahead in in you know future meetings as well. Um, as to if that's a benefit to the council and to how we're, we're, we're allocating and approving funds. Um, I think that it, in this, these cases, it's been a benefit. Uh, I do see that there could be times where um, that maybe we've lumped too much and, and, uh, and probably need to split things up a little bit more. And so, you know, it's not always going to be a consistent line in the sand as to where, when you lump and when you split. So, um, you know, let's just keep playing it by ear, and and then if we see that that some things need to be separated, then then we'll have to look to do that. Allison, 
Uh, just spoke with Garn. He is not at the office right now, but he'll be back in about 20 minutes. Okay, so maybe what we ought to do is, is we can move through our northern region projects and then maybe put um, put him back on at the end of that in like a, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. Does that sound okay, Allison and folks? Okay, we'll look to fit it in there. Perfect. Okay, so um, I will mention that the previous motion uh, was approved to um, uh, approve all of the rest of the morning's projects that we hadn't already voted on. And so that motion carried. Um, okay. Uh, any questions before we move into the next set of projects just for Habitat Council? All right. Um, thanks everybody for that voting and for getting that done. We'll look to talk to Garn here again shortly. Uh, in the meantime, Let's um, let's look to our northern region projects. We'll start with number fifty six seventy five community fishery habitat augmentation. Go ahead. Um, the uh, community fisheries in our region have uh, become wildly popular with our angling public. Um, everything from kids on bikes to retired folks that seem to have nothing better to do with their life than fish, kind of like me. But uh, the problem we've been having is sustaining these generally smaller fisheries with exceedingly high pressure, uh, although the pressure fluctuates uh, depending on how long ago the stocking truck had been there, um, with anything other than the stocked fish. Our goal with this is to provide a little bit of habitat in some of these areas so that we can have the wild fish at least fill in the blanks between stocking truck visits um, with the with the warm water component. And we're doing it kind of a kind of as a miniature of, of some of the main stem stuff that you heard about this morning on, you know. Echo and Rockport and previous projects on Pineview is just adding artificial habitat to these uh, ponds. And we probably don't need as much or as dense because they're so small, but we'd like to give the warm water wild fish component a chance to become a bigger proportion of the creel. Uh, to do that, we need to make sure that there's enough habitat elements in them to sustain them. Uh, they need support throughout all their life history stages, whether it's, uh, you know, spawning habitat, which hasn't thus far been limiting, but the nursery habitat and the juvenile habitat have been a little bit lacking and those fish just become prey for the surviving adults and then the stocked fish as well. So we'd like to get some habitat in particularly Andy Adams and Bountiful Pond is the ones that I was encouraged by the aquatic section to target initially anyway. Uh, Andy Adams fluctuates pretty bad, so it doesn't have a natural vegetation component that sustains itself. So we were gonna use artificials. And then uh, even though Bountiful Pond doesn't fluctuate that much, the only real vegetation that it seems to sustain is a, a perimeter population of cattails uh, because it's got a pretty heavy population of carp. So we can't seem to get natural vegetation to establish in there either. So we were gonna go with, again, the artificial habitat, create some, some places for the, the, the young of the year juveniles to, to try and make a living until they can escape the uh, predation of the adult fish just by sheer size. Um, it's not uh, <clears throat> it's not a complicated project. It's it's just putting some some of the commercially available habitat in places that are somewhat available to anglers, uh, whether they're on float tubes or kayaks or or pontoons and then some that will be available to shore anglers. Uh, it's uh, a purchase of structures and then just some 
additional consumable materials. Plus, uh, we were going to try and add some catfish nest boxes so that the, uh, the catfish can provide themselves with a, a little bit of self-sustaining kick in the pants there too. That's about all I got on that. Okay, um, Jack. Um, is it uh, at all a viable option in Bountiful Pond to rope known the pond and put in fish screens to try to keep the carp out? Uh, probably not because the fish screens would be, they'd have to be so wide in places. And then there's, there's the, the flow through the cattails along the perimeter too that's difficult to screen. I, I don't know as much about Bountiful Pond's uh, water uh, inflow outflow uh, dynamics, but it wasn't it wasn't something that the fisheries section brought up to me as something they'd like to try and undertake. I suppose it would be possible. I mean, anything is, but it would it would likely be far more costly than than uh, structures. Thanks. <clears throat> Any other questions? Drew. Drew, go ahead, Drew. Yeah, these uh, habitat improvements sort of uh, jive with some uh, stocking changes that several regions want to make in community fisheries and uh, some regulatory changes that are on the horizon. So I applaud this and, and it's it's really timely. Well, it's it's something that they've been trying to do in house, but have just become overwhelmed with it because they've got other duties and you know, that's where I see the support portion of the habitat section coming in and saying, well, throw, throw me that bone. I can, I can probably come up with enough time and expertise to figure it out. Okay. Any other questions? Allison, do you still have your hand up for a question? Maybe not. Okay. Do we have a motion on this one? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve it for funding consideration. Okay, we have a motion from Paul. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Drew. All in favor, say aye. 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 If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed. The motion carries. Thanks, Sorno. And I also appreciate your coordination with uh, Chris Penny and the aquatic staff um, and bringing this forward with them. All right. Okay, this, um, might, be, this might be the last time you have to listen to me today. No, oh, okay. <laughs> it's fine <laughs> this, either way. Yeah, this is the, the beaver trapping expense fund. It's, it's again, not a new one, but we have, mm -hmm. uh, garnered ourselves a, a good partner in USU. They do own the and and operate the uh, Beaver Motel up there, which is probably more scientifically known as the quarantine and holding facility. But it's uh, you know we we kind of joke about it in our in the region. It's it's the Beaver Motel. It's seventy five bucks a night per per beaver and. Uh, so, so Sorno, you you uh you moved on to fifty six ninety three then, and you, and that's the project you're specifically is it talking to now, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. I think. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it? everybody knows that we had moved to the to the next project. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, and um, we've been doing a good share of really good work, uh, creating a lot of riparian habitat in the region, but what we end up with is is just needing these places and the, to hold the beavers in quarantine to follow our own protocol and uh, and help trap the ones. You know, we've we've taken a big load of work off of Randall's shoulders in the landowner assistance program. He pretty much gets a call and punts it to me and 
we find a trapper to, to deal with it in a, a live trapping situation. And uh, it's, it's become quite a good project. I don't have the final numbers yet from last fiscal year because we still have a little bit of work left to do. Hopefully we can get another couple moved by June. Um, but the previous year we moved over 20. And of those, I believe we had at least six colonies reestablished out in the Grouse Creek system. Uh, this year we're looking at, at some other ones too. We had some uh, reestablished in uh, Three Mile Creek, a couple more in, uh, in uh, Cache Valley. And for the most part, it's, it's been a, a good program. We started it out with a kind of a little seed money to see if it would actually work with 5,000 bucks. And we spent that in just a couple of months. And so we've kind of, you know, decided that 20,000 generally covers most of our needs. And if it doesn't, we start making, you know, some of the, we do kind of a little triage and make some places that, uh, I don't know how best to put it, probably have, more money than cents start paying their own way. Uh, but for the most part, you know, the, the landowners that get the, the infrastructure protection by moving the, the colonies are, are pretty pleased. And we've, we're not burdening the wardens and the landowner assistance specialists with having to remove these animals lethally. Um, most of it just gets put in a contract and it goes to USU. They, they find it much easier to uh, disperse funds to the appropriate entities than, than I do. Um, the reason for the allocation being dispersed evenly is pretty much everything benefits from having new beaver dams uh, and new beaver complexes established. So waterfowl does, but most of these reestablishments thus far have been on private land, so I don't think we can burden most people with a share of that cost. Okay. Um, any questions on this project? Okay, I don't see any questions. Do we have a motion? Uh, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve it for a funding consideration. Okay, thank you, Paul. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it, Eric. Okay, we have a second uh, from Justin. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, none opposed. The motion carries. I do have a question that Sorno might help me with. Uh, this is part of a, a statewide beaver program. So is the funding of that equally patchwork quilt as, as you just you know applied for this money? Are they gonna apply for money for their beaver program, whatever that may be? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I guess it's possible. I haven't been in contact with too many who are also doing it. I know that some in the, uh, I don't know if it's Southern or Southeast region that were doing a bunch, it was funded through uh, or Utah State as a graduate project. So that had its independent funding, even though they took a lot of my beavers, which was you know more than I could afford to move anyway. So it was welcome. Um, and, then, and then Robbie, Agile has been, is probably going to propose something similar, I think. He's just getting started, but he's got some issues up in Park City, and there may be some opportunity there for um, municipal dollars and cost shares. That, so I don't know if he's, if he's going to try and fund it through Habitat Council or if he's going to seek some of the other avenues that really aren't open to me that much. But yeah, it's kind of patchwork. Everybody's doing their own thing. And, you know, even though it's a, it's a statewide critter with a statewide management plan, it seems to not, it, it's almost one of those one size fits none sort of situations where we have to adapt to the 
to the resources we have available to us in the northern region and I'm sure central regions doing the best to adapt to their circumstances as well as other places. And it's it's a very I've been doing it longer than most people so it, it some of it's more streamlined and, and less reinvention of the wheel for me. Um, but some of the things I do just absolutely won't probably won't work other places. Thanks for that. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how we kind of move ahead with, uh, you know, a lot of the, the beaver work that is occurring uh, in various parts of the state. And I think it, it's going to work some areas and maybe it doesn't work so well in other areas. Climate differences, uh, you know, lots of things, a lot, a lot, a lot of factors there. But um, okay, so that one's that one's approved. Um, I want to welcome our our project proponent for our next project on on the uh, end of the meeting with us today. Um, the next project is uh, 5711 Fair River Bottoms Riparian Restoration and, and Enhancement Phase 2. Um, I believe uh, Representative Snyder that you're going to be speaking to this one today. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, Casey's fine. I'll be doing this in my regular day job capacity. So, thank you, Casey. Um, yeah, I so just so you everybody's kind of aware and I'm kind of out in the field and, and kind of in and out of bad service, but um, you all were very generous to us uh, about a year or so ago uh, and funded phase one of the Bear River Bottoms Restoration Project. And if you remember at the time, we, we had a collective of our organization, Autobahn, uh, Pheasants Forever, Wasatch Wigeons, Forestry Fire and State Lands, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NRCS. Uh, looking at doing some riparian restoration work on the Bear River, sort of as an experimental process, um, we laid back a section of the of the river on the bank where it was washing out. We had documented over 19 feet over the last 10 years had been lost to erosion, and we laid it back and tried three different techniques that had been piloted in other parts of the river to see what would stick. Um, we did basically just some pole plantings, bare root plantings. We did uh, some sod mats that we purchased out of Rexburg, Idaho. Uh, and then we, we scraped some sod off site and tried to reestablish it and see what would work. Uh, you know, trying to find an alternative to rip rap or, or a, a Cash Valley favorite uh, 1950s Buicks just holding back the riverbank. Um, that project was successful. The, the method that we used that worked the best was this establishment of uh, sod mats purchased through native, uh, a native plant nursery up in Rexburg. And we have another, we're going to make another run at this um, to basically see if what works there will can be replicated further down. Uh, it, we've got another site that's about a half mile uh, s south of the prior project, and we're just trying to, to, to do it again. Um, an additional phase of this is We've been doing some uh, tamarisk and Russian olive removal on the property. Um, we've got about 500 acres there that we manage uh, under conservation easement. That's uh, we've enlisted last year in the walk-in access program. So everything we do is accessible for the public to view. Hopefully it's improving opportunities by removing some invasives. Um, and then this, and then again, this project hopefully will be something that we can adopt with document excuse me and duplicate to show in other parts of the river so that's that's what i got thanks guys thanks casey uh casey while you've been talking uh daniel eddington has been running our, our database kind of showing a, a map view of your project and, and the information here um looks like on the funding side uh can you give us the habitat council amount there I, I can't see it right in front of me, and I apologize. I'm I'm actually out in the field at the moment. Um, the the record I, I I can't see it. I that that's okay. Um, uh, our our database uh, person, so Daniel has pulled that information up, and so we're viewing that now. It looks like it's a uh, eleven thousand dollars from Habitat Council uh, attributed to Upland Game uh, side of the account. Um, so that's that's good to see. Uh, any questions on this project for Casey?
Okay, I don't see any questions. Um, I don't know, Paul, did you have one? No, I was gonna make a motion. Okay, so yeah, at this point we'll entertain a motion. If you'd like. Uh, I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. Thanks, we'll make a motion. Okay, we have a second from Jack, is that correct? Yes. Okay, we'll take that one. We had, we had a couple going there, so. We have a motion from Paul and a second from, from Jack. All in favor say yes. 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 If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed, so the motion carries. Thank you, Casey, for joining us. Well, thanks, guys. Appreciate all you do very much. All right. Thank you and take care. Okay. Um, uh, we'll go with uh, our next project on the agenda, which is 5718. Then after that, uh, Garn has joined us again, it looks like, and um, we'll look to revisit that project. Or maybe he dropped off. I know he had joined us. But okay, we'll, we'll wait to see if he jumps back on again. So let's go with uh, project 5718 South Fork Junction Creek Fish Passage Project, project Phase 2. Go ahead. Yeah, so this is um, this is a project I've got going out in uh, South Fork Junction Creek out in uh, headwaters of the Raft River. Chance, can you uh, yeah, give us a, a quick introduction of who you are and what region? And yeah. Yeah, most certainly. Uh, my name is Chance Broderis. I'm the native aquatics biologist in the northern region. Um, primarily working with the, the fish side of things. Um, this project that I'll be talking about will mostly be benefiting the uh, bluehead sucker, um, which in our region has actually been, been deemed to be a little bit different than the bluehead in the rest of the state. Um, they'll likely be turned into their own species here um, in the next few years. And I think we're going to be calling them the green sucker. But this, this, this project was started all the way back in 2017 when I did a, a barrier assessment on the, on the, the headwaters streams of the, of the Raft River from the Idaho state line all the way up here into South Fork Junction Creek. And we found um, a nice clump of barriers uh, in the middle of South Fork Junction Creek that's kind of separating a healthy bluehead population to a uh, chunk of the stream that does not have blueheads. So this is, if we can, um, uh, the dot on the map shows shows where this, this barrier is, but if we can pull up the, um, I have a, a map in the images under documents that will show what I'd ultimately plan to do. Um, so as far as uh, re replacing everything, it will probably take about th three phases to get that done. We're currently in the engineering phase, so um, that's what phase one was for this project. Um, and then this one will be removal and replacement of that green dot there, which is a uh, semi-complicated diversion that feeds multiple ditches. So we're trying to figure out how to screen it and then send the water two ways after the screen to avoid having to screen two ditches. Um, but the engineer assures me he's got he's got ideas and we've got a semi whole budget ready to ready to go. Um, I believe I asked for um, 25,000 from Habitat Council. I've also asked for 25 from WRI and ESMF. And I currently have 50,000 from Fish and Wildlife Service ready to go. Um, um, yeah, the I mean the everything else we've we've kind of 
we partnered with TU and BLM to do the initial barrier assessment um, out here. And for the most part, these, these barriers are all on one landowner's land. Um, and he has taken some he has taken some prodding to get him to to join the program, but I, I'm fairly certain he's on with us now, and he's going to let us let us help make make some of these old dilapidated structures um, fish passable again, which will in um, the overall goal for this will be to to give Blueheads run of the river all the way up to Lynn Reservoir. Um, they used to be in this upper section that we're trying to open back up and then a few a few bad water years killed them off and these diversions are stopping them from recolonating that area so i think that's all okay. that's most of what i can say about the project i guess um any questions for chance on this project Okay. Um, so it looks like you have some ESMF funding, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, WRI funding, and then our Habitat Council portion is twenty five thousand. So yeah, okay. and 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 I guess that we're we have the fifty k from Fish and Wildlife Service, and we're just trying to make up. The, the next 75k between um, the various funders. So, okay. Um, with this Habitat Council being kind of you know the sport fish side of of funding, um, you know, I guess can you speak any more to you know the sport fish benefits there? Um, well. We it, it is a it is a stronghold for the um, um, Yellowstone cutthroat. Um, all all of these structures will give give more habitat to to Yellowstone cutthroat as well. Um, and part of the ultimate goal of removing these barriers um, will include a um, a road known treatment to remove brown trout from the lower section um, and allow uh, native Yellowstone cutthroat back in, um, which will put Yellowstone cutthroat back on some public land down there um, in, in, in the lower section of this. So hopefully opening more opportunities for anglers to be able to go out there and get their, get their cut slam done on the Yellowstone and what is, it's it's hard to find a good stream to catch your Yellowstone up there. Okay, uh, Paul's got a question. Yeah, if, if I recall correctly, the, um, the headwaters of uh, South Junction here is, is Basin Creek, right? And that's yep. probably one of, the, one of the strongest Yellowstone cutthroat populations that we have out there. Um, is, that, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that would be yeah, Basin Creek, which is which is another tributary of the South Fork Junction Creek. I currently got a project on there that I'm removing a, um, a barrier to give give the Yellowstones and the Blueheads a, a little more room to breathe within Basin Creek. Um, unfortunately, over that is likely a, a barrier from keeping both Basin and South Fork Junction from connecting. Um, that will be a, a much larger project than we can handle with with this list of barriers that I'm planning. Thanks, Chance. Um, mm -hmm. Any other questions on this project? Okay, we have a motion. I move to approve. This is Drew. Okay, thank you, Drew. We have a motion to to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second. This okay, is Paul. Second from Paul Dumet. All in favor, say aye. 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 Do we any opposed? Say no and raise your hand. 
Okay. No, no, so the motion carries. Okay, thanks, Chance. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I'm just writing a couple notes here. Okay. Um, all right, then. Uh, see, is Garn back on with us? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Garn, for, for jumping back in. So, um, we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to let's we're going to just have some more discussion about your strawberry river project and the watershed restoration and so um we had some questions about about the timing on this as to um you know is now the right time to try to deal with an ewp project um versus maybe waiting a little bit. So we kind of had some discussion started and I'll let anybody else weigh in uh, if they want um, to really present the question to Garn here. Yeah, I, I will Garn. Uh, the question is, you know, in your presentation, you identified a year, you know, or a time period three to five years out before you felt that the Strawberry River was gonna be stabilized enough to do any, any real work. And, and then after you hung up, you know, we look, started looking at this project and, and it doesn't fall within that timeline and wanted to make sure that the timing is right for this. Well, I, I think the reason we still have to move forward is they're going to go in and do work regardless of whether or not we chip in money. So the question is, do we want work like what we saw last summer or do we want to try to improve on what they're doing? And if we contribute, then we can hopefully alter the course of what we saw last summer and get a better product. So um, it, if they move ahead, I guess, and, and, and without our money and, and do work, I guess we would still at some point, I guess, be back in trying to do what we proposed. Um, but it, it's hard to say how much we stabilized because last year we didn't get any rain to produce any events. So, you know, we had uh, the seeding that occurred after the fire and then we had a good wet spring and, and good germination on, on all that stuff the first, first year. And then last year we didn't get any rain to kind of you know, get to assess how stable things really might be. So at this point, it's hard to know exactly, but the, the work that they're going to do is going to happen regardless. Um, and this just provides us an opportunity to hopefully do a little better job, you know, now. And it's really primarily going to be a couple river bends and I think there will be some channel realignment here and there. Um, and so, yeah, with our money, we can, we can do a little nicer channel realignment and, and do a little better job on those bends. And so I, I think that's why it's important. Hey, hey Garnett, quick question for me. Um, I was curious if, um, like, we've had some discussions with the engineers up there, and they've talked about potentially moving the road up out of the river valley uh, in some of those really sensitive areas. Does does this funding enable that, or is this um, does that not modify the road alignment? It does not. It, it should not impact the road alignment at all. This is to address the areas where they can't put the pull the road up on the hill. So there are, they're, they're going to do that where they can, but there are areas where it's just not possible to do that. And so this money is going to address those areas where they can't um, pull the river away from the road or the road away from the river. So. <clears throat> Any other questions for Garn on this? Uh, I think it's been a good discussion and uh, those are some good points. Uh, I, I agree that the, you know, EWP funding, I think Brian had mentioned that it expires in November. Um, and so they're, they're going to do what they're going to do. And 
just possibly, you know, money speaks in, in this world of, of working with EWP. So, Brian? I just add a couple more points real quick. Um, to me, this really boils down to uh, getting our foot in the door for one. Um, by coming forth with a proposal, we've been immediately more invited into the uh, entire discussion. Uh, we've had much more say on every engineering plan phase by just having a proposal written and drafted. Uh, so, and at the same time, uh, we're using some of that EWP as match. If you go on the finance page, you, some of that is 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 uh, for other parts of the project, obviously, but some of that is like direct match where EWP is paying for the engineering funds for the project, but which we're not paying really anything for that. We're just paying for project construction on minor parts where we're getting exactly what we want, which is moving the stream away from that road. Then that, that does beg the other question though, if it's cheaper to address them now or just fix anything that we don't like later on. Um, and there's definitely going to be substantial reaches, especially on the Duchesne side, which is done, that we will be spending a lot more money on them at a later date in three years, four years, whatever it takes, till we're comfortable with it uh, to fix it. But in these, I think there's about four areas. We, we really did feel like we could be more proactive now than later. So that definitely goes without saying at a later date, we will be submitting more comprehensive proposals. Uh, but for now, this is just a limited scout project to try and minimize some of that conflict, as well as just get our foot in the door and having a, a more substantial say in the whole process. So Brian, what you're essentially saying that is that uh, a lot of us complain about what happens on EWP projects and when they give us a chance to participate them if we turn them down then they kind of throw their hands in the air and say well we gave you a chance well uh, we were very between garn this garn especially myself and then our uh, front unlimited biologist mike fiorelli we were very vocal through the whole duchene river process but um how to politically say this correctly we we were very involved but we were kind of ignored through most of that process. A part of it was that we did not have funding to bring to the table. Uh, another part was, uh, I'll compliment Wasatch County that they've been much more open to hearing our concerns and our uh, involvement than perhaps Duchesne County was. Duchesne County had a much more uh, political bulldog mentality going into this than Wasatch County side did. So there's some some of each side there what i do <laughs> i don't have hair to make no. a hair do you Drew? i got i just barely got more than you do <laughs> that's kind of what i'm saying i i just want to make sure and the reason that this conversation came up is i want to just make sure that the work that you're proposing is going to hold up uh, i i think you like you right brian in the next five or so years is going to be you know, fixing a lot of what they've been putting in. And and I wonder if there's not a just a bigger project that we may see in the future. And just wanted to make sure that what you're proposing shouldn't be lumped in with that other stuff. Well, I, I agree with that view too. I, I do have my own reservations about doing this project in the first place, right on key with that. With I I would not I would put a disclaimer on this project saying if we get a catastrophic flood, there will be repairs needed to whatever we do, much more so now than any project that we would do five years from now. But to us, this was a, a good opportunity to also take advantage because there, there will be, like, like we're not going to be paying mobilization costs. Um, that's all on the EWP. A fair amount of the riprap mining um, is going towards the EWP side not our own expense our, our own expense is kind of more on the digging new channel and then keying in things like tow and structures side of the whole project and at the same time they're using if we get this funding pot they'll be using this as match for ewp where so one thing that happened on the duchene county side was 
they got credit for every rock they placed in that riprap. Uh, that, that is how the county was able to fulfill their match. They did not do anything cash in hand. They used uh, rock on site as their match. So with us coming with some money to the table, that means there is, is that bad to say that we're, we're, we're kind of putting water, water on the devil here a little bit and saying, you don't need quite as much riprap here in match if we come with money to the table. And and Wasatch County is not putting any cash toward this either. It's going to be the same thing. It's materials, so they're gonna they're gonna be looking to use as much rock as they can. So, to so more than just <clapping> just riparian improvement and bank stabilization, you're seeing that it, it's creating a better relationship, and there are lots of other more non tangible benefits moving forward on this at this point in time than 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 waiting. That's a good Correct. And, and I think in a prior meeting, Drew even alluded to the possibility of training some of these state contractors. And th this could be a prelude to that in a degree where um, it's difficult for, for us to get modern engineers and, and what do you call it, civil engineers that don't have ec ecological or hydrological backgrounds. It's, it's really difficult to get them to accept more temperated or more what do you want to call it more uh, forward thinking designs that are favorable towards fish habitat like things like towwood structure they've never seen them in person they've never built them that what they know is trapezoidal channels and rock and so by getting i guess several of the high profile engineers exposed to a little bit more proactive habitat measures it is a good thing for us to to have that uh, take place as well. All right. Um, well, thank you, Brian and Garn. Do we feel like we have enough information to proceed with the motion at this point on this project? I think so. Okay. I think we'll be open to that now. I'll I'll make a motion. Yeah, I, you know, the and it goes to the relationship side of things. You know, there is a possibility where you know, the entire project can benefit by this investment of money. And I think that that's, that's important. That's probably the most important aspect of this project. So knowing that, I, I, I move to approve. Okay, we have a motion from Drew. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Tyler. I just want to add approve. to that, just before we do a vote. Um, I think I've heard enough from Brian as well. And Garn, you know, I, I believe that that building that relationship all across the state with these EWP projects. And that's the first time I've ever heard that rock used as match thing. To me, that that really clears up a lot of questions I've had about how these EWP projects proceed in the first place. So, yeah, we've seen it for years and years that coming with funding to these projects really gains us access. So I think we'll support this from the WRI perspective as well. That's great to hear. So we'll take a vote on this. All in favor, say yes. 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 All right. If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay. There are none opposed. The motion carries. Uh, Garn and Brian, thank you for coming back on and uh, okay. talking to us a bit more and clearing some things up. And I think it's a good a good way forward as well. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Whatever we can do to to get our foot in the door on EWP is a is a big step forward for us. I think. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we're now going to move to uh, southeast region projects. Uh, start with 5525 Mill Creek Watershed Restoration Partnership. Go ahead. Hey, everybody. It's Nicole Nelson from the southeastern region Good. again. We know um, you. I don't know. Should I should I give you a kind of more of a description of me? <laughs> no. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So this is the, the Mill Creek Watershed Restoration Partnership Phase 2 project. So last year we brought this project. Um, kind of what we had is a few different partners working in different areas along Mill Creek. So we, we got together and kind of decided who all was working and what they were doing. We decided this could make a really good, you know, partnership collaborative project. So we have partners like the BLM, Forest Service, nonprofits like Rim to Rim Restoration. We're working with Forestry Fire State Lands. So we we kind of have a, a core group. I think in the partner section, we identify 
other other nonprofits, but that's been kind of the core group of us working together on this project. So what you see down here in the town of Moab is a lot of tamarisk and olive removal. Um, a lot of that will will reduce fire risk in town. I, I can't remember what was that two years ago. There was a pretty big fire along one of the the drainages that had a lot of tamarisk and olive burned up some some infrastructure. So doing that work, you know, that's where we've kind of brought forestry fire in. But it also is improving, you know, bird habitat along there. And then it moves up into the, the BLM and on a forest service. And so up there we kind of see an improvement for, you know, turkeys and you know other species that you could find in riparian areas. And then as you move up onto the Forest Service lands, um, Daniel, will you turn on the adjacent projects? So we've done other work in this area. And so these, these kind of stringers that you see on the Forest Service lands are kind of finishing up some other, other projects that we've worked on. I think the Forest Service was calling those the West Slope Wooey projects, but it was a lot of pinion juniper mastication. Those are the areas where we couldn't work with equipment. So what we're doing is going back in and treating the, the pinion and juniper in those areas and cutting and piling, and then the Forest Service will go back and, and pile in those areas. So, um, you know, this was our number three ranked WRI project in the region. Um, it does. I, I've chatted with some of the local sportsman groups about these projects. The, the local Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, they were quite interested in this one, you know, especially those cleaning up those drainages that were left. They were really like the other projects that, was, that surrounded it. So finishing that up, they really liked that. Um, on the on the LaSalle unit, you know, 34 fawns per hundred does. And last year it was 53 fawns per hundred does. So doing, you know, improvements for for game, especially up in the upper drainages, is really going to help help those herds. Um, we're we're just right around 20% of objective for deer, so this this project really could be, you know, a benefit to to big game. And then as you move down the drainage, you can, you know, we're having a lot of benefits to you know birds and amphibians. And so yeah, this is some of the. I, I don't think we have very many pictures on this one, but. A lot of the erosion control that that we've done in in Mill Creek, they're using some of what they call the you know that was developed by um, Z Dyke. They're they're working to to kind of the the erosion that's coming into the creek kind of work on keeping that from eroding as much. And so yeah, it's been a really good collaborative project and really kind of exciting one in the region. And that's that's on the LaSalle's. Great, thanks, Nicole. Are any questions on this project? Okay. Um, do we have a motion then? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. This is a great partnership, great project. I'll second it. Okay, thanks, Paul. We have a motion from Paul and a second from Dwayne. Um, all in favor say yes. 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 If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Great. None are opposed. Uh, the motion carries. All Thanks, right. everybody, for your time. Thanks, Nicole. Good job. Okay. Next project uh, 5570 Helper River Revitalization Phase 6 Implementation. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, this is Eric McCulley again with River Restoration. I'm going to talk today about the Price River through Helper. As you can see on the map, this is directly adjacent to Gelati Pond, um, and it's the upstream most um, diversion in Helper City. Um, there we go. So right, right beside Gelati Pond. And if you've ever been in the parking lot at Gelati Pond, you can look through the, look through the fence and, and see this massive um, obsolete irrigation structure. So we're working on uh, trying to take that out. You can see it looks like a little waterfall there. Um, so 
Daniel, if you could go to the project and then um, I, I put a presentation that I gave recently in here in the documents that, that summarizes everything. Um, scroll down, um, it's the, the Price River Passage. And I'm just gonna run through this real quick because I think it's gonna be the easiest way to, to capture everything. Um, a, a big focus of, of this presentation was bluehead sucker, but there's also Colorado River cutthroat and um, other fish in, in the river. And I can show you that. So let's go to the next, um, the next panel here. Bunch of different partners. Helper City has been running this basically since 2013. Um, you know, Trout Unlimited, the DNR, Office of Outdoor Recreation, um, Partners for Fish and Wildlife, Carbon County, uh, National Park Service, lots of different partners. Um, and it's been really great over the years to, um, to work with all these folks. So let's go to the next. Um, I think folks are aware of where Helper is. Um, maybe you, you just drive by there on your way further south, but hopefully you've had a chance to stop by the river. And there's actually a beach right in town, and um, it's getting to be a, a nice little town, and, and it's, you know, outside of the city, but close enough um, to get to. So let's go to the next down here. And um, I, don't, I won't explain too much about the watershed, but, um, you know, Schofield Reservoir is in the upper watershed. And through Helper, there were six of these fish passage barriers. And now there's one left, um, and that's what we're trying to take out. There's an additional barrier just upstream under the rail line that is um, at least a partial fish barrier. And then above that, it's 24 miles up to um, Schofield. And so the overall six phases is opening up about two and a half miles of the river through Helper. Um, so next, let's go to the next one here. Um, this is just a a list of uh, game fish and, um, and non-game fish, uh, native fish that have been found in the area and bluehead sucker as well um, in the Price River watershed. So let's go to the next one. Um, and I don't need to talk too much about the opportunities and constraints. I, I will say that we're, you know, this is a big, this can be a big river at times. Um, we had a two inch rainstorm upstream in 15 minutes. And we think it went from 50 or 90 CFS up to possibly eight or 9,000 CFS in an hour. And so um, sometimes we need to use some rock, <laughs> and, uh, but we try to make it as uh, natural as possible. Um, so go ahead and to the next one. Um, and, and we can go to the next one. I just want to show you a couple of the projects that we've done in the past. Um, you can go to the next. So the map of the project, so phase four was the SACO diversion uh, downstream. Phase one was the pilot project, which is the beach. Phase two, Janet. And uh, phase three, North Main, where we, um, there's some rock steps there. Phase five was recently com completed, uh, Martin Road. And phase six is the one up at the top. So let's go to the next. So this is the pilot project. Um, right behind the balanced rock. And I know so, a lot of folks have been on field trips there. The public really loves this. And there's actually a bunch of fish in these. Um, a friend of mine actually bought that house to the left and he said he fishes out here all the time. And there's some, he's got a lot of big fish stories to tell. But um, <laughs> so there are Colorado River cutthroat that have been planted there that are, that are thriving as well as the native fish. So let's go to the next one. Um, so phase two, uh, Janet Street was a, a series of um, rail lines spiked vertically. You can see one in the, in the um, picture there. And then to the right, you can see there's some um, drops now. They're rock drops because of so much water coming through here, but uh, it's reconnected. People can come down and fish can go up. So let's go to the next one. Phase three, again, a bunch of rail lines. It's a railroad town. What are you going to do? But just use what you've got. And we opened up the river to fish and uh, recreation at phase three, North Main. Let's go to the next. I'll be through this pretty quick. Phase four is an active diversion. 
with the Sacco family down there. Um, and we took about a, it's about a six foot drop. And on the right, you can see there's a series of rock grade structures, uh, but the river's a lot more naturalized there instead of a bunch of um, concrete Jersey rails. So on to the next. And we just finished phase five. You can see um, there's a drop to the left and then it's actually backwatered to the right. And uh, next slide. Um, there's a, this is actually a video. Some of the neighbors downstream were watching. And as soon as we pulled the equipment out of the river, they were boating down, um, but you can't click on the video because this is a PDF. So um, I'll send anyone the video if you want to take a look at it. And so on to now what we're proposing for phase six. It, this is the phase six. Um, it's about 12 feet of vertical drop, um, 60 to 100 feet wide, and it's an obsolete irrigation structure. And we're proposing to make it a series of, of rock drops, um, again, because of the high uh, velocities and shear through here. Um, you've got to use rock, but we're going to also naturalize the area. So next. Um, this is just the existing velocities, which you can see is it's a velocity barrier, you know, 15 feet per second. Um, and you can see right in the middle of the picture is where the existing diversion is. And this is over a series of flows. So go to the next one. We, we've been evaluating a couple different alternatives. Um, this is one that had 13 drops um, and then go to the next one. Um, with some of the fish experts, we've been, um, we kind of determined that a series of four rock ramps with pools in between would work for fish passage and then they'd have resting areas in between. So that's the proposed action. And so let's go down to the next. Um, in November of 2019, um, Division of Wildlife Resources went in and, and you know, did a fish study. They found Colorado River cut, um, tiger trout, mountain, and bluehead sucker, dace, and sculpin through this reach, and, and that's right at the beach. So um, go to the next one. So the community has really gathered around this, um, and, and it's provided a lot of you know angling opportunities and recreation opportunities um, right in rural Utah. And uh, we can go ahead and close this down. So, so that's kind of the rundown of what we've done in the past. And this is the last big project. Uh, we waited uh, till the end for, for the last. So if you look at the, um, the budget, it, it's a big project. And we're working on pulling together as many different grants as we can to get this done. The, um, We've got some unfunded balance here, and it may stretch into uh, two years, um, depending upon if we can fill that. But the the request for Habitat Council is, um, I believe, it's one hundred and forty five thousand uh, for the in channel work. And um, I guess I can take any questions if anyone has any questions. It's it's mostly sport fish and and some non game fish. This bluehead sucker, and then Colorado River cutthroat. Eventually, Colorado Pike Minnow might be able to swim up here once there's a couple more diversions taken out downstream. So thank you for your time, and I'll take any questions. Yeah, any questions for Eric or proponents? I just have a quick comment that this is a, this is a really cool um, result of several years of investment in this river and it's uh in incredible to see how how the help how the price river has changed over time in through helper um just a really really cool project and and maybe it's a, a focused area we can take off the list someday soon <laughs> all right all right thank you thanks any other questions uh, I think it's great. It's a great way you, you to use a, a section of, of of river and stream as a community fishery. 
uh, without having to build a separate pond and, uh, you know, enhancing the, the existing, uh, you know, reach that's there. So um, I think it's good. Do we have a motion on this project? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll second it if you make it. All right, sounds good. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding okay. consideration. We have a motion from Paul and a second from Justin. All right, all in favor, say yes. 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 Is there any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are no opposed, so motion carries. Thanks, Eric. Okay, uh, 5769, Snow Lake Angler Access and Restoration. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, I have a PowerPoint on my end. Do you guys want me to share it from this side? Um, I think we're okay to do that, Daniel. Okay, Daniel's unshared, so go ahead, Chris. How's that looking, guys? Oh, it just came up, so I think we're we're good. Perfect. Uh, thank you guys very much. My name is Chris Nichols. I'm the Natural Resource Specialist here in Farron, Utah with the Manti LaSalle National Forest. Um, primarily on my end, it's uh, of the recreation side, so everything under the sun that people love to do, I got my hands in it one way or the other. Um, so we're looking to do some work up at Snow Lake. Uh, so basically where it falls, it falls right in the middle of Sky, well, not the middle, but it falls on a remote section of Skyline Drive. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of an uptick in uh, usage uh, outside of the you know, obvious COVID bump, but uh, in recent years, there's been some significant improvements to uh, Lake Hill, the road going up uh, Ephraim Canyon and Manti Canyon. And we're starting to see this lake uh, getting more and more use from the public. The problem with this site is its location. Um, it's it, this is a basically this is a it's, this road that exists is not currently on our system, and we're we've changed changing that. And what we're looking to do is basically construct a quarter to half a mile of road access with a gravel lift construct an 80 by 80 parking lot. And between the two, we're looking at roughly 774 tons of gravel. And then on the other side of it, you know, we want to make sure that uh, all the other approaches that's been taken this lake, and you can kind of see it in the map there, um, that we, we uh, rehab those disturbed areas and put them to bed. And basically just like any other road in, in Utah, it gets a little wet native surface with no gravel, you can imagine. Uh, kind of some of the issues that people have trying to get in and out. So as you can see on the map, uh, we're going to put parking barriers around the new parking lot, along with a gate to uh, allow DWR have access to stock the lake. Um, and then, of course, all those disturbed areas, we're looking to do uh, parking and seating and hopefully get those areas restored. Uh, ideally, I'm looking to do this like in October. Uh, that's usually for this type of work what I like to, to channel my rec crew into because we like to get this work done. We like to get the snow on it and then let the snow work on it over the winter. Uh, around the shoreline, we are gonna leave some of this partially disturbed areas intact for uh, a path. That way it has better access around the lake. Uh, no sense of walking through parking and seeding when you're uh, and disturbing all that seed when, when you're just trying to get to fish, getting there, there to fish, I apologize. So the purpose and need, a pretty straightforward uh, uh, project. I mean, you can see we have quite a bit of connectivity between these disturbed areas in the lake. I mean, ultimately we're looking to have the uh, road in a, in a good location where we have a good buffer for filter between the lake and the, and the road to kind of prevent any sediment loading in the lake with the ultimate goal of, you know, rehabbing and protecting the resource source and ultimately, you know, enhancing the visitor experience as well. And you can kind of see, I blew it up uh, where this route is. 
So you can see at the very top of Skyline Drive, we're looking to use that existing alignment. And uh, like I said, it's not currently on our road system. And we're looking to, to we are at, basically are adding it and wanting to put a gravel lift on it. So that way you have a sustainable access, don't have to worry about running it up or, or just creating mud holes. And you can see kind of along the area, just all the different routes that have been previously used to try to get down to this body of water. On the budget side of it, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Our biggest ex expense uh, naturally is the gravel side. Uh, being where it is on Skyline Drive, it's a little bit harder to, to get to. And that 23000 is basically estimating about $30 a ton for the 774 um, tons of material. The, some of the other stuff that we're going to, that we're seeking is, of course, seed, just because, you know, if, if you saw from that original map, we have quite a bit going on, you know, different approaches from the north and the, and the west that we want to seed and, and hopefully get regenerated within a few years. The only other cost that we have on here um, is for uh, funding for, for my crew. Basically, the time of year that I'm looking to do this is October. By that time, I've usually uh, had to lay off a lot of our recreation crew due to, you know, budgetary concerns, lack of work. But uh, this time of year, this is the October time is where we're really looking to, to accomplish that work. So I'm hoping to be able to retain some of those folks because we do have a full plate this year. And, um, and, and I don't really feel like bringing people on later in the year to be able to reach October. So I'd rather just kind of keep them funded, keep them on, and then get this knocked out before the snow flies. Um, a lot of the match you'll see here. And, and to be honest with you, some of this match is on the low side. Uh, you know, a lot of engineering, uh, our engineering departments, you know, gonna have the dozers going, swampers, uh, graders, dump trucks, I mean, you name it, they're going to be running up and down the mountain. And then on our side, uh, we'll have our trail dozer doing the pocking and, of course, our crews will be seeding and building the log and block barriers, which is all done by hand and take the minimum of, of, of four of us. We usually like to have five so we can have a, another person to kind of rotate out and, and prep site ahead of us. So what we're looking for from the Habitat Council is uh, tw 29 through the Habitat Council. And our in kind that I uh, put together on the fly was 11,000, but to be honest with you, I do expect that cost to be a, a little bit higher on the in kind match. Just to give a quick little uh, rundown, uh, basically, you know, this is kind of a push that the forest has been making recently on improving angler access. and experience in protecting the resources in that way. And this is just some of the some of the areas in which we've been focusing on. And of course, moving on the future, you know, there's been, I've been talking with uh, Calvin um, Black out of the Price DWR. We've been, we're looking at Potter's Pond, you know, Emerald Lake, some of these other uh, beaver dams and other spots where we are also seeing, you know, some need for some improvements in the future. So right now, angler access is kind of a focus on with the forest and this is just part of that um, process. And as you can see for 2021, this is where a lot of my crews will be focused throughout the, the summer months. Other than that, that's just a quick little overview. I can be happy to take any questions. All right, any questions for Chris on this project? All right, I don't see any hands. Okay, do we have a motion for this one? I'll make the motion to tentatively approve it. Okay, the motion from Tyler. I'll second it. A second from Drew. All right, all in favor say yes. 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 Is there any opposed say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are no no's. Um, Justin, are you still on? Yeah, you're there. Okay. Just making sure. Yep. Just making sure we still maintaining a quorum here. So uh did you say quorum or de decorum? Yes. <laughs> a quorum. 
Um, yeah, so we're good. All right. Okay, next project. Um, actually, we're right at 2.30, and while we're switching regions, let's take um, a 10-minute break, if that's okay. And uh, then we'll start up again. So we'll start off again right at 2.40. Thanks, everybody.
start up our, our count, all of our council. I think we'll look to go live. I'll wait for the thumbs up from Michael. Okay, we are on. All right. Thanks everybody for joining us again to pick up the rest of our Habitat Council meeting. Uh, we still have 11 projects to try to finish up before 4 p.m. So I'm gonna try to move at a good clip here. And so I'll ask our project proponents uh, to uh, be succinct. How's that? But thorough, please be thorough. So uh, we're gonna start for our next project is in our Southern region. Uh, project 5650 in the database, aquatic and riparian improvement on the lower Beaver River near Minersville Reservoir. Go ahead. Thanks. So this is uh, Nick Braithwaite. I'm a Blue Ribbon Fisheries Biologist in the Southern region. Um, so this is uh, working in an area where we've um, done projects the last four or five years. Uh, so to orient yourself, uh, so Minersville Reservoir near the town of Beaver. Um, and then going downstream to the town of Minersville. Um, so if you can zoom in again there, Daniel. Um, so this project kind of has two parts. There's um, one part you see, so the, the full big um, black polygon there, that represents uh, retreating of Russian olive and tamarisk that's been removed in earlier phases of this project. Um, so that's one part. And then the, the bigger part is if you'll click on kind of the smaller, like, yeah, right there. So that's, uh, that indicates the stream work that we want to do. Uh, so those are kind of the two components. Um, and then maybe if you could go to uh, the images, Daniel. Um, so basically it's a, a stream project to try and improve the uh, habitat for the fishery there. So we'll just go, we can go pretty quick through these pictures. There's just quite a few of them. So this is just basically a typical eroding stream bank on the section where we'd be working. Uh, another picture showing the same. Um, so here's another picture with some Russian olive that uh, falls down in the river, it grows all along. It makes uh, recreating there difficult. Um, we'll go to the next picture, same idea, uh, kind of a before picture. We'll go to the next one. Uh, so this is a during picture just showing some of the uh, rock and log structures that we're putting in. So we put in these structures, uh, do some bank sloping um, that basically improves the habitat um, in that area. Go ahead and go to the next picture. Uh, just some more of the same, installing some of these structures during earlier phases of the project. Uh, this is some of the, showing some of the kind of the retreatment we'll do. Um, so we hire uh, conservation crews to uh, cut and spray um, all the Russian olive and tamarisk tree sprout. Uh, we'll also uh, have the conservation crews do some planting um, willows and cottonwoods and different woody vegetation. Um, so here's kind of an after picture. Uh, go ahead and keep scanning through these Daniel links. Uh, so this is actually where we ended with the project in the last phase. So you can see um, on the right is where we finished and then the on the left is where we're proposing to work. Um, so we've actually been doing a little bit of work there this year, but that's where really where the work will pick up with this project. Um, more riparian plantings, the willow plantings we've done have done really well here. Maybe keep going through. Uh, it's, a, it's a good sport fishery, uh, lots of fish and, and some big fish as well. Maybe keep going, Daniel. Uh, in 2019, we had some flooding um, in June of that year, which created some problems. So part of this project is also to address um, some of the issues from the flooding. So keep going, Daniel. Um, so here's kind of some before and after pictures from the flooding that you can see. So we want to get back in, in these spots and kind of fix up the structures and get it back in good shape. Most of this, the work held up, but there are just some patches that we need to address. Keep going, Daniel. Uh, same idea, here's a bank uh, that failed during the flooding. 
Um, but like I said, not all of the work we did failed. Most of it held up. So here's here's a few before after um, from earlier phases to give you an idea of what this project would be doing. Another before after. There's one or two more of these before after. So the, the, this is the same work we'd be doing with this project. This is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, and then, like I said, we've we've pretty much done Russian all and Tamarus removal throughout this whole section. So these are some before after pictures from that. Um, and so this current project, we just have a little bit of money in there to retreat it and make sure we stay on top of it. So that's what the project is. You know, if you go to finance, so we're basically asking for sixty thousand to do the work. Um, so that includes hiring our heavy equipment crew to to do the actual um, stream work. Uh, some money to um, get rock, uh, money to hire the conservation crew, and some extra money for things like buying the bare root um, herbicide, uh, just kind of random stuff like that, re regional vehicle mileage. And then I, I also want to point out that, so we're asking for 60,000 and this project is really focused on doing the stream work. And basically what happened was last year, we put in a project that included everything we have in this year's project, but it also had some other work, which included the, the kind of upland work, removing all the Russian olive and uh, tamarisk from the section we're working in, in this project we're proposing, as well as building a riparian fence. But we were able to get money for that through NRCS, and, uh, and we went after a water quality grant. Um, so there, there's more than just you see in this project. We just are kind of spreading it out over two years. So there's other stuff going on here. But um, and I, so we're asking basically for um, half from Habitat Council and half from WRI. And I think it scored uh, really well with WRI. So I'm guessing it will be funded. And then this is the breakdown for um, how we're allocating with Habitat Council. So that's all I have. If there are any questions, I can try and answer them. Yeah. Okay, no questions for Nick. All right, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration for this fall. Okay, thanks, Paul. We have a motion. Is there a second? I still have a second. Okay, we have a second. I'll, I'll pull that one from Drew. I saw him first, I guess. Um, all in favor, say yes. 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 Are there any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are no no's, so the motion carries. Um, and I promise we won't tell your buddy, Lynn, that you're cutting down his Russian olive trees. Yeah, Lynn and Jim don't need to know about it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. All right. Southern Region Repair and Refor Reforestation number 5670. Go ahead. All right. This is uh, Gary Bezant down here in Cedar City. Uh, it's the Southern Region Riparian Restoration, not reforestation. But um, this project is one that we've been bringing to the council for quite a number of years. I looked back this morning and it looks like this is the ninth year um, that we proposed this. It's something that it's a program that was started by Heather Talley um, quite a few years back and been using it as a trying to take a take a bad and make a good out of it. We 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 know that in all the regions we we all deal with nuisance beaver issues. And one of the things that we've been doing in the southern region for the, the last nine years is trying to use some of these nuisance beavers um, where opportunity allows. And move them into areas where we do want to have them and try to do good things with them. Um, on that map, you, you can kind of see the proposed areas. These each of these dots represent a, an area that is a target for having beavers moved into. Um, we definitely will not get to all of those dots this year, but but they're all ideas and places that have been vetted by our regional management team and vetted by our um, partners with the Forest Service. Um, I also would mention as I get started here. I, I, 
I also I want to be thoroughly succinct, like Eric, Eric mentioned. Uh, but uh, I am probably of the partners involved with this project. I'm probably the least involved. Um, I need to give a lot of credit to Teresa Griffin, who um, really has carried the weight in in this project since Heather Talley moved up to Salt Lake to work for Justin. Um, Mindy Cox, our office manager, and then some great partners of the Forest Service, Mike Golden, um, really, really have carried a heavy load as we've transitioned. Um, Rhett Boswell, who used to work for us and now works for the Forest Service, continues to be a great partner on it as well. Um, if you go to the pictures, Daniel, and kind of talk about the process. Um, like I mentioned, this is a, something where we take the nuisance beavers, somewhere where we have a problem, beavers are ca causing problems, and then we, we live trap them and move them. Um, they've included some pictures here showing the process. Um, it, it, because of AIS issues, uh, there's a, we have to quarantine them for, I believe it's 48 to 72 hours. And then uh, here you see it's getting some oxygen. That's because we've also had the request of this council trying to improve our, our data gathering. Um, we've been installing some, what we call them tail tags. It's a VHF transmitter that allows us to kind of track them after they've been released and kind of get a better idea of our success. So you can start clicking through that, just kind of showing that process of getting those tail tags on that. Our vet out of Salt Lake office comes down and, and helps oversee that and helps with that a lot. We just keep moving through them. Um, a lot of just fun, good pictures. Uh, the biologists that are working with this really love love the beavers, love doing things to, to benefit them. And then the habitat people, we love to use the beavers to do good things for the, for the habitat. And so as you get a little further on, I think one or two more, we'll, you'll start to see how we've impacted habitat. As Teresa mentioned her earlier, really carried the load since Heather's left. So this is where, uh, this is up on the Ponsagant Plateau, one of the areas we've had the greatest success. It's an area we moved beavers into, um, has been a regional focus area for us with, uh, we've done a lot of upland work in the Aspen. We've done a lot of work on the riparian corridor and stream work with Nick and Stan. Uh, doing great things on the on the river there and, and then adding the beavers back in. Um, just seeing the great things they're doing. Uh, the species, uh, the bottomville cutthroat trout have benefited greatly as well as the boreal toad up there. Um, and then I think there's one more on, I think there's one more picture of another area. Yeah, here this shows up to Little Creek. Uh, again, just an area where we're getting some beaver established and, and an area downstream from the, the Bryan Head fires and being able to help with a lot of the erosion damage that happens uh, from those fires. A lot of the areas that we've proposed to take beavers to this year um, are, are downstream from fires that happened three to five years ago. And a lot of a lot of interest in using them in areas that are seeing some of that head cutting, erosion, and big problems from that. So from there, maybe you can just jump to the budget. Uh, the reality of how we do this is we, we hire three seasonals each year. Uh, get them a truck, get them the traps, and and then just depending on where the nuisance issues come up, then they always do come up. We we just send them out and get them going, and and then depending on where those beavers are trapped and and where we end up quarantining them, we've got some a facility here in Cedar City. We've got one over in uh, Bicknell, uh, and we'll just work with the different partners and start to work on getting those out into the areas we want them into. Uh, so. Uh, money for the seasonals, money for the truck, um, a few, a little more money for the VHF transmitters, um, some a storage unit that's needed to to house all the, the materials and supplies. Um, I was going to tell you um, on the the monitoring. I think this is this will be our third year putting out those tail tags, and uh, we're still early. We we don't have a lot of data yet, but we are definitely upping the effort in gathering that data and trying to bring that back in some fo form of a report that can not sure what that will look like but some form of a report that can show how successful we're being uh with the beavers that we're moving so with that uh habitat council looking for that much money and at that allocation all right any, really succinct. yep any questions for gary Okay. Uh, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. Thank you, Paul. A second? I'll second the motion. 
Okay, thanks, Jack. We have a motion from Paul and a second from Jack. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no or no, raise your hand. Okay, there are no no's, so the motion carries. Thank you. All right, next project. Uh, 5689, cutthroat trout, migration barrier and maintenance. Go ahead. Okay, this is Stan Beckstrom again. Um, Welcome back, so Stan. We've been, hey, Gary. <laughs> so we've been pretty much doing this, some kind of a cutthroat trout migration barrier project every year. Um, this year, um, I, I did notice the title says fiscal year 21. It's actually fiscal year 22. <laughs> um, so this project this year, this is to build one new barrier on UN Creek. And then we need to repair um, three other barriers or four other barriers actually. Um, so I'll talk just a minute on the new barrier that's on UN Creek. Um, so UN Creek, uh, quite a few years ago, was renovated, um, poisoned, treated, and Colorado River cutthroat trout were put into UN Creek. Um, they're doing okay. They're still there and they're doing well. So if you can zoom out just a little bit, Daniel, just upstream of, this is Mill Meadow Reservoir by the town of Loa. So we have Forsyth Reservoir. And just above Forsyth Reservoir, there's another barrier that's been in there for a really long time. Um, and so our conservation population of Colorado cutthroat start above Forsyth Reservoir. That barrier has had trouble in the past. We've had fish get past it. Last year or the year before, we did some work on it to improve it. But there's only one barrier on this system. And one barrier doesn't always work. So the other thing is that uh, recently we found some, uh, doing our gill netting, we found some rainbow trout in Forsyth Reservoir. We do not stock rainbow trout in that reservoir uh, because of the Colorado cutthroat. Uh, there's also been some perch show up in that reservoir. And the theory is that those rainbows and perch are coming out of Mill Meadow Reservoir. We used to think that the dam on Forsyth was a barrier. We no longer believe that. Um, we think fish can get through the through the dam. Uh, it could also be people moving them themselves, but just to be sure, we want to build another barrier just above Mill Meadow Reservoir, so we don't have brown trout and rainbow trout and perch moving up into Forsyth and potentially getting upstream and to the conservation population of cutthroat. So, um, so this uh, barrier on UN Creek, we actually proposed it last year. It was approved last year and funded. However, we got looking at where we were gonna build it and some other considerations and it really was not a very good site. We had a lot of concerns that that barrier would be successful and um, function and hold up long time and we decided it was just too risky so we did not build the barrier last fall. We reevaluated the stream, we found another site that is a much better site and instead of using rock we want to use concrete blocks and uh, it's a better location and then using concrete blocks instead of rock will make the barrier stronger and it makes us feel a lot better about it. So. We're just reproposing this barrier. It does cost a little bit more because we have to pay for blocks to build this barrier. So that's um, that's the barrier for UN Creek that we want to protect that conservation population up in UN Creek. The other um, barriers, there's one on Lower Manning Creek by our Elbow Ranch property. Um, that barrier was one of the first barriers built a long time ago. It's always been a question of how good that barrier was. It's functioned and held up for a long time until, oh, maybe three years ago, we started finding brown trout above the barrier. Um, so it's just, it's not a 100% good 
barrier. So we need to go back in on this barrier, repair some, um, I think there's a picture of this one, Daniel, if you can go to the pictures. And we just need to improve this barrier with some more rock, fix the concrete pad. Um, this is the location of the UM Creek barrier. Next picture is, this is the um, Manning Meadow Creek barrier. And you can see how water can easily get around this barrier. And it's, you know, we build them a lot better these days than we did 15 or 20 years ago. So this one needs to be repaired. And then this is another barrier on the South Fork of North Creek up by Beaver. Um, in 2019, when we had that high runoff, um, the concrete pad on this barrier was completely washed out. And then there's two other barriers on the North Fork and one up above this that this had some holes in the concrete pad. So we need to replace this concrete pad and patch up the other two with, that have holes in them. Uh, we, we were planning to do it last year, but there was still just too much water. Well, it, well, we did go back in and put some more rock on these barriers. Some of that rock on the other side is new rock. And uh, so we did repair them a little bit, but we could not pour the concrete pad. So we're hoping this year there's not too much water and we can get in there and repair the concrete pads on these three barriers up on in that North Creek area. Um, so we, we're planning on the DWR heavy equipment crew doing the work. Um, they, so they'll build the barrier and fix the one on Man Manning Creek, and then DWR personnel will fix the pads on the other ones. So we need about 36,500 to do this project, to pay the equipment crew and to buy concrete blocks and other materials. And so um, it's just protecting our conservation populations of Bonneville and Colorado River cutthroat trout. That's, that's all I have if there's any questions. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, questions for, for him on this? Pretty pretty straightforward. And I also appreciate you, you uh, proposing to use our own heavy equipment crew um, to do a good job. And to keep them busy. Any, if there's no questions, do we have a motion? I move to approve. Okay, a motion from Drew. I'll second it. Second from Justin. Okay, uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Is there any opposed? Say no and, and raise your hand. Okay, then there are no no's, so the motion carries. Thanks, Stan. Thank you. All right. Uh, next one is 5732 Parawan Pond Community Fishery Dredging and Infrastructure Upgrade. Go ahead. Uh, so this is Nick Braithwaite again, uh, fisheries biologist in the southern region. Hopefully this will be pretty quick. It's straightforward. Um, so this is Parawan Pond in the town of Parawan, the community fishery. Um, when I put the project together, uh, I found some references to Habitat Council funding the original creation of this pond. I couldn't find out exactly. I could never get a dollar amount or anything, but so Habitat Council did help um, to fund the construction of this pond, and it's been popular. Um, but what's happened is over the years, it's started to fill in with sediment, and this was made worse after the Bryan Head fire in 2017. Um, and so this project is designed to help solve that problem with the sedimentation and we're working with Peril and City and they've agreed to um, the big problem is the inflow structure basically they didn't have a way to stop all that sediment from coming in so they're installing a new inflow structure um, right now I, I think it's been completed but that'll allow them to cut off um, the inflow during flood events when you get all that sediment in like during summer monsoon storms um, so, so Perlin City is doing that. They've taken that on, and then they have operators to to run equipment. Basically, our project is just um, getting some money to hire a long reach excavator to help um, dredge out the sediment from around the pond edges, especially, um, and just make it uh, more fishable, um, improve the fishery. So it's it's not very complicated. That's that's all it is. Is basically just a way to. 
um, dredge the pond from all the sediment that's filled in. Um, there's a picture you can kind of see um, where the inflow is there on the right and, and how you've got all the sediment there. But, um, if you go to finance, I think it's about ten thousand uh, dollars. So that would be enough money to to uh, rent an excavator for about a month. And then, like I said, Paralyzed City uh, is putting in a lot of in kind, especially through their employees to run the equipment and do everything. Um, so that's really all I had. If there are any questions about it, so I, I don't see you know. Where they're fixing that inflow structure and where we're about three or four years out from the Brian Head fire, I don't see sediment being a huge issue. You know, like this isn't going to be something we're coming back for year after year. Hopefully, it'll be at least 20 years before we need to do this again. All right, Paul. Yeah, just a just a quick question, Nick. Is is this pond on channel or is it off channel and it's just uh suspended sediments that are dropping out in the in the pond? Uh, it's off channel, so it's more of the suspended sediments. Okay. All right. Any other questions for Nick on this? All right. No, I don't see any more questions. Do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we, have we have a second from Dwayne. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Say no and raise your hand. All right, it's unanimous. The motion carries. All right, thanks, Nick. Okay, we're we're getting closer here. We're going to go to the northeast region now. Uh, project number fifty six sixty seven, East Fort Carter Creek Fish Barrier Construction. Go ahead. Who have we got on for this one? It should be Brian, I believe. Okay. I'm not seeing Brian. Um, Sorry, I'm on. I was on mute and and uh, I had my computer muted. I guess I'm up, huh? Yep, you're up, Brian. Go ahead. Oh, awesome. Okay. So this is funding we're seeking for a fish barrier up on the North Slope. Uh, if you guys know where like Sheep Creek Lake is or the town of Manila, it's up on the hill above them. You can see Long Park Reservoir right there above, just north of that dot. Um, this is overall a part of about a hundred mile cutthroat trout restoration project. Um, we secured funding for a bunch of the barriers in 2018. There's some neighboring barriers. Um, I didn't walk this particular stream, uh, a couple of our other people did, Trin included, and we thought we were pretty comfortable, but then after reviewing it this fall, I, I kind of pushed all of us into thinking we should probably just do a, a for sure solid vertical barrier there. there there's, there's a fair amount of protection protecting the upper reach because the cutthroat are in the upper part of the map. Um, there's there's quite a bit of a waterfall there, natural waterfall, but I wouldn't call it a waterfall. It's very tumbly, rocky. Uh, it is about a good 12 to 20% grade at various portions of it right below this dot. Uh, my fear is that we get a 2011 event and that would prospectively introduce a situation where we could have brook trout knocking on our door. Uh, it's especially important because this is the upper end of the whole treatment area. So if this was to get reinvaded, uh, we would lose 100 miles of pure cutthroat trout habitat uh, once our project is complete. Uh, we just, for the most part, finished up that treatment right above that dot uh, this past year. Um, so for eight months of the year, that's actually a dry wash. Uh, that's a picture of the trail coming in. We'll be walking a machine through there. That's looking from, from upstream, looking downstream at the proposed barrier location. We have a moderately decent incision type. And then right below this area, that's Dana Beta, right standing where we propose it. Uh, about 100 feet or so below this proposed barrier location, 
is when the stream really starts to peel down and cut down to anywhere between 10 to 20 degrees angle, just depending on where you're at. Um, so this really is functioning at the top of all that vertical grade, and it, it would introduce the final stop to any fish invaders. And like I said, it's dry for about seven months of the year, but we are fearful of a high water event, possibly a 20 to 50 year water event could cause us trouble uh, where fish reinvade. Uh, I've already started the 404 permit for this. Um, it looks promising, but the Army Corps does have some lip to give me, so I'll have to deal with that, but we, we will get the permit in time. Um, majority of this project is in equipment, I believe. Um, there's a little bit of seed here, there's fabric, and then a little bit of seasonal labor built into the project. Overall, fairly cheap, that's 6,500 bucks. Um, and it's there's no non-game fish up in this part of the North Slope. There's, there's historically natural fish barriers that have kept non-game fish, but not cutthroat out of this entire drainage network. All right, any questions for Brian on this project? Okay, I don't see any questions. Do we have a motion? I move to approve this project. Thanks, Drew. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a second from Paul Burnett. All in favor, say yes. 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 Uh, any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, it's unanimous. The motion carries. All right, thanks, Brian. Uh, maybe you're on for other ones here. But, uh, the next project is 5738. Old Fort Pond Water Delivery Pipeline. Go ahead. So I'm Natalie Bourne, the Regional Fisheries Biologist here in the Vernal Office. Um, Daniel, I have a PowerPoint to go with all the rest of the Northeastern Region project proposals. And it looks like I'll be doing Trena's proposals as well. So you get to hear me for a minute, but I will be short and sweet as I can with all of these. So just some background, you guys have helped fund the construction of Old Fort Pond. Uh, it's been highly successful in our community. And this portion of the project that I'm proposing today has been on the back burner, in the back of our minds since we created it. There was no direct connection to Old Fort Ponds from any of the lateral lines that come through for our pipelines. So go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, I'm not going to read all of these, but we own 2.4 shares of upper primary um, irrigation water through the Ashley Upper Canal. And it's important to the, the ponds themselves and the wetland mitigation area below the ponds that we are able to deliver our water. And this pipeline is, uh, well, we've got a couple challenges that are coming up here. So the Ashley Upper Canal is actually in the process of being piped with a 48 inch um, pipe that runs right at the, the top end of the canal system. So um, what we need to do is make sure, there we go, I can see that now, thank you. So the, the idea here is it's, it's time, they're gonna be installing that 48 inch pipe in the fall of 2021, maybe even sooner, if we have a very low snowpack and low runoff year. Um, but what we're trying to do is line up the construction of our lateral line with the same time they're installing this 48 inch line. Um, so that's the whole goal. And um, this would be a line that would only belong to the Division of Wildlife. So a couple of things we've run into. We have been able to deliver our shares of water to the ponds the past three years working with private landowners. And I think this is on the next slide. So go ahead and go to that one. So here, let me just backtrack here. We've already paid 
for the lateral line connection to the 48 inch line. We paid that and we have been granted a six inch line that will connect straight from that 48 inch line. So there's approximately 1700 linear feet of that six inch polyline with some depressurization structures to have a free flowing system down into the ponds themselves. The lateral collect, uh, connection will be DWR owned. There will not be any other entities or private landowners that pull from that pipeline. Um, the lateral line will be metered and that's part of the $5,000 that we already paid for. So we'll know exactly how much water we're getting. And then the lateral line will also allow us to maintain our wetlands um, permitting, which was required through the Army Corps of Engineers. So it's pretty important to the whole project, not just the fisheries aspect of it. Next slide. So here's just a visual. Google Maps still does not show that we have two ponds sitting right here down where the North Fishing Pond buoy is, but that's where that's where it sits. So what we're looking for is the 48 inch line is going to run across here at section A or at pin A. We need to bring it down 1700 feet um, down this county road, which they have granted us access. We have to do an encroachment permit, but that's it. And they've told us they would approve that, but we cannot submit that until we hire a contractor to actually do the work. Take the corner across and then an inlet structure right into the property, which is just across where the red and yellow lines come together. Next slide. So this is going to ensure that we have water delivery to this WMA. Um, long long term sustainability of water to the ponds and the wetland mitigation area. And the pipeline will help eliminate water loss that we already see from an open irrigation ditch that we run through right now. And one thing I wanted to bring up right here is if you go back one slide to where that picture is, um, all of our water right now has to come through this big pond, which is right on the corner. If that pond is low and what it's projected to do when they pipe the actual canal itself is decrease in water volume significantly from the spring. So it is possible that we would just to get our water to the ponds, we would have to fill this entire like two and a half acre pond just to get the water to come through the outlet structure to come to our pond. So that's why I think this is so important. And the timing of it is fairly important too with when they're piping. Um, go ahead, two slides to the finance portion. I didn't put a finance portion in. Oh my goodness. I failed on make, making this PowerPoint. If you want to go back to the finance section. So what we have is um, we have been waiting and are still waiting on some NRCS mitigation funding. So I've been told about five different times now that I would get the money in three months and they've set several dates. But right now we were supposed to get it in April and they've told me it's delayed again. So this is mitigation money that the canal company applied for, which is supposed to be used at this wetland. And I'm doing my best to hold them to this because as they pipe these canal systems, there's much tree loss. Um, wetlands do end up drying up because the pipe is obviously more efficient than a leaky canal. But I still do not have that in hand, so we're working on it and I'll keep holding their feet to the fire as much as I can. But our ask from Habitat Council here is I think a total of $91,000 and I want to break this down for you. The pipe is expensive, but a big chunk of this expense is having to do the repaving of the edge of the county road. There is just not much room to be able to put this pipeline. So we would do the best that we could to keep it to the south side of the road, but we are gonna have to put pavement back on top of this irrigation line. So that is a pretty good chunk of the cost. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, any questions on this project? Got a thumbs up from Drew. Very nice. Okay, seeing no questions, do we have a motion? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. I just like to compliment her on 
fighting for her water rights. I think we have cases of historical loss of water rights and things that we we should have had and we don't have now, and I'm glad she's at being proactive on keeping them. They are very important to this place, for sure. Yeah, we talk about that a lot these days, making sure that we're up to snuff on, on uh, uh, using our water rights so that they can't be filed on by others. All right, any other questions or comments? Okay, look for that motion then. I'll make a motion to tentatively approve it for funding. Thanks, Dwayne. A second? I second that. Second from Drew. All in favor, say aye. 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 If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, the motion is unanimous and carries. And all right, you're good to go. All right, next project, we're getting there. 5555. Montes. Same thing. Improvements. Same thing, Daniel, if you'll go to the PowerPoint, please. All right, so this is a phase two project. We started on this last fiscal year and I'll go through real quick some of the, the progress points that we've made so far. Um, this is a collaborative project between uh, aquatics, habitat and outreach within our own region. So I think it's pretty neat to have all of us be able to work on one cool little area. Next slide. So, Recap of phase one here, we've uh, begun spraying and preparation of approximately seven acres of croplands to turn into pollinator plot crops. Um, we've installed, just yesterday actually, we installed uh, 34 large pollinator trees on the northern edge of the road leading into the WMA. We've also have a complete plan set that was delivered to us. Um, we had some on-site meetings and this is to revamp the trail system. So the phase that I'm gonna talk about next is heavily involved in realigning this trail system and re-sloping it and making it fully ADA accessible. We've had, I've brought this up several times in the past with our aquatic operation and maintenance budget, but we have a section here right as it gets towards the pier. And we've had, I don't know how many angler falls when it starts to get icy. So this is important to us for our angler safety to fix this properly, realign, resurface, and make sure that we have a quality product for our, as Calvin called them, I guess, mobily challenged anglers. Um, we want to make this a place where they can get wheelchairs all the way from the parking lot down. We wanna have our elderly anglers be able to come out and fish this pier without having this steep ledge right on the edge. So. That section of the trail that you see leading down to the pier, that's a big chunk of phase two. And then this little kind of loopy trail that goes back down towards the dam that you can see in the picture, that is also part of a trail that we have come up with to put in a kayak launch deck right down towards the water's edge. We have a lot of angling that happens here with small pontoon boats, kick boats, kayaks and there's really no place for them to be able to get to the water's edge easily. So we've got some ideas for that. And then our habitat crew did a realignment of all the pipe fence and was able to enlarge the parking lot by 50%. So they have completed all of that as of this last week. Next slide. So for phase two, this is what we're gonna be asking for. We hope that none of those pollinator trees die, but we have a little bit of funding in there to replace any of those that are lost. We have seven acres of that pollinator crop. Um, Tori has put in an amount of $8,000 for pollinator seed, and he is in charge of that section and will be the lead on that. Um, Tanya is gonna be working on some monarch and hummingbird tagging and pollinator education events along with, and this is probably gonna be a phase three or an outdoor recreation grant proposal um, for educational kiosks uh, for this WMA. And then 
for most all of that work that I talked about with construction of the new trail and the kayak trail, that is going to be three weeks with our heavy equipment crew. I've already met with Scott and he's pretty confident that he can do all of that work for us, including some of the welding on the pipe fence and some realignment of that. So I'll be the lead on, on that. I did take out this construction of the footbridge. Um, I'll get to that in a third phase or an outdoor recreation grant. That's a perfect one for outdoor recreation grant. And then Pat Rainbold is the project administrator. Next slide. So the total ask for this project is $44,570 with in kind of 10,000. Um, and it's kind of a breakdown of three different pots because the whole project itself is beneficial to everything there, not just humans, even though this one section of it is more focused on our anglers and the access down to the fishing pier and the kayak deck. And I think that's it. Any questions? Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, any questions on the project? I guess I'd probably need to mention, you know, Habitat Council money or restricted funds from license dollars and, and whatnot. And so the the 20% to, to non-game pot, even though there's a place, a checkbox for that, that that money doesn't really exist. And so there's not there's not a component there for that out of this fund of money. And so I just need to reiterate that. Um, so that makes it a little problematic, but you know it's up to the council to decide how to move forward on this one. Do I need to realign the source? I guess I would look for uh, thoughts from the council. She can move that 20% into Upland Game. I think this is a great project for turkey and some pheasant and quail out there. Perfect. Okay, I can do that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Daniel or Allison, if you can look to make that change. Eric, I was just going to mention too that that funding that came to the legislature this year for pollinator seed, mm -hmm. I think it went to to Department of Agriculture, but maybe when the information comes out on how to apply for that, this might be a good candidate to test out that new funding source. So Nally, maybe we'll just be in touch with you and Tori and Pat and those guys is when we hear some more information on that, that might be an avenue that would be good for stuff like this. Well, I appreciate that, Tyler. Yeah, for, for sure on, on pollinators, non-game things, yeah, we need to look to these other sources of, of funds for those. Uh, I think we're covered uh, with Upland here this time. Thanks, Dwayne, for for uh, recommending that. I think that's a, that's a, appropriate. And so, um, but you know, uh, yeah, additional project work. You know, there there is another pot of money there for for pollinators. So, through Department of Ag. So, thanks for that, Tyler. Any other questions on this project? All right. I'll make a motion to approve it. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right. We have a motion from Tyler and a second from Dwayne. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Um, we have any opposed? Say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed, so motion carries. All right. Very good. We'll move to uh, project number 5569, um, Northeast Region Aquatic Operation and Maintenance. Is that you again, Natalie? <laughs> yeah, I meant to tell you guys, my internet just completely drops. Welcome to the basin. It happens. So I didn't hear any of that past. Tyler was talking about a pollinator pot of money, potentially. Mm -hmm. 
but we can go back to that later. <laughs> yep. Well, the motion carried, so you're good to go. Okay. And uh, we're, we're moving on to the next project. And so you're up again and, and uh, you're doing a great job. So thanks. All right. So Northeastern Region Aquatic Operation and Maintenance. You can go ahead and go to that. Well, first off, I'll say this picture on the right is the new Red Fleet fish green. This is a massive structure that was um, installed and finished up in June, I believe. So this is what it looks like. This is just one side with the water pouring over to the left. And that is my maintenance technician down there cleaning the screen. So next slide. All right, so I just wanted to kind of talk about this project and how successful it has been for our region, thanks to you guys supporting it. So the first iteration of the project was um, brought forward in 2018 when our aquatic staff realized that we really had no way to fund any of our routine aquatic maintenance on facilities and capital projects that we've completed. Um, we had a quite a long list of backlogged maintenance projects at several angular uh, access places that became safety issues. We had these new capital projects that were coming online in form of two major fish screens that require 24 seven, well, not 24 seven, we'll call it year round maintenance. Uh, aquatic staff elected to create this project to help fund and ultimately catch up on many of the maintenance projects in the region and try to have a plan of a way to fund them moving into the future. Next slide. So just to remind you guys, your, your money has gone a long way in our region and we appreciate it and our anglers appreciate it. So this is some of the stuff we've done with this project money in the past. Oop, where'd it go? Oh, okay. So Little Montez Fishing Pier, um, we replaced the treks and the cables. Pelican Lake Fishing Pier was repaired and moved by crane and truck to lower Stillwater Ponds. Big Sandwash Angler Access, um, we put a new parking a culvert in the parking lot to help it drain and installed road base and smoothed it all out. Uh, repairs to the rough angler access road. Repairs to starvation fish screen and maintenance during the times that it spills. We graded some angler access points on Big Sandwash, Red Fleet Angler Access, Sportsman's Access at Pelican Lake and Mount Warner. We've moved and we, we move and repair and consistently maintain the Big Sandwash Angler Access Wedge Dock um, as the water levels rise and fall. And then Old Fort Ponds, the maintenance of that, we didn't really know what to expect right off the bat, but we've got that down pretty clear now. Um, we continuously maintain all these trash services, mowing and trimming, culinary, the wetland weed control, water delivery, um, and the reporting for the permit, which will be done in two years. So you guys have already talked about the WMA maintenance and Pat and I sat down and we rolled every possible aquatics WMA maintenance project into project 5700. And this includes all the maintenance and operations of Old Fort Ponds from now forward. And then the last thing we have on our list that's a continuous maintenance project are the weekly uh, fish screen cleanings at Red Fleet and Pelican Lake. So next slide. So as mentioned just a minute ago, Pat and I really sat down in February and had a good conversation and tried to figure out how to do this with the WMA maintenance. Now, one question that we had, and I don't know if he brought up to the group that was talking about WMA maintenance is everything in this current project proposal that I'm bringing forward right now is only for aquatics operation and maintenance, which place take, takes place on non WMA lands in the Northeastern region. Now, honestly, I would much prefer this money to be able to be placed in project 5700 moving forward, but I don't know if that's a possibility, but I wanted to bring that up and get you guys' um, perspective on that to see if it's even possible. That way we only have one of these maintenance type projects within the whole region instead of two every year. Um, the funding breakdown is motor pool costs for, and how we've been doing this the past year is a part-time seasonal employee that goes year round. So those screens require maintenance all through the winter. And 
From what we've found is that this position going year round at part time is perfect for everything that we need to do on the maintenance perspective of all these amenities that we have. So half this salary is in the WMA maintenance budget now, and then just as the remainder of that person's salary, which is $10,500. And Trina asked me to throw in a little bit here for some supplies on finishing up the starvation fishing pier. She's got a couple additional little things to do to the Pelican screen. And then we are constantly replacing those dock bumpers on the big sand wash dock. So the total ask is 15,850. But again, I would like to hear what you guys have to say about possibly putting this in that other project. And I believe that's it. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, you bring up a great question. Yeah, we did provide uh, instructions based on feedback from last year that we were trying to, to lump more things together uh, that made sense. And I think you've done a good job of that here. But um, I think I want to look to the councils to see if they have any opinions on on how this has gone and I, I still think it was probably appropriate to have your aquatics request separate from maybe the habitat and you know and the I guess the upland and and the big game side of things um, uh, because there's a distinct separation in the funding pots for for aquatics and so um, we still could possibly lump even further if we wanted to but I think this provides enough granularity that that I'm 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 more satisfied with where we're at, but I'm looking at the council to offer their opinion on on where we're at with uh, lumping or splitting. I'm good with it the way it's written. Thanks, Drew. I do have a question for Natalie. Uh, did the Northeast Region turn an enhancement in for the same position or positions? Uh, the enhancement that I, I'm not 100% sure, but I do not think that any of this was included just because this has been our funding mechanism since 2018. So I do not believe that this portion is included in that enhancement, but I am not trying to either. So I don't know the specifics of all of it. Yeah, okay. so if it's, if it's a new position, yeah, it'll have to get approval through the enhancement process just for the position here you could get the funding approved uh, but if it's an existing position that has already been there then it's just the funding you said for approval right yeah <clears throat> yeah i guess i didn't know which one you were talking about if you were talking about like the actual enhancement for seasonal time or is are you talking about an fte enhancement an fte enhancement Good question. I don't know if we've formally asked for this as an FTE enhancement. I'll, uh, I'll look at what you guys have submitted and, and uh, if I need to follow up with Trina in the region, I will. Okay. So if it does require an enhancement and you put the Habitat Council funding it, if this project's approved, um, you know, it's pretty good shot that you'll you'll get that request for an FTE because um, it's funded. So any other questions on this for Natalie? So just to follow up on my side, so you guys, do you want to keep it separate? Is that what my understanding I, of this is, is to do it exactly how we've done it with, with Pat? Putting on everything in the WMA and me doing yep. this part. Yep, okay. I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting thumbs ups and and head nods, affirmative. Okay. I I like the separation, but it also creates uh, additional coordination between aquatics and habitat, which I I love. We're doing more of that, and 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 builds that working together as a team. And so um, I like how how uh, you've come to ask for the aquatic side of it. Um, that you kind of lumped those together, uh, but worked with Pat uh, to get there. So I, I'm good with where you're at. Okay. I think other and last, are, so. Okay. And lastly, just before we leave, um, I said this before, but because of the funding for this project, we are, I would say, 95% cut up on all of our regional maintenance projects. So thank you again. It's awesome to be able to say that. And more than just me, appreciate it.
Trust me. Mm. Very good. Thanks, Natalie. And uh, good job on that. So uh, do we have a motion on this project? I'll make that motion, Eric. Thanks, Justin. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion from Justin, a second from Drew. Uh, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, is there any opposed? Say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed. So the motion carries. Thanks, Natalie. Great job on that one. Okay, our next project, we're getting there. We got three left here. It's 340. We're doing good. Uh, number 5657, Big Sand Wash Recreation Management. Who's up Same that? thing. That's yeah. me again. All right. Trina just likes me to present all her projects now while she's she doing my work of hauling musky from Yuba to Pelican. So, well, you're, you're doing a good job. So, <laughs> all right. So, I will fully admit I have no actual involvement in the planning of this. She worked alongside with our law enforcement, our regional manager, to get this kind of a recreation management up and going. So I'll go through her slides. I don't know that I have a ton of answers to questions if you have them, but I'll do my best. So go ahead, next slide. So just some background that she wanted to go through. There was an agreement with Moon Lake Water Users Association in 1963. We paid $100,000 and they built the reservoir up, allowing us a 1,200 acre feet conservation pool. Um, the payment also ensured that the public would have continued access to this reservoir for recreation purposes. And there was two areas that were deemed off limits, which is <clears throat> the dam and a wetland mitigation area. There was a second agreement done, no money exchanged, but uh, that was agreement for a North Angler access that we talked about a few minutes ago, a road along uh, road to the dam, parking area, bathrooms, and a boat ramp. So with both agreements in place, the DWR is ultimately responsible for recreation management at this area. And from my understanding, it used to be a state park. Um, it was never developed or never taken on. And basically everything falls back under our jurisdiction for the most part. Next slide. So we've been receiving random complaints, I'd say for several years now. Um, but as we see more recreation occurring at this place, um, it really became problematic. And I'm sure the COVID bump had something to do with it here. But there's areas where partying, drug use, general noise disturbance, litter, human waste, trespassing, all of that occurs. And I'll remind you guys that Big Sand Wash is completely surrounded by private lands. Really, the only access points are deemed to us through like Moon Lake Water Users Association. So it's pretty tight when it comes to that. And it's really one of our only places in the region where we have houses sitting right beside the lake. Next slide. So this group came up with some goals um, and one was to reduce or eliminate the amount of disrupt disruptive, be disruptive behavior um, that happens at Big Sand Wash and eliminate some of the stuff that happens into the night and is really obnoxious to the neighbors. Um, and then overall, it improved the experience for all anglers and recreationalists, especially those who are following the rules and obeying the laws. So she goes through some plans here, um, posting signage, improving access and amenities to the most heavily used locations. Next slide. So here's a, the first, and I asked her if this could be phased, and she said it could be phased, but this would be one of the first ones in the blue line. This is. Um, chip seal the access road and pave and strip the parking area. So obviously paving and striping the parking area is expensive. Um, we'll go through the budget here at the end, but one of the first phases she would have is doing a chip seal on this access road. But it goes uphill mostly the whole way to Big Sand Wash and it becomes extremely washboardy. And sometimes if your boat is still on the trailer by the time you get to the top, you're having a good day. Uh, next slide. She proposes several um, additional areas for signage. She would like to put a dumpster at the top of the boat ramp with garbage service provided. Um, 
people cannot seem to figure out that the ones in the bathroom are actual garbage cans and you know people they're terrible at littering right now um, so here's some signage that she would be putting on some of those um, some actual verbiage on the right i'm not going to go through all of them um, next slide She has some other areas where they'd like to improve some access locations, and this would be including some fence fencing and some road improvements. So there's a southeast corner and a mid lake corner. You can see there's several uh, roads that have just been created, two tracks through the properties. Um, they're kind of hard to see on this, but they're there. So she'd like to kind of contain some of those access locations. Next slide. And a southeast access. Now I'm really not familiar with these this area or the discussions, but it looks like it's including some fencing, parking areas, trash service, and a bathroom at some point. So this is where she's in talks with Duchesne County and some of the local residents to try to get some of these this area kind of up to speed and up to par with um, restricting what the public can and can't do. So I don't have a ton of detail on that. There's a bunch written in there if you want to go and read through it all. Next slide. Uh, Mid-Lake access. Oh, she's really getting into depth. Um, I think I've mostly covered all of this. Yeah, I think I mostly covered all of this. A lot of this is um, has to do with signage for telling the general public that everything outside of this area is private property. And basically these are the rules and trying to be able to have our officers and the Duchesne County Sheriff's officers be able to enforce these. We've gone, gone the round several times with our law enforcement and they cannot enforce something that is not signed at the property basically. So they want every sign with every rule they can possibly get so they can enforce it. Next slide. So here's her funding request. She's kind of broke this down by access points. So paving the road in, she does have a $27,000 request into Habitat Council and 9,000 for the motorboat access. And like I said before, this would be, if this project has to be phased, that would be a phase one. Paving and then uh, striping the parking area, that's a huge chunk of it, $130,000. Then kind of all this other smaller stuff is grouped by access locations. but. Total request from Habitat Council appears to be $173,000. And I believe that is the last slide. Yep. I'll try to take any questions if you have any, or I can relay them to Trenna if you have any that I can answer. Thanks, Natalie. Um, this poses lots of interesting questions here, uh, in my mind anyway. Um, uh, Drew, you're up. Yeah, it, it's a it's a good approach for us, but it it seems like a lot of the issues are law enforcement based, and I I'm wondering, you know, whether roles in relationships with other law enforcement agencies have been, you know, made and attempted, or their agreements for enforcement of laws here, because it's. It seems like not the game part of things is what is lacking, but the social aspect of law. And I'll have to ask her about that because I have no idea what kind of agreements have been put in place, if there are any that exist. I just know that our COs and the Duchesne County Sheriff's Office are about the only ones that enforce anything there. And that's all I know. So I'll bring that. I'll give that to her and have her let you know. Well, Natalie, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. You, you, I wouldn't expect that you would probably know the full answer to that, but Drew's Cushing is also spot on. Uh, Drew's question, sorry, is, is spot on. It's, it's, uh, it's timely in that we had discussed this at our previous leadership team meeting, um, and there, there could be some ways forward on this, uh, but these are issues that are plaguing all you know, most of our WMAs, especially along the, the Wasatch Front uh, and, and have some di difficult situations. Yeah, this is not a WMA, am I right, Natalie? 
It's not a WMA. It is just, I mean, the North Angler access could be considered, I guess, part of a WMA since we own that section or that's on, under our right of way. But the rest of it is all Moon Lake Water Users Association. And that's half the problem and half the battle is there's no one that really wants to take ownership of this whole recreation area. And it pretty much falls on us as if we did not have a fish, a fishery there and it was only irrigation purposes. I mean, you'd have recreation boaters there, but it's a good fishery in our region. It's highly sought for bass and perch. And I just, there's no one that's really ever wanted to come back and manage the other parts of that from what I can see. No, I mean, that's you, a good point. To your, comment, to your comment, Erica, I think this is the type of property that probably needs to be in that conversation that we're yeah. having. Uh, you know, in the leadership team and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Natalie, I think what you're trying to do here is, is admirable. Uh, I really do. And I think it'll, it'll help, but it isn't going to solve the problem. You're right. It's got to be a higher level conversation and, and we don't need to hash it out here, um, I guess, but. Um, I, I, I just got one quick question for Drew. So Drew, is your point that Habitat Council dollars shouldn't be used to pick up trash and prevent drinking and all the different things that are going like is that is that kind of your concern with what i guess are you, i'm trying to wrap my mind around are you philosophically against using habitat council dollars to improve the area on it because it's more social in nature and you view it more as a law enforcement thing i'm just trying to make sure i understand your point of view no, I think what we're doing is is within our responsibility, and that is making sure that there's amenities there that when people are doing you know legal things, uh, fishing in this instance, that they have a bathroom, they have trash there. Uh, that's 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 the good part of this, and signage always helps. But there's something else going on here beyond that, and that what what we're proposing just takes care of what's legally done there, but not the illegal aspect. Okay, thanks, Drew. Appreciate that clarification. Yep. Yeah. Um, I agree, but I almost, yeah, we, we talked about this. This is not a WMA, but we have these same issues on our WMAs. And the only reason that we are allowed to have public access to this reservoir is because we have an agreement. And if that agreement, agreement didn't exist, it's private land, and there's good chance that, that these, those folks would have not allowed fish and might have even fenced the whole property and that would be their their option um and so we're there because they have made an agreement with us and are allowing us to be there and so um you know it's it's a great recreational place for anglers but yeah there's got to be some specific work done on this specific issue in in the region to come up with an overall solution like we've talked about. And I will reiterate the bulk of this project, including the paving, I mean, that will directly benefit anglers and recreationalists at that facility. It's I a agree. cluster mess. Well. Yeah, it's a cluster mess beyond belief when you try to get all those cars, those boats and trailers up on the top of that. So we, we pave stuff all the time on our WMAs and whatnot, even though this isn't a WMA, I know we said that, but yeah it is for angling access and for you know the right uh kind of recreation that we're trying to cater to i i think i have a motion if if okay. you're ready i think uh, i'm ready i think the council's ready i i move this forward for funding consideration uh with uh, instruction to the northeast region to engage in a broader discussion about the other illegal activities uh, with local law enforcement and leadership at the Division of Wildlife. Yeah, I'll second that, Drew. Thank you, Justin. So we have a motion from Drew. We have a second from Justin to approve and include future discussion about the law enforcement and other issues that are going on in this area. Um, all in favor, say yes or aye. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right.
Okay, if there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. All right, there are none opposed. So um, the motion carries. Um, thanks everybody, that, that was kind of a more difficult discussion and it's a, got a bigger, diff, more a difficult issue behind it. So, um, all right, last one from Northeast region. Uh, 5666 Starvation Pier Railing, go ahead. This is me again. And the final one. So I think if you'll just click on the image, I don't think there's a PowerPoint associated with this. This is just a final step in the starvation fishing pier that Trina has been working on for what seems like three or four years now. But um, it looks like the issue is full ADA accessibility at low water levels. So what is she is proposing with this project is the creation and installation of a rail system that looks similar to this that's removable below the high water mark. Um, we saw last year that they were not able to remove the railings as the water, um, so it went out and then it came back up and they couldn't remove those railings and the pier ended up sitting on top of the railings themselves underwater and it bent the heck out of a couple of them. So go to her, uh, funding portion. It really is fairly simple, but this is the purchase, delivery, and installation of this handrail system at Starvation Reservoir for this pier itself. And as we know, construction costs are insane and they always have been, but they're even worse now, I feel like, especially if you need to use a wood product. So, I don't know that I've never seen the budget for this, but it's for 33,000. That's all I know on that project. Okay. Any discussion on this project? It's the second to last one. We can do it. It seems to me that this project just faces challenges every time every habitat council they come back with a a new challenge on this project. The walkway wasn't right, the pier was too steeper. It, I don't know if it's a little late now to ask me to plan and develop it better, but every year we have a new challenge with this pier. I feel like that's a true statement. We have a challenge with almost every pier we've ever put in, I feel like. But Thanks, Dwayne. Any other comment on that? We're pushing four o'clock, so yeah. No, I appreciate that, Dwayne. Um, I guess I have a comment. I think the Northeast region has troubles with absolutely every peer in their region, regardless of where it's at. I'd be fine with never putting in one again, if anybody cares. <laughs> My two cents are I will not build those types of piers ever again. See, we're learning something. It's called Absolutely. peer pressure. It's terrible peer pressure. <laughs> it's just a bad joke. Yeah, thanks for that, Justin. Okay, uh, if there's not any more discussion, we need to move ahead. We have one more project. So do we have a motion on this one? I'll make that motion, Eric. Okay, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, we have a motion this from Paul. Justin. And we have a second from Paul. All in favor, say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Say no and raise your hand. Okay, there are none opposed. The motion is approved. Thanks, uh, Natalie, for taking time and, and giving us some good presentation and, and some uh, food for thought of some of the issues that are going on in the Northeast region. So thank you all. Recommend to continue the way you have with, uh, you know, pulling the aquatic stuff it's kind of separate from the, the habitat stuff, but working with Pat um, to 
to lump as much of that stuff together as possible like you did this time around it worked out pretty well i think so will do thank you guys thanks okay last one and uh looks like robbie you're on huh so 5560 central region beaver restoration project go ahead all right thanks guys for hanging on till the end here so yeah robbie edgel habitat restoration biologist in the central region and that's perfect daniel uh, just the, looking at the map there this is indian creek um, so uh, if you're familiar with spanish fork canyon and the Thai fork area it's it's in that that same basic general area and uh, so uh, last year we met with our aquatics and wildlife sections and came up with a a priority list of about 25 potential areas in our region where it would be beneficial to have uh, beaver reintroduction uh, taken place. And this was one of the areas that our wildlife section uh, identified. And um, this past year, we it was our first, you guys helped fund uh, last year's efforts to begin doing beaver reintroduction in, in our region. And so last year was the first uh, phase of that. We built a quarantine facility in Ephraim. We, uh, you know, purchased traps. We started working through all the kinks of learning how to trap live beavers and uh, worked with um, Utah State University to help us as well. And Daniel's showing some of the pictures here of, uh, we were able to move eight beavers last year and uh, these were taken last fall and they would already started building some dams. Um, uh, other regions have talked about some monitoring efforts and one thing we started doing, here's a picture of what it looks like before. Um, and then we're already starting to see a, an improvement of the habitat. But uh, to help monitor, we put motion sensor cameras up and that, that photo of, of the beaver there was one that was taken right in November. So they they were doing well um, up until the winter, and so we'll see how they're doing this spring. Um, there's the quarantine facility uh, that we started building. Um, if you go to, uh, that's just one of the beavers we caught in Park City. Uh, go ahead and go to the finance page. So basically, uh, what we met again with our wildlife and aquatic section this spring to kind of go back over the list we created and, and it's going to be a, a list to continue to work on and um, we'll keep working with them to identify really the best place it's really challenging last year we were more um, ambitious and did we proposed to do three streams um, and as we moved through it we found challenges in some of them uh, with wilderness study areas and the deep creeks and and just different things and so um, this year, I'm just going to keep working in Indian Creek is what we're proposing um, to continue to augment that population. And then, um, so we, we're asking for some money for uh, trapping efforts from Utah State and potential uh, contractors. And then materials just to repair and improve our quarantine facility. And then, um, also want to do some monitoring uh, with we have pit tags in the beavers and we just need a pit tag reader to actually make that worthwhile so i put some money in there to purchase one of those and that'll just help us keep the keep track of survival and um so yeah we just want to keep working in this the same drainage we've done a lot of monitoring work with uh, mindy wheeler on uh census plant species and wild utah project on lots of uh, stream health condition prior to putting the beavers in and also we did some uh, shock fish shocking with uh, Justin Robinson from the Forest Service. We have some really good pre-data and it'll be exciting to continue to monitor with that moving forward and, and really show the benefits that beavers can have and so I have some money in there to continue to do some monitoring with the Wild Utah project as well. Um, and then the plan is basically to just keep working in this drainage. And if we get to the point where we've got all the beavers we need and we feel like we're in a good place, then we have other places identified that we can continue to work as well if we still have money left in this project. So that's that's the plan. Um, it's been going well and yeah, it's a fun project to, to be involved in. Um, talking about benefits, you know, these 
beavers help increase the riparian habitat, restore the stream health. So there are benefits to big game, uh, upland game. There's turkeys in this area, um, as well as uh, you know, lots of other, other species, fish and, and other wildlife. So any questions? Thanks, Robbie. Yeah, any questions on this on this project? I've got a quick one. Um, Robbie, I love the idea of a pit tag reader. Have, have you done that before with beavers or would this be the first time? So the beavers that we got from Utah State, they've been putting the, they put pit tags in them. So the beavers we released already have pit tags. We just don't have a pit tag reader to, to monitor them. And I've never done that before. Um, so, but yeah. It's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, thanks. And uh, there, it, it, it makes me giggle just thinking about it, honestly. <laughs> it, I've been surprised. We as part I didn't mention this, but as part of the project, we we've been building BDAs and really building ponds before we release the beavers. And that has just been amazing to see how they don't they don't move. They just stick right where we we build that habitat for them. And so um having those pit tag readers, I think will be actually pretty uh, work well, because I don't think they're moving very far to monitor survival. So. All right, any other questions on this? I think uh, moving forward, I'll be interested in seeing, you know, how these things turn out in overall effectiveness and, and whatnot, so, okay. Do we have a motion on this one? I'll make a motion to tentatively approve this project for funding consideration. Thank you, Paul. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, we have a second from Dwayne. All in favor, say aye. 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 Is there aye. any opposed? Thanks, guys. If there are any opposed, say no and raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, uh, motion carries. So. All right. Thanks, Robbie. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our Habitat Council meeting for today. Um, any questions or announcements? Daniel, I guess I'm going to look to you. Anything we need to talk about? No, I don't think so. And our, our, what's the date of our next meeting? April 7th. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. So April 7th for Habitat Council, April 1st for ECP meeting that's next week, uh, conservation permit funding meeting for other WRI and, and uh, partnered possibly Habitat Council projects. So, um, okay, if uh, I think we're done for today. And so with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Request permission to pass out. Hey, we have a motion to call. <laughs> I second. To, to adjourn. Drew is seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 If you're opposed, you're crazy, but I'll accept that. <laughs> None are opposed. So uh, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. And thanks our AV team, um, Daniel, Allison, uh, Danny. Um, Lisa, appreciate all your help. So thanks everybody. Thanks to the council, to the council. Thank you. Thank you everyone. See you later. Bye guys. Mike, before you disappear, I want to chat with you for a second. If you have a moment. I'm going to chat about our ECP meeting. Yeah, just getting uh, figuring out when we want to meet to uh, test things out.
and then get the big game agenda up to put together. I didn't realize that meeting took me two weeks. <laughs> I'm assuming you stopped the broadcast. <laughs> Thank you, Al.